Mm-hmm. If you wanted to take it out, you can do that. Oh, uh, why, why, um, what's going on here? Ah, let's see. Oh, because I have ice there. Project. From the Tor project, I have yeah. a slide about something more about what I do. So. Yeah, I don't think you want to do that. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Good morning. Thanks for uh, coming back. <laughs> it's Sunday morning. Welcome. Um, I'm really happy to uh, have Gaba from the Tor project kick us off today. Um, I've seen her speak and spoken with her myself uh, several times, and uh, she's doing very interesting work, um, which I can't wait to hear about. Gabba, take it away. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, good morning. I'm so happy that there's so many people here, and like all the brave people that arrive at 9 a.m. on Sunday. <laughs> this is awesome. So um, I'm going to do mostly like an overview of um, first a little what is Tor. Who many? Uh, how many people here know what is Tor or what Trust? Okay, the centralized trust networks are perfect. <laughs> awesome. I'm still going to do some overview uh, for the people that do not know um, what we are doing, what we have been doing, and I'm also going to talk a little about what our our, our plans are. Um, for the next year, two years. Um, so first, first, um, and then questions, of course. Uh, questions or comments in the end. Um, and the, for the people that uh, stay the whole talk, I have uh, stickers here. <laughs> so you can get the stickers at the end. Um, okay, so who am I? Um, uh, my background is as a software engineer for the last 20 years, but in the last Two years I have been doing more management of projects, so um, I'm working with the Tor project since last year as a project manager. I manage the projects related to anti-censorship, to the core team, and to metrics. Uh, that means recollecting and displaying all the data that we get from the, from the network. I'm a free software developer, facilitator, organizer. I also participate in other uh, collectives and open source projects like Sister Server and uh, Infrared Organizer that is, an, uh, is a network of uh, autonomous infrastructure. Um, that's who I am. So what is Tor? So as many of you may know, um, Tor is uh, open source software. <laughs> um, we have uh, an ecosystem of uh, tools and software that run the network and uh, allow people to be able to connect um, to the network in one way or the other. Um, Tor is um, a way to um, browse or connect to the internet anonymously. It's like a choice for privacy. Um, we are also, Tor is also a community of researchers, developers, users, service operators. It's like a big community of people doing or interacting with Tor in different ways. And, and we are also a nonprofit organization that is the one who nurtures this network, no? that works on like the challenges around anti censorship. Uh, the challenges about performance in the network. Uh, we do trainings. Um, we uh, nurture the community of uh, service providers. And as I put here, we advocate for infrastructure that allow people to use the internet anonymously, you know? So the Tor ecosystem. Let me, let me see if I can get this because it's kind of weird. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Tor ecosystem. There's like um, different, different tools around the Tor, and I'm going to talk a little more about these uh, for the people that may not. Um, may not know about how, how we're working. We, we have like software that, um, uh, that is the one who uh, is running the different um, nodes to run the network. We have different tools that are able, f uh, able people to connect to the network. We have other tools for like sharing documents. Uh, we also, a part of our community is Tails, that is an operating system to um, to connect to Tor and to uh, work anonymously. We have UNI, that is one of our projects for measuring censorship around the world. Uh, we have the Libra Library Freedom Project that uh, try to use libraries around the US to, um, to uh, 
connect to, no to Tor and to use um, the libraries as nodes, uh, and also to teach librarians and uh, people in the community about uh, what we are doing. And we have a lot of other software um, that is using Tor right now. So Tor is uh, the network uh, that has like around 6,000 and 7,000 volunteers nodes right now. We need more, and I'm going to talk a, li a little about that too. Uh, we have between two and eight million uh, monthly active users. You can see a lot of information in, in our patient metrics about where people are connecting through, uh, in uh, how many users we have in different places. There's a lot of metrics about, about that, and also about the, the servers and uh, stuff like that. So Tor allows anyone to use internet while hiding an IP address. Uh, we said that like we protect metadata, no, we uh, we don't um, only en encrypt uh, the information, encrypt the content, but also um, also hide uh, the information on who you are talking with, which website you are connecting to. We have Tor browser that is based right now on Firefox, um, that has different specific protections um, to, um, to to yeah to to be able to connect to the internet. And different cases are like censorship incubation, defense against surveillance, and private browsing. Um, and, and something about that, yes, depends on, because there's different communities that connect to Tor. People around the world that um, are subject to, to censorship, they use it for circumventing censorship. And they may be connecting to Facebook, for example, through Tor to be able to access in places where maybe um, censor, no? But also, like, um, for other people, it could be just about privacy, you know? Different people, or, yeah, look at the, uh, how they use Tor in different ways. Uh, so the Tor network is, um, so we have different servers um, that uh, run Tor, and when people connect to the network, um, uh, the network is giving them uh, three different nodes. Um, so, the Tor client, what it does is uh, encrypt with three layers, it has three layers of encryption for the connection, f and then um, you go through the, these, these three different nodes. So the entry guard knows who you are, but the middle relay do not know, and the exit relay do not know. And the exit relay knows, doesn't know who you are, but knows where you are going to. So uh, we are protecting uh, the information of, about which is, uh, website you are visiting to, um, and also protecting, because, uh, okay, the threat model here is like, um, we are, there's many people that could be like your service provider or the government that may be trying to see what website you are visiting or who you are talking to. So um, this network, what, what we are doing is distributing trust. <laughs> between the different nodes um, to be able to, um, for, for you to be, a, for the destination, for the website to not know who you are and for, um, yeah. Okay, um, the difference between, so, and the other thing I want to talk, yeah, is uh, the, the stuff about encryption, no? Um, inside the network of, uh, on the Tor client, encrypt all the content. And this, when, it, when it leaves the network, the content could be not encrypted by not encrypted by Tor for sure. The difference with a VPN is that with a VPN you have a provider that you trust that provider, the provider of the VPN, um, all the, your information. No, so if that provider is compromised one way or the other, they will have all the information of who is connecting uh, to where. With Tor we distribute the trust <laughs> so nobody in the node in the in the network i'm sorry nobody in the network will know exactly uh, or will have all the information on who is connecting with to who nobody will know that no and that's uh, the difference with the vpn no? so um yes and uh, what what um, the other thing is that the safety safety comes from diversity no so as many, w when we have more uh, nodes in the network, it will be uh, better for everybody using Tor network, as um, it will be harder to match uh, the, uh, who is connecting to the network what, to where uh, people are connecting to. You know? 
And the other thing that also people sometimes ask is about transparency. You know, um, we believe that um, privacy should be a choice, um, but for building trust in what we are doing in the community is we need transparency. So we are, uh, have everything in the open. We have protocols, specifications, software. Everything we do is in the open. Um, who is working at Tor is in the, uh, is in the open too. Um, but we believe that um, it should not be forced, but it should be an option. Onion services. Um, how many people know what onion services are? How many people know what is uh, the dark web? <laughs> okay, yes. Um, okay, because, um, yeah, there's like, a, we, we are trying, one of, one, of the, one of the things we are trying is to desmitify the dark web, no? <laughs> This idea that uh, actually the amount of onion service, the hidden services that we have, that very small, um, there's no iceberg under this ocean. <laughs> that's the media. That's the media image usually about the um, yeah the dark web. So what we have is the onion services. Um, these are like uh, services inside the Tor network that um, allow you to connect to connect without leaving the Tor network. So everything is encrypted by Tor and allow the services to be able to have anonymous servers, no? Um, it's usually a hash.onion, uh, the domain, and that's what the dark web is. <laughs> Just onion services. Um, there's, uh, okay, there's a special domain onion and it's self-authenticated, so we bypass all service. Uh, uh, certification authorities um, keep traffic inside the Tor network and it's end-to-end -end encrypted. No, I think there's a picture for Michael here. Here, yes. So you can see that, for example, the user um, is connecting to the Onion services that is inside inside uh, the Tor network. No, so there's a node that uh, has the directory of the Onion services and um, redirect, uh, yes, uh, route uh, the traffic that way if you go to that um, onion services. So um, yeah, and everything is encrypted. So what people use onion services uh, for, no? Facebook has, a, has an onion service um, that around, there was uh, some articles from Facebook saying that around one million users use that service. Um, so it's for people that are uh, trying to connect from places where um, Facebook may be censored. There's other pa uh, apps like Ricochet for uh, chatting that also use Onion services for each client. We have Onion Share that is other um, project for um, sharing documents um, that also use Onion services for uh, specifically for that. So the documents are not stored anywhere, temporal. Uh, share that you send a link <laughs> and also we have se secure drop um, I'm not sure if people hear about secure drop before okay is this um, software that uh, many newsrooms are installing it or have it around the, the world newsrooms or uh, also other projects no where you can send information or document anonymously to a specific place no the New York Times has one uh, ProPublica has one, different, The Guardian has one, no? um, and so you use Tor to be able to send your documents. So it could be used by whistleblowers no? uh, to send documents in, in an anonymous way. No? So I have an example here. This is, this is Secure Drop trying to yeah, be accessed from Firefox. <laughs> um, yes, many associate, Associated Press has. Um, so they, they have like an Onion service. Uh, where you send, um, the, they, they set up the Onion service uh, for the newsroom, and then you using Tor, you can send uh, information through there, through a browser, no? Uh, the New York, this is the New York Times, Onion service, oh, yeah, it's also, also for, um, yeah, for accessing from places that may be uh, censored too. Um, the other question I had, I may be too fast, <laughs> 
but we can do questions at the end. The other question that people have usually, if it is enough for privacy, no? Who thinks that Tor is enough for privacy? Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, Tor is what is trying to build, or we are what we are trying to build is a way for people to opt in to not be able to pay the uh, the browsing the internet or using the internet with their own data. No, so a way for people to be able to access it, uh, and then they decide each person decides if they give information or not. Um, so Tor is not enough for privacy. You can still be using Tor and be sending like your name, your address, whatever, you know. Um, so it's just not uh, the only thing you need for, for taking care of um, your information online. You can be uh, leaking or sending uh, identifiable information. You can do mistakes about security. Uh, you can be using... Um, applications that do not care about, that have other privacy or security implications are, and are leaking um, some information about you other way. So one thing we recommend is like um, using, not just only using Tor, but using applications that are customized for privacy. Um, so there, there was a boom like uh, about different routers that like you connect there and you use Tor like for everything, all connections, no? And you can use Chrome and use Tor. But the problem with that is that there's, like, they may be leaking other information that you don't know about. When we customize uh, Firefox uh, into the Tor browser, we are, like, changing many, many things and not just the connection to the Tor network. Um, so, the, yeah, so the recommendation is to really look at what you're using if you really want to, um, to yeah, be anonymous in the internet. No? And uh, one recommendation for many uh, journalists or human rights defenders or other people that may want to, to use Tor with other applications is to use Tails. No? With Tails, you have uh, a Debian, a customized Debian in a, a stick, in a pen drive. You put in your computer, and then you can use all the applications there that are customized to use the Tor network um, and to no not leak any privacy information. So what is coming? Um, there's a lot of work. <laughs> I mean, uh, Tor has been, been around for a long time. Um, in the last maybe three or four years, there has a lot of, been a lot of improvement about usability. I'm not sure if many of you have been following um, not only how the network has been developing, but also how the browser or how other applications, they have come a long way. Um, in the last two or three years, Tor has been uh, involve uh, user researchers, no? people that do usability. Now that we have a usability team uh, that talks with users and see how people are using it in other places that are not just the first world, <laughs> um, to, to try to see how to help uh, more people. Because as much, whenever we have more people in the network, it's, it's better for everybody. Because um, more people connect to Tor, there's less red flags uh, to look at. No? So there's a lot of work. What is coming uh, is uh, we are trying to um, do more research and more work around how to scale the Tor network. Uh, many browsers are right now uh, incorporating Tor. We have Brave that has like a Tor, uh, use Tor, like you can, you can use Tor with Brave. We are talking with Firefox about also for them to have like a real privacy um, connection. Um, so this is very important for us in the, f in the next two years, how to make the network more diverse. We need more relays, more nodes. Um, we need more people um, using it, but mo also more nodes in the network, no? Um, yeah, trying to make it more stable and more scalable. So um, perf uh, network performance is like the big uh, thing we are working right now in the next year. Um, we also, I mean, citizenship is right now like a race with many governments and corporations, <laughs> no, are trying, uh, that are trying to censor how people use the internet around the world. So for that, it's also a big challenge and a big focus for the next year. Since, last, since this year, we have an anti-censorship team that is trying to focus on building tools for circumvention. 
Um, right now, I, I didn't talk about it until now, that's weird. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to talk a little about how, um, how, and, uh, yeah, how circumvention works at, uh, at all, maybe in the next slides. Um, and, and then also learn from users, I also said that. We are doing a lot of trainings and user research around the world on how, how people are using Tor. And we are also trying to improve Onion services, no? Because Onion service also have a, a, there's many problems related to how people remember in the hash with the <laughs> um, Or, yes, uh, or there's a lot of problem with um, the OS of Onion services. So we are trying to work on that. So um, this is, as I say, scalability. So something I need to talk, this is weird how I put the stuff together. <laughs> I should have talked before. But. Pluggable transport, so, no, how we are doing circumvention right now. Um, so people, I mean, people connect to the network, um, but sometimes in many places, Tor is sensor. So people cannot connect. There's like a, a big race with many governments that like trying to, s to censor the the entry points, the bridges into the network, uh, trying to censor the traffic. There's many ways of how they are um, censor tour right now. And what we have is like what we call pluggable transport. Um, that what it does is change how the traffic looks. So hides between other traffic, other traffic. For example, um, the two big ones that we are working right now is the obfuscation four and the snowflake, no? Uh, the change, it, it can be look like, uh, the traffic just look like HTTP, HTTPS, or it can look like uh, WebRTC, that's what, is, what the snowflake we are doing. So that's the big thing we, we are working in the anti-censorship uh, team right now. Bridges, that's the other thing I should have talked before, and I didn't, uh. <laughs> that's the other big thing we're working because not only, um, people censor Tor doing uh, deep package inspection, but also by IP, no? So you have like a, an entry point in the network, and then the sensors come and say, this, this, all the entry points we are blocking by IP, no? So what we have is what we call breaches um, that uh, people set up, and then they don't show to any user, no? So you go to a website, it's called bridgetorproject.org, and you can get those entry points to the networks. And also many organizations can set up those entry points, those bridges, um, so it's, it's hidden from the people that um, are censoring, no? So they are Tor relays that aren't listed in the main Tor directory. That's, um, so what is coming is trying to make that more smoothly on how people are receiving. People can receive bridges by the, the website, by email, by different ways of how they could be receiving those bridges, no? And we need to add new ones. Uh, that's a, a big, that's the race <laughs> we're running. Um, there we are doing more trainings, more user research. Uh, we have like around 80 different languages translated. Um, uh, the Tor browser translated into it, uh, into the eight, 80 different languages. We need more translations. Uh, improve onion services, um, defenses to the denial of services. Um, that that's a big problem in the network. That it sometimes it affects the network, and we are trying to uh, work on that, on how it will not affect the network. Uh, make the version three the default in core stable. Um, better errors on the client side and the human memorable addresses for onion services. We are working on prototypes for that. Um, how you can Im get involved? Um, yes, we need people to run to relays or bridges. Um, that's, a, that's a big thing right now uh, that we need from, from people to, to run those entrants to the network, no? Uh, find and fix bugs in Tor, uh, test Tor in different platforms, in different uh, places. Help others understand how Tor works and what it means for privacy. And we also have different research problems, as I was telling before. Um, you can take a look there. Uh, and then, uh, of course, donations. That's the other thing. Uh, maybe I, I will do questions. I, I think I went too fast. <laughs> Sorry. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. All right, questions. Um, 
Is this on? Okay. Uh, is there any risks involved in running a tour relay or bridge? I've heard of like raids in the past um, where the police come knocking on your door because of someone else doing yeah, something. Yeah, I think on it depends network. on your situation and where you're having the relay, uh, what you can run. No, Usually uh, like exit relays are more run in universities or other places that have the support to be able to to run that relay, but if, it, if from your house you can run like a middle relay or like, yeah. A Hello. Hello. How do you incentivize the volunteer notes? Volunteer notes? We send um, shirts. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, um, no, there's a. <laughs> yeah. We are trying to nurture that community, so there's like um, yeah, there's a play like there's a place for there usually we have meetings, uh, monthly meetings uh, with uh, relay operators. Um, yeah, that's that's mostly the way we we are trying to nurture that community. Um, how do you protect against compromised nodes? We need like that's a that's a very good question and. Um, one thing we one thing we try to do is to have like a diverse network. That's the key for like. Uh, first, we have like we monitor the network, and there's like a way of monitoring for bad relays, and so we have a blacklist for bad relays. But the most important thing there to be able to defend a com compromised nodes is to have like a diverse, not one person owning or one organization owning the most of the relays, but having like a diverse people running them. No, and we are trying to incentivize the specific organizations to run bridges for their communities and stuff like that. Um, the uh, the dot onion addresses uh, I believe are going to be a lot longer in the future and still a bunch of random characters. Uh, do you know how uh, companies like the New York Times and Facebook, which currently use uh, like vanity addresses, um, do you know if they're gonna be switching over to those longer addresses? Uh, will people have a choice between a... Yes, uh, they will be, ch they, I mean, people have choice in running one or the other, version two or version three, that's the difference. Uh, but yes, we are trying to um, change everybody to version three, that will be the default. And yes, organizations are, will ch be changing to that. We are looking for other ways of, um, having some kind of a memorable addresses, uh, like using H HTTPS everywhere, that's one possible option, uh, to have some kind of local uh, map of addresses uh, that people can can get into their own browser, and that's a way of, but yeah, we are, we are working right now on, on different ways of how we can do this. Hi, um, so I, I believe there actually is such a thing as a stupid question, and this might be one. Um, <laughs> Are there any uh, embedded frameworks or libraries to connect embedded devices to Tor to build like an onion of things? <laughs> you heard it here first. Um, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I don't know any, any about it. Maybe there is, and I have no idea because there's so many things I do not know. Yes. I've run a, a middle relay uh, out of my apartment for many years, and I used a BeagleBone Black for a while, and I also used a MinnowBoard Turbot. And I mean, that, those their single board computers are not really embedded, but um, yeah. That kind of keys into my question. Um, what are the basic technical requirements for running a relay or an entrance node? Yeah, for that, I can, I can uh, give you like the, um, there's a relay guide that you can look at, Tor Relay Guide. Um, let me see. What is the Tor Relay Guide? Um, and that uh, has all the information about how to, um, the new guide turning relay. Here, to relay guide. Um, yeah, there's different ways. You can uh, take a look there because I'm not so much uh, involved here on how to. Yeah, there's a technical setup, and you. And there we have uh, like a, a specific questions about what are the requirements here. Here. Um, 
Yeah, we also have, I mean, if you're interested in this, we have like um, in IRC is where we are mostly um, all the time. <laughs> and you can ask a question there. Also, we have a mailing list and um, that's, that's the best place to, to get engaged on how, how to connect to, how to get the RLA running. So it seems that uh, to use the Tor network, you have to have a copy of the Tor software, right? So what sort of uh, actions does the Tor organization take to be able to get the Tor browser and the Tor software to individuals in you know, heavily censored areas uh, and validate that those are secure versions of the software, not backdoor versions? Yes, that um, we have different ways of people to get um, Tor. We also have for, uh, maintain a software called Get Tor uh, for people to be able to send a mail and get the browser that way. Um, and also, we run. I don't know much about this, but we run. We of course we do reproducible builds. Uh, um, yeah, that's a, that's a way, and then people can get uh, try to get the browser in different ways from our organization. But that's an issue because there's many, uh, yeah, fake apps, for example. Yeah. Um, so, kind of following up on the um, malicious node question, has any r um, exploratory work been done into remote attestation? Is that like on the road map? Can you repeat? Remote attestation, like uh, meaning a computer being able to verify remotely that a software, a particular version of software is running, but doing so securely. Um, I do not know. Okay, I maybe we, we can. We do not have that. Um, at least okay, from maybe we can yeah. chat later. I know that the yeah. Signal project is actually doing some work in that that space. Oh, okay. Um, so that like, you can run a, you can have a, 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 I don't know what they call it, like the contact server, mm -hmm. run on generic hardware, such that you can verify that it's running what is available on the Git tree, and not a modified version. Let's talk later. Okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a geographical preference for relays and bridges? Yeah, we need bridges and relays everywhere. Um, we don't have so many in the south, <laughs> so that would be nice in the global south. No. Um, but yes, no. Uh, what do you think of Hunix? Um, Hunix, um, yes, yeah, some people, yeah, work from Tor has been working with Hunix, but, um, yeah, we don't specifically s uh, support, support it, so, yeah, we work with tape. Can you talk a little bit more about your work, um, with libraries and the outreach you're doing with them? Is uh, one specific team. Uh, what we are doing is trainings, uh, going to specific libraries in the U.S. and doing trainings about what is Tor, and also help uh, libraries run relays. So those are the two specific things. It's called the Library Freedom Project. So you can yeah search it. And um, also yeah when uh, yeah my colleague is also running different uh, talks with uh, journalists on how people are using Tor um, in the libraries and also online. There's a whole project there. I have a question about that too. Uh, do, you, do you have a sense of the institutional health of places like libraries or universities or governments just from the kind of support or lack of support that you're getting or, or uh, censorship uh, events or, or not that you're getting? Do you have a sense of which direction that's going or in the US, I guess. Uh, anywhere. Uh, anywhere. Uh, no, we work very closely with universities. So we have researchers in different, in different places that are specifically working on the projects with us. Um, for, for example, of web, in web we have a project on web traffic fingerprinting uh, that we specifically work with researchers and we implement what the researchers are finding out. Um, so there's a, big, a lot of support there. Also for now, for pluggable transport and anti-censorship, we're also working with universities on that. So we, we all our works on, on research from universities, but from libraries, yes. Um, um, 
yes, I think um, oh, there's also, I, at least my understanding of what uh, this project has been going on, there has been a lot of support there too. I have more questions. All right, there we go. <laughs> Um, do you have a sense for uh, how much it costs us to encrypt everything and send it so many different directions to do the same task? Like, what are the scales of inefficiency that we're adding to the system by just putting everything under a private umbrella? Um, can Can you repeat about encrypting all the information or what? Yeah, just like so. If you were to count uh, how much energy it takes me to watch a YouTube video the way I normally watch it, and then to put it through the Tor network and do the same thing, how much more effort, how much more energy is being expended to do it this way? Mm, yeah, I, <laughs> I think th this is something that some people uh, in the in tour actually are, uh, are bringing to discuss. Now we, we are meeting uh, in July. We are going to have, we have twice a year um, tour meetups. And one of the big conversations about this actually energy and how, how we are approaching it in, in the organization. Is it considered impolite to use Tor for trivial high bandwidth stuff like watching videos? We we are trying to discourage people to use BitTorrent through Tor <laughs> because yes, uh, but in general we need people to use Tor no for trivial things. We need to think about privacy as something that we we do it by default no. We the Tor is a system designed. Um, um, with privacy in mind as the default. <laughs> so we should use it for more. And in that way, we are helping people around the world uh, to look at, at um, privacy infrastructure as something that should be there, you know, as how like we think about the internet, no? Um, so yes, I think it should be used for. I was looking at your metrics uh, for the last few months. Yeah. Uh, it's really interesting. Like, I, I can you talk more about? So, there's the weekly period uh, periodicity uh -huh. of traffic yep. or users, and it seems to spike during the weekday. Yep. Uh, and then in this last month, it's like doubled. Doubled, yes. So, what what's going on? Yeah, I feel I feel interesting. It's very interesting to look at the metrics to see where, for example, there's sensor stuff. Right now, we are looking, for example, at metrics from Iran. How like how many Tor users we have in Iran, no? Um, it's, it's amazing. It has been going up um, now in May. So we were trying to, uh, here, yes, there, you know? Uh, so we were trying to see what's going on in Iran. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems that like there's um, kind of a Telegram clone that is using Tor. Uh, that's one, my thing. There's many different whys, no? Um, and Telegram has been censored, so people are moving into this other app that you store. That could be one specific op idea so that, why. So that's, that Fascinate. accounts for the entire growth uh, like above the baseline, just from Iran. Just from Iran. Okay. Just from Iran, yes. And you can see, for example, in, in other places like Egypt, when it's censored, you can see there's more Tor users and there's a spikes. Oh. So this might also be a dumb question. Um, from a sense of privacy and protecting individuals, why is this information available? Why do you publish this information of where the stuff is coming from? Um, like, because we like think it's important for people to know how Tor is being used, for researchers to know how Tor is being used, uh, to be able to improve it. This is all information that comes. Actually, the relay, sen the each node sends uh, stats or data uh, to tour to be able to collect this, but it's optional. Not all of them do it. Um, and also the information is sent anonymously. The w there's a lot of implications there. So, yes. 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 And we have a, we have a safety team that looks at all these things and how they turn, how the research is. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, I have a question. Uh, you might not be able to answer this, but I was in China recently, and I was trying to use Tor from there, and I noticed that I could 
get it started and I could visit the New York Times homepage and it would work for like one minute and then it would stop and I wouldn't be able to use it again for a day. Uh, do you know what was happening there? Maybe there were some issues with breaches. Um, Maybe, I don't know, because that's one big issue we, we are having right now. I, oh. Yeah, I tried connecting with and without bridges. Oh, yeah. really? The traffic analysis, yeah. Yeah, or it blocks the bridge, for example. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's like we we said it's like a race, no? You go try to use this bridge, they block it, or try to use yeah, this pluggable transport, and there's this, they yeah, they block it. Does Tor get involved in uh, promoting or or developing its own hardware? Um. So far, no. <laughs> no that's, we should talk then. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, uh, how is Tor and Onion uh, supportive financially? We have, um, yeah, financially we work by grants. That's a big effort also that has been happening in the last year, and we are trying to push forward for a diversity on where we are getting funding from. Um, before there was a lot more funding from the U.S. government, and now we are trying to diversify that and get um, get for onions specifically. We are getting um, funding from the of a foundation specifically for that work, and then we get donations, and that also fund that part of the work. Yes. Uh, so my question is about the use of of Tor and for for trivial traffic. Mm -hmm. So if I use it to purchase something online. I'm obviously going to give up my personal information to that that website, and uh, so I guess it's going to go through that exit node. Um, should I then start a new session through Tor? If uh, you use it for something else, you start like a new circuit. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? We're just about out of time. Do you know if there are future plans to have uh, a Tor cryptocurrency that could be mined by uh, basically becoming uh, relay and routing um, Tor traffic? Uh, can you, you're talking about, can you repeat the question in the beginning? Because yeah, uh, is there going to be like a Tor cryptocurrency Cur that could that be mined? I thought I would hear wrong. <laughs> No, we don't have any plan on that for sure. Yeah, for for now. Um, if you have any thoughts or about that, it would be great to talk with you. But right now, we don't have anything related to that. We accept cryptocurrencies. <laughs> That's the only thing we do about cryptocurrency right now. I just keep coming back to a comment that was made earlier. Um, right now, the proverbial "Eye of Sauron" that exists in Washington D.C. is is aimed right at this graph that you have on the screen. Um, and it seems like that's a that's a big risk. Like you're 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 drawing a huge amount of attention to the project just because there's a lot of attention on Iran right now. Um, how, do you guys talk about that? Can you can you expand on that a little bit? Like how you mitigate that? I mean, having the having the full force of the Department of Defense angry at Tor for enabling communication in Iran seems like it could be a big risk for your organization. Um, I mean, there may be many people angry at us for one reason or the other, so <laughs> we, yes, um, yeah, focusing on enable this, um, yeah, we, we are not focused on that, uh, for sure. There's a, yeah, there's a big risk on using any of this technology at some point, but, um, yeah, we are, we are not focused on how we are going to talk with the, the, <laughs> the government about this and um, yes I just wanted to say thank you like what you do is very important and I'm very happy that tour exists oh, thank you <laughs> well we'll end right there <laughs> thanks Gabba and you'll be around later today if people want to uh, yes chat with I will you. be around yeah. if some people want to talk with me and also have uh, the stickers and I have mm -hmm. my card if people want to contact me later too Sticker.
Well, I guess we'll start. Good morning. Uh, thanks for showing up. And uh, thanks to uh, CrowdSupply and everybody who's been involved in this conference. It's been great so far. I really appreciate it coming back again to Portland. My name is, is Scott, and uh, I will be talking about um, something that, that doesn't always get a lot of representation uh, in, in the kinds of, uh, of educational materials that are available, uh, both to students when they're coming through uh, training and also just in terms of the general uh, maker community. And that is, uh, how do you go from a new board that uh, shows up on your, on your workbench that's been assembled to something that has been um, powered up and tested and verified without uh, hopefully as or with as little drama hopefully as possible. Um, when I uh, was putting this talk together I had sort of a, a particular audience in mind and it may or may not be appropriate to the, the people who showed up but I was thinking mostly about people who at uh, present are doing designs with Arduinos and off-the-shelf commercially available uh, shields uh, and sort of stacking things together and writing firmware uh, to develop their projects, but who are interested in going beyond that, doing a custom design of some sort. And the, uh, the typical design that you would sort of see from that kind of a, of a project would be something with a microprocessor. Sorry, I'm make sure I have this closer to my mouth. Uh, a microprocessor, some sort of sensors or actuators to interact with the real world. Um, Communications of some sort, uh, maybe simple serial communications, maybe Wi-Fi or, or uh, Bluetooth or some other wireless protocol or a display, uh, and then some sort of power, battery or uh, a wall ward or something. I'm not going to talk about mains power projects because there's a whole different set of, of safety concerns there that I don't really want to get into. Um, and if you think about that whole process, there's a lot of, of information available about how to design boards, how to use things like KiCad, and how to get boards manufactured by our friends at uh, Osh Park and other places. Um, there's lots of tutorials about how to solder uh, and build your boards. Uh, and certainly lots of information, especially coming from the Arduino environment, about how to develop firmware once you get things running. But there's this little middle part about how to go from something you've designed to something that, that functions well enough that you can continue on using it. And that's what I really would like to talk about. As I say, I'm, a lot of this is going to be sort of uh, aimed at someone who's not gone through the process before, but hopefully there'll be a few little nuggets for people who are more experienced. And, and if I forget things and you have experience in this area, you can certainly chime in at any point and, uh, and help out. But before we get to the actual process of taking a board from um, showing up uh, from whoever has assembled it uh, to uh, functionality. I'd like to step back in time a little bit and talk about the things you can do ahead of time during the design process, during the planning process of a project to make life a little easier as you go forward. Uh, and in many things, you know, preparation is a really important part of this. If you, if you spend the time up front and, uh, and try and anticipate some of the problems and try and incorporate features that help you later on, uh, you're a long way down the road to getting the job done. Of course, ex execution matters as well, and, uh, <laughs> and we'll get back to that too, but uh, I think, you know, this is sort of why projects take longer than you think. Uh, so let's talk about the preparation process. Um, I think, uh, first of all, that um, Greg Peak at last year's teardown talked about a lot of uh, some of the things that I'm going to repeat and a lot of other things that make your designs uh, more easily um, used by others and also a bit more easily used by your, uh, or yourself as you go forward. Uh, that uh, talk is, on, uh, is available on video. I encourage you to go back for it because there are some things that I won't repeat, but there are a um, number of things that I will. Uh, the most important thing that I th would like to leave you with, I think, in this whole talk is don't expect to make your first iteration your final product. Um, there's always a temptation to do that. People, we all sort of are reluctant to spend money and time on 
new spins of boards and, uh, and the, the iterative process, but if you accept the fact that you're going to have to make a prototype, um, that frees you up from a lot of things. It frees you up from sort of the, uh, the paralysis of perfection, for one thing, uh, and it also allows you to incorporate a lot of features in the prototype that make your life easier during the development process, but which not, are not necessarily useful or necessary in a final product. You can spend board real estate on things that, um, that don't provide functionality to your product in the end, but which allow you to, uh, overall, probably, <laughs> or at least I would like to encourage you to think so, uh, make the overall process faster and, and less painful. So what kinds of things are those? Well, the main one is test points. If, you, um, if you're willing to spend the board real estate uh, and accept that the prototype is something you're going to do, then you can put in what I would consider good test points. And we'll talk about good and bad on test points in, as we go along here. But um, mechanically stable uh, is a big thing as you're... Um, going uh, through the process of development, and uh, easy and quick to, to connect correctly. Um, one way of doing that is to consider doing a test fixture, even for a prototype. Um, it's not something that a lot of people do, although I've done commercial products uh, where that's been part of the, the prototyping process, and there's a whole industry uh, around uh, developing test fixtures, uh, both doing the entire job of generating test fixture, but there's also people uh, like uh, who sell these kinds of reusable um, boxes that, that you can build test fixtures around. Um, they're not super expensive, and, and uh, even getting a custom test fixture done professionally is not necessarily all that expensive. Um, it's certainly a kind of thing for professional products that you might consider. In addition, I mean, if you're planning on it going to production with a, pro with a project at some point, you're going to have to do this kind of thing for the production line anyway, and getting started on thinking about tests and test fixtures even early on is not a bad practice. Um, if you're not doing it professionally, uh, there's a lot of uh, information out on the web about doing 3D printed or laser cut test fixtures that are customized for your board. Um, there's a, uh, a number of projects on Thingiverse, for example, for, that uh, provide you with sort of adaptable um, templates for these sorts of things. And so that's, a, that's one way to go. If you don't want to do that, um, well, let me, let me back up for a second. Um, the, the downside to doing a, a test fixture is that if you change your design, then you're going to have to do it again. It's also a, uh, an additional expense that you may or may not want to uh, take the time to uh, and, and money to do. Uh, so if you choose not to, then uh, put in a lot of good test points. And I don't, <laughs> by good, I don't mean wires soldered onto vias and components. Um, that's a last resort. It's not a good practice. Uh, we've probably, or many of us have certainly seen and even perpetrated uh, these sort of test bed monstrosities where there's a lot of wires coming off of a board and they're tacked onto various bits and pieces of the, of the circuit board. And if you're very lucky, you don't, you know, accidentally knock the thing over and rip something off your board or throw it onto the floor and uh, pull down some of your test equipment. Um, so don't do that. <laughs> uh, similarly, uh, although it's at least mechanically a little more stable, just bare copper test points scattered around your board is not the best practice. Um, it's better than, um, you know, scraping uh, the solder mask off of a trace and soldering to that, for example, or on a component. But really, I would advocate doing stable mechanical connections, pin headers or connectors, uh, something that um, preferably is through hole, although um, that costs you board real estate on both sides of your, of your design or all the way through if it's a multi-layer board. Uh, but uh, they're a lot more mechanically stable and if you're unplugging and plugging things a lot, um, surface mount pin headers in my experience have a tendency to rip pads off the boards. Um, so if you can afford the real estate, 
do through hole pin headers that are really mechanically <coughs> solid. Uh, and you can either, you know, scatter them around the board as a sort of single uh, test points, or you can preferably put them into multi-pin connectors. Uh, and the reason for that, or the main reason for that, is that not only do you want things that are mechanically stable, but you also want things that are quick to disconnect and connect correctly. And the disadvantage with a bunch of individual connections that you have to uh, connect uh, in a particular order it, uh, is that uh, there's this chance that you'll do it wrong the next time you need to do it, and you'll waste a lot of time uh, chasing problems that might not be there. And there's also just a, a sort of a, uh, a, a cognitive drag on having to do that. So if you need to reuse a piece of test equipment and you disconnect it from your project, and then you come back and you have to reconnect uh, seven test probes in the right order or in the right uh, positions, you may just not feel like doing it because it's a, it's a pain in the neck and, and then spend time uh, less efficiently debugging your board. So reducing mental drag and reducing this sort of friction to doing things right is an important part of this as well. Uh, so where should you do test points? Well, ideally everywhere. Uh, if you're spending the real estate to do it, then do it on things that you don't even think you'll need. Uh, so certainly all the power rails and provide good grounds that are convenient to use for analog signals. You want to provide the appropriate test points with, if necessary, good connectors that allow you to connect uh, with signal integrity. Uh, and that includes having good nearby ground points so that if you have to probe things, you can do it with short ground leads. All the buses that either come in and off of your board or that go between chips on your board um, should all be uh, provided with test points. All the GPIOs that you're going to use, and including some that you don't think you're going to use because it's always useful to have a few extra GPIOs that you can use for debugging or for performance testing of your programs. And certainly, a programming or debugging lines that you need, do those with connectors. Uh, I've seen and I've participated in projects where you have to hold a programming lead on with one hand and try to type with the other hand to program the board, uh, and that just doesn't work very well. Uh, particularly, it's not a practical way to do it if you're doing debugging and doing sort of long-term development. So put on decent connectors for all those things. Um, you can always take them off later after you get your board working. Uh, one of the uh, nice kinds of uh, power monitoring uh, uh, test point setups that I've seen is to put sense resistors, or at least the pads for sense resistors, in line with all your power rails. Um, the one coming into the board, if you have multiple power domains, then to all of them. Uh, and also think about doing the same thing uh, for the different uh, important sub-circuits of your design. Um, and the nicest way that I've seen to do this is to do it with uh, not only a sense resistor on the, uh, in line with the power rail, but also to put uh, right beside that uh, two test points that um, are on either side of the resistor. And that way you can, uh, if you don't want to use a sense resistor, you can just put a standard jumper on them. Uh, if you choose to disconnect part of your board because you want to uh, isolate that or, or test it separately or whatever, you can do it by pulling a jumper off. And you can also attach um, two leads across those, those two test points to measure the power draw by looking at the voltage drop across your resistor. And that's very helpful for doing uh, power optimization, uh, particularly if you um, do it for all the sub-circuits in your board, then you can uh, watch as you, say, run the program or, or do some uh, tests to see where on your board the power is going. Um, so this is something that really, uh, particularly for battery-powered devices, is a really nice thing to do. Uh, spend the time to label your boards, put useful information on there, uh, certainly signal labels, voltage levels if there's useful information about voltages that you expect at certain points, I squared C addresses for devices it's useful to have. Uh, try and avoid having to go back and fire up your, your computer and pull up the schematic or the, the board layout to get information. I mean, again, it's reducing friction. You put the things on there that you think you'll be using so that you can get it from the board and not have to 
bounce back and forth and context switch. Um, start thinking while you're doing the development of your board, while you're doing the planning and, and, uh, and um, component selection and design about the test plan. Uh, how are you going to verify the different parts of your board? What kind of test code are you going to need to use? What's the sort of minimum uh, bit of test firmware that you need to start verifying functionality? Um, as part of the component uh, selection process, you might want to start before you really even design the board with uh, development boards or breakout boards to try and verify that the components you're going to select are ones that you can easily drive. Uh, find, try and find places where you can get code that you think is reliable for these. Look at example code from the manufacturer or other sources. Um, so that you can come into the bring up process with code that you don't have to debug before you can debug your board. You know, you'd like to have something you can rely on to test your board without having, uh, a, as, to have less unknowns basically in the process, right? So um, also think about the other side. If you're uh, communicating with the outside world from your board, what is it you're going to need on the other side of those communications to test them? If you're doing an RF design, how are you going to generate uh, test signals and, and, um, and verify that your radio is working? Or even if you're doing just simple serial communication, uh, what do you need to send back and forth? Uh, are there issues with stepwise testing of your design? Uh, can you, you know, what's the order in which you have to bring things up so that you can test them? Are there dependencies there that make that hard to do? Uh, what parts of the boards need to be brought up before something else can be tested? Uh, and try and, you know, think through that process and work around problems that you might see there before you design your board. Uh, and as I said, what kind of external test signals are you going to need? You know, radio um, on the other side? Uh, or uh, some voltage level that you need to test the sensor? Uh, what is it that you're going to need uh, in terms of test equipment or PC so software or um, other equipment that you might need to do the testing? Um, and again, uh, you know, the test plan thing is something that uh, certainly if you're going to make more than a few of, you're going to have to have a good test methodology for your boards anyway. And you might as well start thinking about that up front because in many cases, certainly in professional uh, uh, environments, the test plan and the test code and the test fixture for a board is as much work as the board and the firmware for the product itself. So the earlier you start and the more you think about how you can do that, the, the better off you're going to be. Um, so then we can hopefully um, have a, a well-prepared process in mind and have uh, lots of good test points and lots of other information on your board. And let's talk a little bit about execution. What do you do when you get the board? Uh, first of all, what kind of equipment might you need? Well, actually, not a lot. Um, you certainly need a multimeter in order to, uh, to uh, measure voltages and resistance. Uh, I mean, it can be a really cheap multimeter. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Um, a current limiting power supply is a really nice thing to have because that allows you to power up the board in a controlled way without um, necessarily putting too much current in it right away. Um, if you have a, a microprocessor on board, you certainly need a, a programmer and a debugger. Uh, and really, that's sort of the basics. Uh, I've done commercial projects where that was all the equipment we ever used to, to bring the board up and develop the firmware. Um, a logic analyzer is another thing that might be useful, certainly a thing that you might want to have in your toolkit. And those don't necessarily have to be very expensive. You can look at the uh, SIGROC project, an open source project for doing um, uh, analysis of signals that um, is compatible with a lot of inexpensive logic analyzers, including things from you know, China for $10. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily have to be an expensive thing. Um, if you're generating signals uh, as input or output from your board or you need to uh, generate test signals to stimulate parts of your board, then you might think about what you need there. Uh, there are things like uh, the, the Bus Pirate, which is a um, sort of a hobby level um, 
uh, signal generator and, and an uh, analyzer for I squared C and SPI signals and uh, lots of other kinds of serial and, and parallel protocols. Uh, and then there are many others that you could, you could look at as well there. Uh, and, you know, you might, if you're really uh, feeling flush, you could use an oscilloscope, but it's not something that you typically would need for the kinds of designs that I'm talking about. Um, so the first thing you might do when you get an assembled board or you finish assembling your board is just do some basic uh, construction checks. Uh, check the soldering and component placement. Look for solder bridges and bad joints and, and components that are not um, making good contact. Uh, check all the ICs for orientation. Uh, check all the polarized components for orientation. So make sure that you put your uh, microprocessor down with pin one in the right part of the board. Uh, make sure that your diodes and, and polarized capacitors are the right way around, all those sorts of things. Uh, check for things like just stray solder, excess flux, and bits and pieces of wire and things like that that uh, are around your board. And do all this stuff before you get tempted to, to plug it in. Um, do some electrical checks before you do it. Check, uh, use your multimeter to check for shorts between uh, all your power rails and ground. Um, if you find a, a really low resistance between your positive voltage and ground, then that's something you really have to deal with before you plug the board in. Um, and do that for any other uh, power domains that you might have on the board. If you have a regulator on board, do it before and after the regulator. Uh, verify the polarity of all the power inputs. Uh, you know, if you're uh, plugging a particular kind of connector into your board to power it, make sure that you got plus and minus the right way around. Uh, I've made that mistake and had a plug that was the wrong way around, and it's not a necessarily a pretty thing to do. Uh, similarly for batteries, you know, make sure that you've, you've got plus and minus right. Um, and then you can think about plugging your board in. Uh, make an estimate of what you think a reasonable current draw would be for the board before it's programmed and so on. So remember that most of the components are probably not going to be active until you start programming things and turning them on. And if you know, factor that into your current estimate, set that on your uh, power supply and, and plug things in. Um, and then verify that the current draw is reasonable, is in the, the range of your expectations. If it's too high and your current limiting kicks in on your uh, power supply, then you need to rethink what's going on. I'm not going to really talk about sort of the debugging process. It's a whole other talk about um, uh, kinds of tricks and, and techniques that you can use for that. But these are all things that, that should stop you and put you into that mode if, if they aren't working. Verify the voltages in and other power rails that you've got. That's where those test points are, are really handy for on the power rails. Uh, make sure every, uh, every IC is getting the power you expect it to get. Uh, and if you have a microprocessor on board, you probably have either a crystal or some other kind of oscillator. Uh, and if you have the equipment, it's useful to verify that that's actually working at the frequency that you expect it to, because if it isn't, then your microprocessors are not going to work. Uh, but that's sort of an optional thing, and, and many times you don't have the equipment to do that. If all that looks good, then uh, move on to functionality tests. Uh, hook up a programmer, try to verify that it sees the microprocessor, recognizes it for what it is supposed to be, whether you can start programming it uh, with some simple code. Uh, and then from that point on, really, what you do is dependent very much on what your board is supposed to do, and that's where the, your, your test plan that you were thinking about earlier on starts to come into effect. You start putting on your initial test code uh, and sort of step by step uh, verifying the functionality and doing what you need to do to uh, verify that all of the parts of your board are doing what you expect them to do. Um, and again, that's the thing where you want to think about what the minimum code and uh, what the most reliable code you can find is to do that so that you can uh, easily verify that at least the basic functionalities of all the parts of your board are working. Uh, and then you really get into you know, firmware development, and that's where the rest of the process um, 
just sort of flows from from there and uh, I would say that even when you get beyond just sort of verifying all the basic functionality and powering your board up, the prototype with test points and all of the useful information is going to be hugely valuable as you do firmware development as well. Um, and so, you know, develop, uh, doing the time, taking the time to do the planning and the preparation is going to pay off not only in, in uh, making it possible to bring the board up quickly and, and verify functionality, but also uh, in the longer term process of doing firmware development. So, you know, just to sum up, um, embrace the prototype. That's something that really I can't stress enough. Accept the fact that you're going to make mistakes to begin with and that you're going to have to iterate your project. Even the simplest of projects can have the most amazing failure modes that you don't expect. Um, and even if you're very experienced, you can, believe me, make those mistakes. And so just accept that and live with it and take advantage of it. Uh, prepare well. Certainly, you know, if you're designing the board yourself, spend the time to think through the process of what you need to do uh, an efficient overall process and not just what the functionality of the final product needs to be. Uh, and then, you know, execute methodically. Don't skip steps. Uh, it's easy to do. You get excited. You want to see your board working. But, you know, go through the steps. Uh, and that's it. I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks for coming. Have you ever used um, JTAG boundary scan to bring up? Yeah, have you ever used JTAG boundary scan in your bringing up a board? That's something that uh, used to be a lot more common, in my understanding, with signal uh, analysis kinds of tools and things like that. Um, and most of the sort of, of projects in, in this uh, sort of domain that I'm talking about really probably don't go to that level. Um, you certainly want to make sure that your programmer recognizes any of the chips that it's supposed to, to see, like uh, if you have a spy flash on there that you want to talk to. you. Know, make sure that you can see that on the chain and so on. But yeah, that, that really comes into play when you have a lot more complex boards with multiple things on a JTAG uh, chain. Uh, I guess I would say, well, first of all, um, yeah, thank you for, uh, <laughs> for thinking about embracing the prototype. Uh, it's, uh, in terms of, of uh, sort of version control, I guess I'm a big believer in using a real version control system. And uh, even if you're doing a project yourself, certainly in, in larger professional organizations, there's an entire uh, infrastructure for engineering change orders and tracking things and stuff like that. But if you don't have that access to uh, to those sorts of tools, then use Git or something like that um, to just track issues. You know, make sure that you keep notes um, along with your project to uh, tie, and you can tie those to versions of your schematic that you check in as well, so that the you know you can keep track of, uh, keep a correspondence between the issues you solved and and the versions of the schematic and and board that you're uh, generating. And that reminds me, you should also obviously put version numbers on your, on your board so that you know what it was when you come back to it. Um, that's another very useful thing to put on the board. I put dates too. Dates is good too, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, particularly if you can track back in, in your Git history and see you know, what this version was supposed to have corrected and connect that with the specific issues. That's a really useful thing if you come back later to a board. Other questions? Are you, are you just using uh, sensor mesh uh, pin headers for your testing 
I mean, that's the simplest thing. Uh, or really, ideally, you used, you know, keyed shrouded headers, so there's really only one way you can plug things in and you can't get it wrong. Uh, but, you know, 0.5, in, uh, 0.05 inch 50 mil headers is good too if you can, uh, I mean, there's a bit of a, it depends on what you can make uh, connectors for easily. I, I really think that it's worth taking the time to make up, um, you know, multi uh, wire connectors that plug into connectors for these things. It's an extra time sink, and for 50 mil headers, it's a little bit harder to do. For 0.1 inch, it's really pretty easy. You just have to have a little crimper in it. It's really not very hard. It's another one of those skills that a little practice and you get pretty good at. Uh, and then it means that you can just plug things in and it, everything's hooked up right. You don't have any ambiguities. Uh, and it's worth the time up front. Again, one of those preparation things. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, that's a whole other talk in a way uh, because there's a lot of sort of t tricks of the trade. Uh, shorts are, are one where uh, that's another place where having the multiple inline sense resistors is a really useful thing because you can isolate particular parts of your board. So if you have a short, you can isolate that part of the board and, and if it goes away, then you know it's in that part of the circuit. So. That's just sort of a simple mechanical way to do it. I mean, there is test equipment. There are short finders that, um, that are basically milli-ohm uh, measurement things that you can use to home in on where shorts are. Um, but um, I've never had a terrific amount of luck with those. <laughs> uh, but sort of, you know, pulling components if you have to, really, to, to start seeing where things are is really the most effective way that I've found, honestly. Thermal cameras, if you're really uh, pumping the, pumping the uh, uh, current into the board, yeah, for sure. Um, but if you don't have a thermal camera, you can, uh, you can use the uh, isopropanol trick of just, you know, putting it on the board and see where it evaporates fastest. <laughs> that works pretty well, actually. All right, well, thanks very much. Perfect. Hello. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, uh, those of you in the room, but also those folks watching online now and in the future. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, first, an introduction. Uh, I'm Scott Shawcroft. I go by Tan Newt online. If you've ever seen that, that's me. 
Um, it's weird, which means it's mine, which is great. Uh, I'm a freelance software engineer, and I'm the project lead on CircuitPython for Adafruit. I've been doing that almost three years. Uh, it'll be three years in August. And that's me uh, with Blinka, who is our mascot and is also at the bottom of a bunch of our slides. Um, here's the plan uh, for the next, uh, oh, I should start a timer, uh, 25 minutes-ish. Um, first, I'm going to do a live demo so I can get that out of the way. Uh, and then I will talk about what I mean by supercharging your hardware. And then we'll do a deep dive uh, into a vertical slice of how the demo works. Um, so we'll do software and then we'll talk hardware after that. Uh, so let's do the demo. So Hannah's going to help me out. So, so the speaker's here. I will show you what we have. Recognize that sound? So what I have here is a Game Boy. It's a DMG, and it has a special cart that's running CircuitPython. And so I'm going to take a couple minutes to just show you what I mean by supercharging. So I have a USB. I'm going to let you hold it. Juggle. So I just plugged it, the USB cable into the cartridge, and if we look on Finder, we get a CircuitPython drive. It says CircuitPy. It's a little small, so just take my word for it. It binged again. That, uh, the, what CircuitPython does is every time the file, a, anything on the drive is written, it auto restarts your code. So you're going to hear a lot of bings and boops in the next few minutes. Um, so I'm going to open it up. And, all right. Uh, so what I have here is a pretty simple file uh, that lets me poke the bits in the first sound register, like the first voice of the Game Boy's sound registers. Um, I've commented out some of the fancier stuff. I'm going to start just with frequency. So I'm going to switch this uh, bit one uh, from a zero to a one, and I'm just going to hit Control S for save. Hopefully. Oh no. What's it look like? Let's just turn it off and back on again, shall we? Uh, oh yeah, it's not happy. This is a Game Boy thing, not a Circuit Python thing. <laughs> and we'll go into why that's tricky later. So we'll start it back up, and the drive will show up. Ah, it's a different sound. And there's the drive. And so now, hopefully, it'll work. We drop those two bits down, and we should get a low note. Wah. Um, we can play with the envelope, which is uh, how long the note plays. Or, or change the initial volume, so hopefully we can make it a little louder. Or longer. Uh, we can change the lower frequency note bits. <laughs> and then the funnest, the, the most fun part, uh, I will skip to because we're a little behind, I assume, uh, is the sweep register. This is unique to the first voice, I believe. And it's what makes a lot of the sound effects you hear in Game Boy games. What it does is it changes the frequency of the pitch as the note plays. So if I just uncomment it and hit save again, we're increasing. Um, maybe we don't want to start that, you know, that low in frequency. So that sounds a little bit more like what we've heard before. Uh, we can change the duration. So it's even longer, or we can do it real short. Um, <laughs> it's so small. So let's make it longer again so we can hear it. It's about as long as it gets. And then we can do the opposite direction for our grand finale. Oh, that's, a, that's such a sad note. 
<laughs> All right, I take that back. Let's do something else. Let, let's make it go up again, and let's make it be a little bit like quick about it. Perfect. All right, that's the live demo. <laughs> Thank you. I'll save the batteries so I can show you more later. Um, so the reason I like doing these CircuitPython demos, let's put it on a pedestal. Um, the reason I like doing these live demos is it demonstrates how quickly you can I iterate on your code on, with CircuitPython. Um, all of the functionality, all of the parsing, everything that runs the code lives on the device itself, um, which makes it super powerful. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So there's two parts. Oh, yes. Uh, this, is part of the re this talk is part of the reason I got into it. Uh, it's an hour-long talk from uh, 33C3 by Michael Style. It's very good. If you want to know about all the registers in the entire Game Boy and how it works and how the CPU works, uh, it's an hour-long, action-packed overview of how the Game Boy actually works. So I won't cover that today. Um, I'm just going to move on and talk more about the CircuitPython stuff. So um, we think of CircuitPython as two pieces of a larger puzzle. Uh, the first is code, and the second is community. I split that into two slides, um, but they're both equally important to supercharging charging your hardware. Um, if you're not aware, Python is a programming language that is very commonly taught as the very first programming language for folks. It's very easy to get into. Uh, CircuitPython uh, brings Python to hardware, and the code and the tool chain live all on the device. So you, the only software I was using to do that iteration was my text editor, and I was just saving to the drive that it shows up. So it's super quick, uh, works on Chromebooks, that sort of thing, which is really great. Um, on the code side, we currently support the SAMD21, SAMD51, and the NRF52840. Um, so if you have devices of your own that have those chips in them, it's very easy to add support for CircuitPython. Um, and credit where credit is due, we are built on MicroPython, which is, did uh, lay the, the initial foundation for Python on microcontrollers. So community-wise, um, we have a very active community. Uh, we have a code of conduct. So we make sure everybody is welcomed and friendly to each other. We enforce it as well, which is great. Uh, our community lives kind of on our Discord channel where we have a weekly meeting that everyone is welcome to attend, and then also on our GitHub. Um, we have 150 plus CircuitPython compatible libraries currently, uh, and that's growing every day. Uh, and we have 60 plus supported boards, uh, and those boards have those three platforms that I mentioned earlier. Um, this is the top of our downloads page. So this is circuitpython.org slash downloads. Uh, you can see there's a lot of different form factors uh, that we've been working on, and they all are supported by CircuitPython. Um, two things that Adafruit's been working on that were of particular interest to me were the Pi badge on the left and the Pi gamer on the right um, because they're gaming, and I like gaming. Um, and I thought, you know, it would be great if CircuitPython was a platform for people to make handheld games. It's very easy. The code goes with you. It's all open source. That's super cool. And then I was like, you know, why don't we bring those to another platform, the Game Boy? Um, I had watched Michael's talk, and I was like, you know, I think we could do it. Um, so just quick overview for those of you who don't know. On the left is the original Game Boy. It's known as the DMG because that's in the product model number. Um, it's the big gray thing, and that's what I have here. Uh, the middle is a Game Boy Pocket. It was a later iteration that was a lot smaller. It's like two AAAs rather than four AA's. Um, and then on the right-hand side is Game Boy Color, um, which came even later and had, had some interesting limitations but allowed you to show color. None of these are backlit. I gave my niece one, and she was like, how do I turn the brightness up? And I was like, well, <laughs> that's not... You can mod it now to do it, but none of mine are modded. So these are unmodified stuff. So, uh, OK, let's talk hardware. Um, so how does the hardware work? Uh, I took them apart. I enjoy taking them apart. I give them a bath and make sure they're clean and stuff. I actually took these pictures before I washed the DMG, and it looks a lot better now. I had a sticky button that I've cleaned up. 
Um, some interesting things to note here. Uh, on the left, the DMG is actually uh, multiple boards. It's, it's got two major boards sandwiched uh, this way that are kind of hard to see, plus the sound-related boards on the bottom. Um, and then the color and the pocket are a lot more similar. They're a single board. Um, and basically, they have one chip that does everything, uh, which is that uh, kind of horizontal chip above the black uh, rectangle. And the big black rectangle is the cartridge connector. So the way it works is um, a cartridge is basically memory that you can swap in and out. Um, on the left, we have uh, the Tetris cart, which was packed with Game Boys in the United States. So you can find them pretty regularly. And it's the simplest because all of the code and all of the graphics and all of the sound could fit within memory, uh, within the memory address space that was given on the 16-bit address bus. So basically, you get 16 bits in of what you want to read, and you get 8 bits out of, of the data that you're reading. Um, Tetris is simple because it's relatively small. In the middle, we have Mary Kate and Ashley Pocket Planner. Um, <laughs> I know. Uh, I tend to go to, so I cut up the carts so that my, my cart can fit in it. So I go to the game store and be like, what's the cheapest thing I can buy? Um, but this cart is actually pretty interesting from an engineering standpoint uh, because one, it uh, required more memory space than the address space gave you. So they have a different techniques for banking in different memory depending on what part of the game you're in. Uh, and then in, in, in addition to that, um, the way that saves worked for this era is that they put a, put a battery in the cartridge um, to keep your RAM that's had your save states going. So if you have a Pokemon game from when you were little, look online and figure out how to swap the battery. Otherwise, you'll lose it eventually when the battery runs out. Um, so that's what the thing in the top right is. And then on the, the furthest right cart is the cart that I designed uh, to run CircuitPython in the Game Boy. Um, let's go into that. Um, again, as I said, uh, you can see kind of here that there's 15 address lines, eight data lines coming in. There's a few clock and power and control signals as well. Uh, the general layout is uh, the bottom three things are logic level shifters. Uh, the top right thing is a logic sh level shifter, like a tri-state buffer. And then uh, SAMD51, and then a bunch of MIDI stuff, because chiptunes are fun. Um, so this idea of uh, MCU as a cart is not my idea. Uh, somebody used an STM32F4 uh, development kit to actually do some tricks by hosting, like serving up ROMs using the STM. Uh, and the basic challenge is serving your data on the bus at a one megahertz clock rate. Uh, there's some debate whether a, a Game Boy is four or one megahertz, uh, but the memory bus is one megahertz. Um, and I chose to use the SAMD51 because, I, as I mentioned earlier, it's really easy to port to different SAMD51 platforms. Um, and I worked on it, so I know the chip a lot. So the basics of the hardware, uh, we have access to the reset line, which means we can start the Game Boy when we want which is great because we know exactly what it's expecting in order. Uh, we use DMA to queue up a sequences of data so that we can say like, oh, I want to write to this sound register and I issue the, the instructions and the data to be able to pull that off. I actually ignore the address completely to do that. And then I use uh, the SAMD51 has like four lookup tables uh, that you can use to do like very basic things. And I end the A15 clock and read because A15 is the, the memory if the bit is high, it's not us. If the bit is low, it is us. Um, and this means that we can switch the game logic from uh, the Game Boy CPU into the SAMD51 and in Python. Uh, so let's talk about how that's done. Um, if you want, this is the repo for it. It's all MIT licensed, uh, and you can go hack on it if you like. Um, I have a presentations repo under myself uh, that has this, this presentation in it and others as well. Um, so as I said earlier, adding a board is really easy. Here's kind of like the super high level steps that it, that it takes. Um, we have a boards folder that has every board in it. Uh, those folders for each board have four files in it, which include like what exact version of the SAMD51 are you? Do you have external spy flash? And what is your pin mapping? Once you have that, we also, you should add it to our Travis.yaml. We'll build it every time we change anything so we know that we don't break you. Um, 
And it also means that we can auto-release all the files for you. So we have like 700 different versions of CircuitPython <laughs> that you can get. Because we not only do we build every board, but we build every language for every board. So we have on the order of like 10 different languages that you can get CircuitPython on. And that's like human language, not programming language. <laughs> and then lastly, I showed the website earlier. There's a way for you to do a pull request to get your board on there as well. Um, so the first challenge when it came to making this cart is dealing with the bootloader. The bootloader is the only piece of code that the like, Game Boy has built in. And it does some tricks to uh, verify that the cart is a Nintendo cart. Uh, basically, it reads the logo uh, to display it. So it read, reads Nintendo to display it. And then it reads it again to verify it says Nintendo, which is great until you're not memory. <laughs> And then you can play a trick where you say, oh, I know this is the display one. Let me return whatever I want. And then when it verifies, we return Nintendo. Uh, there's also some checksum metadata over, over the cart that we just kind of drop a blob of metadata in because it doesn't use for anything else. And uh, it plays the chime. So the first two notes that it plays, I had no control over. After that, it delegates to the cart. And once you have execution rights, you can do whatever you want, which is great. Um, so a deep dive, uh, just to, I'm going to show you like five slides of code uh, briefly, so, but I'm going to go pretty quick because they're slides of code. Uh, this is the gist of what, what I'm going to show you. I'm going to go from the bottom up because we started with hardware, so now we're at the bottom of, of the software side. The lowest level C is uh, what you would usually do in C, so all of the register banging and time critical stuff you can do in C. And then I'll show you how to hook that C into Python land and then what that looks like from Python land, um, and then talk about the high-level libraries you can build on top of that. Um, so what I did is I, I, this is the Q commands. So basically, just issue any instructions with data that you want. So you can write basically anything. Um, this is not the complete function, so it shouldn't make sense. Um, but the interesting bits is that uh, it's called common how. That's what we call all that lowest level C stuff within our repository. And then uh, for, the, for the Game Boy in particular, we actually have to add this uh, suffix basically to the data we do so that um, as, if we're not DMAing anything, we make sure our program counter doesn't continue incrementing. Like if we did a no op, the program counter would continue to count up and we risk it running off our memory address space and then we lose control. Uh, so what this is doing is just loading an address well within our address space and then repeatedly jumping to it forever until we, again, queue up a DMA and re return something else. Um, so that's the lowest level of how we issue commands. Uh, this is the level that ties it into Python, or part one of two. Uh, the very top is what we use for our documentation. So our documentation strings are directly in the code. Uh, we do some error checking, so Python does exceptions. Uh, so you can raise those from C, and then uh, the call, the second, the thing before the return is a call to the function I just showed you. Um, and then we wrap it in a function object, which is a, just a struct. And then uh, we have a dictionary or a table to map between names and the internal C objects that represent functions. Uh, so this is how you get, uh, in Python, a GBIO module with all those different names. So that's the entirety of, of what we have in terms of API at the very lowest like C to Python boundary. Um, this is what it looks like in Python. Um, you can see the instructions we use to load uh, just to basically set memory addresses. And at the very bottom, you'll see gbio.q commands. That's the call into C. Um, you can look at this later. It's not that interesting. Um, it's a lot of boilerplate, but it's regular boilerplate, so it's pretty easy to just do. Uh, the point is, is that if you're doing Python and it's too slow for what you're doing, there's an escape hatch. You can use C to do what you want, and it's not, not bad. Um, and this is actually a, a cut-down version of the demo I did at the start. So um, you say GB for Game Boy, the address that you want to write, and then you just assign to it. And under the hood, it's using all that Q command stuff to issue the instructions to set the memory on the Game Boy. Um, just to wrap up, um, we'd love to have more boards supported and more platforms supported. Uh, if you're interested at all, please reach out to me uh, or our community on Discord. There's the link for the Discord. 
Um, it's really easy if you use SAMD2151 or NRF52840. So please try that if you are. Uh, if you don't use that, we'd still love to support your platform. It's just a, a bit more work. Um, and this is kind of the minimum requirements for a new platform. 32 bits, 32K RAM, 256K flash, and USB, because you don't have the edit cycle without USB. And that's it. Uh, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Um, I won't take questions right now. Uh, this is how you can get a hold of me. So if you're here with us, uh, I'll be around all day. Feel free to snag me. If you're online, uh, this is how you can get a hold of me after this conference um, and ask all the questions that you possibly have. Um, so thank you. Kim, yep. I don't see the monitor. You know how it lets you choose? I know, it's not that thing. It's not that. Oh, display. Oh, wait, but that's airplay. Oh, where is. Oh, there it is. Uh, I want to do mirror. Usually that. Usually it just lets you pick, I'm like. That would help. Um, if you want to try the airplay, it might. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, maybe we should do that, and then we have USB C. computer has um, USB-C, so... Do we need to be on the same Wi-Fi to do that? Yeah. Then maybe that's just more problem. Oh, no, 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 I found you, I found you, I found you.
was just thinking. I don't know if it's on here. I don't think it might be. Yeah, because it's not playing. It wasn't playing this time. I showed you that. Like usually it gives me like a, um, you know, like a monitor right. thing that's like, oh, do you want another monitor? It doesn't. Usually when I plug in an HDMI, it gives me the option to choose the second monitor, but it doesn't give me that at all. Can I do this? Yeah, let's try this. Is there a code? Here, let me add it. will pop up. Oh, 9888. Oh, oh, oh. Technology is so hard. Um, this is. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna do that. Cool. Okay. Hi. Thank you for your patience there, and thanks for coming. So um, I'm. Oh, I'm just gonna introduce myself, I guess. <laughs> um, I'm Sophie Wong, and um, I make a lot of wearable tech projects. Um, but I'm not an engineer. I'm actually a designer. And uh, I wasn't really interested in electronics, or I, I didn't really start tinkering with electronics until I realized that I could put them on my body. That 
was really interesting to me because I've always been into um, wearable things like fashion and costumes and jewelry. So um, now I actually have a book out called Wearable Tech Projects. And um, that's because pretty much everything I do, almost every project I build becomes a tutorial of some kind. And uh, often they are published in Hackspace magazine, which is a UK-based magazine. I do one for them um, every month. And they've collected all of my tutorials so far into this book, uh, which is really cool. You can learn about wearable tech through their magazine, but all in one place. Um, so it's a great place for people to get started, even if you've never worked with electronics before, or maybe you have, but you've never put it into a piece of clothing. So here's some of the things that I make. Um, this is a, a cool like light up jacket that I, I was wearing it yesterday. It's um, It's got some NeoPixels in it. It's got a microcontroller in it with some different light animation modes. And the diffusers on the back are 3D printed on fabric. This is a sound sample glove that meows. Uh, so every finger plays a different meow sound, and actually, it's it's not actually a cat meowing. It's literally me saying meow. <laughs> so uh, here's what that sounds like. Ooh. So this is technically it's meowing. Uh, and this is my Flappy Bird wearable controller hoodie. So this allows you to play Flappy Bird by flapping like a bird. Uh, so it's a really immersive way to play Flappy Bird. Uh, here's a look at the, this is when I got the prototype working. Oh my god, 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 oh my god. So uh, I didn't know I was saying oh my god <laughs> when, I, when I did that. That's just my natural reaction. Uh, I also like to make a lot of costumes. Uh, so this is my Ghostbusters costume, and I um, made the jumpsuit from scratch, and I built the proton pack from scratch. It's got all these LEDs in it and, and light-up displays. I like to put tech in my costumes. And this is my most recent costume. This is my spacesuit project. So I've got uh, lights inside the helmet. Oh, I've got the helmet right here. So I put lights inside the helmet, and um, I've also got some lights on the front of the chest piece, and there's a fan on my belt that blows air through this helmet while I'm wearing it, so I can wear it all day long um, and stay really cool and comfortable. And that's the helmet for those of you in the back. Um, and this helmet is actually plastic. It's mostly plastic with some EVA foam on top of it. Um, and it's incredibly light. So later on, if you want to find me and hold this thing, I think you'll be surprised. It's incredibly light. But you might be thinking, like, uh, is that stuff wearable tech? Like, I thought wearable tech was like Fitbit and, um, you know, HoloLens and Snap glasses. And you're totally right. These things are all examples of consumer wearable tech, but wearable tech can also be costumes, like crazy costumes. This is James Bruton's Iron Man costume. It's this massive piece of tech, and it's a wearable. Uh, wearable tech can also be fashion, and there's a lot of really cool fashion designers working on different ways to get technology into garments. Or wearable tech can just be some new way of making your body light up. And it's kind of interesting when wearable tech crosses over into biohacking. I think that's really interesting. So there are a lot of different form factors for wearable tech right now. It can be a tattoo. It can be a medical device, an assistive device, a game controller. And this is really exciting because this means that if you want to dabble in wearable tech or you want to start building wearable tech, there's a lot of resources out there that you can just learn from just purely through observation. Because as different as these projects all look in scale and in function, 
the constant between all of them is that they go on the human body. And that's a difficult problem to solve for. So it's really valuable to look at these different objects and see how these designers of these projects and the engineers of these projects are solving that problem. So when you start to look at them all together, you'll, you'll notice things like wearables are often circular or tubular in shape. And this is because the human body is like a stack of cylinders. So you can think of the human body as just a bunch of cylinders, like your torso is a cylinder, your arms are cylinders, your head is like one little stubby cylinder on top. And so it makes sense that wearables are circular because that's a really natural shape to put on a cylinder. So headsets are circles, watches are circles, and clothes, like your clothes, are tubes, and it's kind of crazy when you start thinking of clothes as tubes, like a skirt is a tube, a t-shirt is three tubes, a glove is like six tubes. It's like, you know, when you start looking at clothing and seeing the tubes, it's like you've, the matrix has been revealed to you and you just, you, you're not gonna unsee the tubes. Wearables are often adjustable, and that's because fit is really hard. It's hard to make one thing that fits a lot of people, but it's also just difficult to make one thing that fits one person, because our bodies are moving all the time, and they're changing all the time. Like, if you are walking around all day, your feet at the end of the day are gonna swell. They're gonna be a different size than they were in the morning. Or maybe you have a burrito for lunch and you know you need to loosen your belt a little bit. Our bodies are constantly changing and so our wearables have to change as well. And you'll notice that watches and belts have buckles. That's a really useful strategy to achieve a, an adjustable piece of technology. Um, earbuds, they all come with these different size ear domes now because everyone's ear is a different size and shape. And the HTC Vive actually has three points of adjustment on the, um, on the headset, and that, that's great. That means it can fit a bunch of different size heads. If you've got a hairdo, you can make that work. So wearables are often a combination of flexible material. Oh, sorry. I'm jumping into the future. Wearables are also rounded. They have a lot of round corners. They're very smooth. And that's because hard objects and sharp corners, they don't feel good on our fleshy, soft bodies. We're pretty fragile. And a lot of electronics are, are rigid and pokey. So you'll notice that a lot of medical devices, um, they never have right angles and they never have sharp edges because that's very uncomfortable and when you've got something on your body all day long if it's rubbing against you you can get abrasion and you can get blisters um, you also notice this in electronic components that are designed for wearable applications so there's a lily pad arduino there there's a flora there's a gemma um, these are all boards that are designed to be used in wearables and they're circular they're round. If they're rectangular, their corners are rounded off. And they have surface mount components. They don't have pokey things on the bottom. So all the, f the, the bottom surfaces of these boards are perfectly flat. And that's great, because if you're putting something pokey on a piece of fabric, you're going to abrade it. You're going to tear it. It's going to damage your skin. It's not comfortable. So wearables are often a mix of flexible materials and rigid materials. And this is because soft, flexible materials are great for movement. Like that's why clothing is made of fabric because it's really comfortable and it moves with us. It's not constricting. But flexible materials are, are not really great for hardware because your hardware doesn't want to bend and flex all day. That's when you're going to get damaged. So, um, to, so a great example of this mix of materials is um, the spacesuit. There are a lot of different um, surfaces on the spacesuit, and a lot of the technology is centered on the rigid areas. <clears throat> and then they achieve mobility in the joints with, um, with fabric. 
And if you look at the power glove, I think it's kind of interesting to see these things next to each other because you can notice in the joint areas, in the wrist and in the fingers, they've got a similar thing going on. It's a flexible material and it's ridged and that is going to help uh, with movement. And the electronics are, are built onto these surfaces that they've created on flat plastic areas that aren't going to flex on the back of the hand and on the, the back of the arm. So the easiest way to make a piece of wearable tech is to just put some tech into something that's already wearable. You can start with a piece of clothing. Um, I really like to put tech into hoodies and jackets because jackets and hoodies are an outer layer. So you're going to wear them over something. And that means it's not going to get dirty as often and you're not going to have to launder it as often. You're always going to have to clean your wearable, but just to preserve the electronics in it, it's best if you can spread that out. So um, I like to put tech in an outer layer. You can also take advantage of things like lining. So in my LED jacket, I've opened the lining and I put the electronics on the inside. And that keeps the electronics off of my skin. It keeps them away from the elements and it keeps me from snagging on them. So if you're looking for a piece of clothing to put tech into, look for something with a lining. Pockets are really useful. Um, they can hold your, your microcontroller, they can hold your battery pack. Um, you can take advantage of the features of the garment so that you don't have to build your own carrier or holder for these things. Just don't put your keys in the same pocket that your microcontroller is in. That pocket is now for electronics. Gloves are really great. This is a light painting glove. Gloves, you don't want to sew your own glove unless you're a professional glove maker. So just buy a glove. Um, I like to put tech in goggles. It feels like a headset, shoes. So these are all objects that someone else has spent a lot of time figuring out how to put it on your body, how to make it comfortable, how to make it removable. And those are things that then you don't have to figure out. You can concentrate on how to integrate your circuit into this thing. So you're gonna look for the flat areas that aren't gonna flex during wear. So not the front of the shoe, because your foot goes like that. The side is great. These are, it's a starting point for you to figure out how to make your circuit work on the human body. You're gonna need to power your wearable and you're probably gonna want a battery because nobody wants to be plugged into a wall all day. And you've got a lot of options for batteries. I'm sure you all recognize these things. Um, people love to put LiPo batteries in wearable tech, and I do as well. Um, they're small, they're really powerful, but they're kind of delicate. Um, and it's a little bit of a dicey proposition to put something that explosive directly on your body. So lately I've been moving away from LiPo batteries in my work. Um, I really like using USB battery packs. They're really, and that's like the power bank down there that you can charge your phone on. Um, a lot of microcontrollers can just plug right into that with USB. Uh, they often have a built-in on-off switch, which is one less thing that I have to make. And um, the trade-off with, with that is weight. Those are gonna be a lot heavier, they're a bit bulkier and bigger. I think it's worth it. Um, but you're gonna need to think about where you're locating that weight because nine times out of 10, your battery is going to be the heaviest part of your project. So I like to put that close to my body. I like to keep it centered so it's not pulling me off balance or, or yanking on the rest of the project. So I thought it would be interesting and fun to actually dive into like a, a cool piece of wearable tech. And I thought, well, how about the ultimate piece of wearable tech, which is the spacesuit? Um, it's basically a one-man spaceship, and I just love this thing. This is the EMU. This is what NASA uses for spacewalks. So it's a bit, um, it's pretty rugged. It's got a lot of technology and engineering involved in it. And it's pretty cool when you start peeling back the layers. So. This is the this is the torso. This is a fiberglass torso portion that is known as the hard upper torso and it's buried inside the top part of the spacesuit. Like for a long time I thought spacesuits were just fabric. 
there are some rigid portions in there, and that's where they locate the technology. So this is where you get your mix of materials going on. Um, they've got, uh, so this has to be put on over your head and your shoulders. It's notoriously difficult to get into this thing. And the front of the torso has the control panel of the spacesuit. And uh, what's really interesting here is this is this is big, and it's the controls are really robust, so that the astronauts can can work with this control panel when they're wearing those ginormous gloves. Um, but and and the sternum, this chest area, is actually a really great place to house technology because it's one of the only like, almost flat areas of your body, and it doesn't take a lot of flex when you move around. However, if you're an astronaut wearing this spacesuit and you want to work on your control panel, you literally cannot see it from inside the spacesuit. You have to. You're looking down. You can't see what's going on. So all this, the astronauts have um, mirrors on their wrists so they can look at the mirror and do whatever they got to do on the front of their chest and you if you look closely you'll notice that the writing is backwards it's a really interesting design solution to that problem uh, the backpack of the H of the EMU is really iconic and it is where they house the life support system for the um, for the astronaut there's a lot of technology in there obviously weight is less of a concern in outer space um, but fit is still a concern so I was amazed to find out that the spacesuit is actually really adjustable um, the limbs of the spacesuit, have these metal rings that can separate the limbs off and you can switch out sizing rings. So every astronaut is custom fit. They, um, they have their own custom configuration of their limbs and their sizing rings uh, to make the suit as comfortable and as mobile for them as possible. And obviously the helmet is really cool. Um, that's on the left you can see the um, shade visor down in place. And notice that the lighting and the cameras are mounted on the outside of the helmet. That's just something to keep in mind. So um, yeah, I love this spacesuit so much, and I decided to make my own spacesuit. And like, if you look really closely at them side by side, you can see that my spacesuit doesn't look anything like NASA spacesuit. It looks <laughs> totally different. And that's because I'm making a costume. I'm making something aesthetic. And um, for me, the first priority in my costume was aesthetic. So I, I love the NASA spacesuit, but I was really more drawn to like Alien. Like I love the spacesuits in Alien. I love 2001 A Space Odyssey, Prometheus. You know, these are the things that make me go to Joann's and start buying fabric. The Expanse. So this is where all my inspiration came from for the aesthetic of the piece. But I still wanted it to function for me. Um, I didn't need to keep myself alive in space, but I needed to keep myself alive at Comic-Con. So my second priority was comfort. And I did not build my hard upper torso out of fiberglass. I built it out of EVA foam. And it's re really comfortable. It's flexible. I used a laser cutter to get some really detailed um, surface decoration and um, to achieve a good um, pattern. But you can see there's still some similarities. So the armholes are really large. and. That's about the size armhole you need for a semi-rigid garment to still be comfortable and let you move your arms around. Um, I used a similar location for, for the tech that I wanted to put on my spacesuit. Um, but because my spacesuit is aesthetic, I could make some decisions to make it more functional for me. So I mentioned earlier that the fiberglass uh, torso for the spacesuit is one solid piece. I broke my torso into two pieces. So it comes apart at the shoulders and at the side waist. So 
it's really easy for me to put it on and take it off. And I can pack it because I can, I can take those pieces apart completely and nest them in one another. I also raised the bottom edge of the torso way up high off my waist. So my spacesuit comes up to like here and it only comes down to about there. And that gives me a lot of mobility in my upper body that you will not have in something that goes all the way down to your waist. Also gives you more surface area to mount your electronics. Um, so my electronics are in the control panel in the front. It's a control panel. It's actually just LEDs in there. Um, I also cannot see this when I'm wearing it, so it comes off completely. It's just held on with magnets. I just pull it off, switch it on, and stick it back on. I have a fan in my belt, so similar to the spacesuit, my life support system is on my back, and it's just a tiny little computer fan that routes air up through this silicone hose into my helmet, and that keeps my visor from fogging up and gives me a little bit of cool air. And when the helmet is mated to the, the backpack of my suit, you can't see that hose at all. It's just hidden in there doing its job. I've also got a battery pack on my waist. So I mentioned I love those USB battery packs. I've got three little lipstick size battery packs on my belt. And I just, I kind of turn them into like an aesthetic prop. They just look like miscellaneous like space equipment. Um, but they're actually really useful. Like I was charging my phone, I was powering my, my fan, I gave one to someone else whose battery had died at the con. Like, I feel like there's a product here I could, I could design, just a waist-mounted USB battery pack. So I've also got some pleated joints in my spacesuit, and that's you know an aesthetic nod to what's going on in the, the actual spacesuit. But um, in the actual spacesuit, you'll notice the pleating at the joints, it's actually there to make it possible for the astronauts to bend their arms and use their joints when the suit is pressurized. Now, my suit is not pressurized, but um, the pleats kind of puff out when I do bend my arms, and they kind of give this illusion of pressure in my suit. And of course, the whole reason I made this spacesuit was just so I could make a helmet with lights in it, I'll just be honest. And um, it's still my favorite thing about this spacesuit, because honestly, like lights in helmets, are they look so badass. They are not functional at all. You don't really want to put lights on the inside of your helmet, of any helmet, because you can't see out, especially in dark environments like space. Like, you can't see out because it creates a glare on your visor. But dang, it looks cool. So, so that's what I did, and that's what I wanted. And I, what I really wanted was this cinematic moment. Like, I wanted to feel like I was in Alien, so, or 2001. So uh, here's me living that dream. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. So that was a really long project, just so I could do that for a few seconds. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you want to know more about this project, I've got um, an article in the current issue of Make Magazine that's all about um, how I laser cut this, the EVA foam for this project. Um, and I've got an article in Hackspace Magazine about how I put the lights in it. And they're audio reactive, as you saw. Um, and if you're interested in my book, you can, you can definitely go buy it, but you don't have to. You can actually download the whole thing for free. So um, that's a long URL that you can type in to get to that. And yeah, um, I would love to see your projects if you're working on something wearable or something space related or just anything that you think is cool. So come and find me on Twitter, I'm Sophie Wong. And on Instagram and YouTube, I'm Sophie Wong Makes. Thank you. I don't know what time it is. OK, I don't think we have time for questions. But come find me and come hold my, my helmet.
Okay. Hi. Um, uh, my name is Dan Good. Uh, I'm going to be talking about sculpture a little bit. Uh, and I guess I can tell you who I am before I get started. Uh, I'm a sculptor and engineer. Uh, a long time ago, uh, I was an electrical engineer. I spent a lot of time uh, in a bunny suit dipping wafers in acid and putting them in high temperature furnaces. Um, eventually, I wanted to get involved with more creative stuff. I did some uh, electronic music. I wrote a lot of Max MSP patches. And eventually, I wanted to combine the creative and the building things, and I ended up building a bunch of sculpture. Uh, so that's who I am. Um, this is a talk about a design problem that I had where I wanted to build this sculpture. So here we go. I drew this in CAD. I built a bunch of metal sculpture in the past, uh, but I had no idea how I was going to build it. Uh, and the reason it's hard is because it has these different parts that are overlapping in a complex way. They're not orthogonal to one another. They're smashed together. And, um, and it's just not very clear how I'm going to do it. Uh, I wanted the lines on this piece to be very clean. So I wanted, um, I wanted you to be able to go right up to it and look at it and not see any sort of messy welding or anything like that. I wanted it to be very nice and inviting. Um, I also wanted it to be strong. I wanted to be able to put it on display at a sculpture park or, um, or somewhere permanent and not worry about it collapsing and killing a child. <laughs> um, and finally, I wanted the technique to be adaptable. I didn't just want to spend all the time figuring out how I was going to build this piece. I wanted to build a whole bunch of pieces. And I didn't want the creative part to be limited by the technique. So I didn't want, uh, for instance, two pieces to not be able to go so close together or be limited on an angle or something like that. I just wanted to be able to draw stuff in CAD and know that I'd be able to build it. Ah, so um, before I talk too much about my process, I wanted to show you some sculpture that I like um, and that sort of influenced my thoughts about it. Uh, so uh, when you're a metal sculptor, the sort of two major processes that you might consider, just grand speaking, are uh, casting and fabrication. Uh, cast sculpture, uh, so this is an example on the left. Uh, it's a, by Marty Eichinger, who's a local Portland artist. Um, it's high detail, uh, usually made of bronze. Uh, but the sculptor can work in whatever material they like. They could sculpt in clay or wax. Uh, or wood, they could uh, you know, draw on the computer and 3D print it. Uh, there's all kinds of things they, they could do. And they take to do a foundry, they pay the foundry a bunch of money, and comes back, uh, comes back their sculpture. Uh, on the right is a, pi is a picture of the piece that's right outside here at PNCA. It's by Lee Kelly, who's also uh, local to Portland. Um, this is a fabricated sculpture. So, um, so to, make, to make this kind of work, you buy raw material, sheets or slabs or, or bars or whatever. Uh, you cut it up and you assemble. So you typically do a fair bit of welding. Um, you know, th these two kinds of works have a, have a, are pretty different in character to begin with. Uh, you get a lot of detail in casting, and uh, fabrication is pretty good for blocky things. So fabrication is naturally what I would have thought. But it's not necessarily, there's no reason I have to do it that way. Um, here are some examples of cast sculptures that I'm a really big fan of. Uh, on the left is a piece by Anthony Gormley that's made of cast iron. Uh, I think he might be my favorite sculptor of all time. He's really great. Uh, on the right is a piece by Joel Shapiro that's cast bronze. Uh, so like, I totally could have done this for my, my work. It would have been very expensive. And actually, it turns out that just making the mold to make the casting out of for my piece, since it's so complicated, doesn't really make a lot of sense. I would have had to do some kind of complicated CNC milling or 3D print the whole thing. Um, the piece that I'm trying to make, incidentally, is going to be about five feet tall. Uh, so 3D printing the whole thing would have been pretty challenging. Uh, as an example of some fun fabricated work, uh, on the left is a piece by Julian Voss Andre. He's also a Portland local. Uh, Julian makes these pieces by, um, he gets a model to sit for a digital scan. And then in software, he uh, uses the, uh, takes the scan and cuts it up into cross sections. Uh, and in the cross sections, he plans out little pinholes where, uh, where the pins are going to go. You can kind of see them in the piece. Uh, then uh, has all the cross sections laser cut. And one by one, puts them together with the pins until he gets the final piece. Uh, you can get a lot of detail with this technique. It's pretty cool. Um, on the right is a piece that is uh, done by an old friend of mine, Michael Walsh. Um, and this involved no digital planning whatsoever. He, uh, he builds a skeleton out of, out of tubing, where he bends and welds the tubing together into the shape he wants and then skins it with thin metal. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of different possibilities uh, uh, with fabrication. Uh, and it's a lot more accessible of a technique. Really, all it takes is a, is a welder and some, and some cutting tools. Uh, so 
<sighs> yeah. So this seemed like a pretty appropriate technique for me, but I still had some things to figure out. Um, I also want to talk about welding for just a second because you might not be familiar with it, um, but I know you're familiar with soldering. So um, I use TIG welding for all of my work, and TIG welding is actually pretty similar to soldering. Uh, the, the quantitative difference, qual qualitative difference between TIG welding and soldering is that TIG welding, uh, the base metal melts. So when you, melt, when you solder wires together, the wires don't melt. Uh, the solder is engineered to melt at lower temperature than the wires. But when you're welding, everything melts all at once. Uh, you have to be careful to not blow a hole in your piece if you melt for too long and everything and the weld falls out. Uh, when you're TIG welding, uh, the most important piece is this tungsten wire here coming out of the torch. Um, the torch is held in one hand and filler metal in the other hand, just like soldering. Uh, the tungsten wire comes out of the torch and conducts an arc to your metal plate. Um, typically, the amount of power that's moving, uh, or current, there's about 50 to 200 or more amps coming out of this thing. It can move quite a bit of power really fast. Um, you make a metal puddle, you fill it with uh, metal from the filler rod, and then you take another step. So you end up with this stepwise textured process. Um, when you're doing fabricated work, um, so this is not a sculpture, this is an engineering part, but um, you typically end up with sort of these two kinds of welds. You end up with outside corner welds on outside corners and fillet welds on inside corners. Um, when you're doing a process like this, uh, you know, you can think of it as a pretty simple sort of, sort of um, fabrication plan. You draw what you're going to make, you cut it up into parts, you weld the parts together, and then you grind the parts to make it look nice if that's what you're concerned with. For an engineering part like this, there's no reason to do any finish work like that. But for my sculpture, um, this is the one that's upstairs, maybe you saw it, uh, I want to do a lot of work to make it look nice. Uh, so on outside corner welds, like, like this one here, it's pretty easy to take a grinder to it and clean it up, make it look nice, like these here. Uh, for a fillet weld and inside corner here, it's actually much more challenging. Um, you have to kind of get in there with your grinder and carve it out. And um, uh, it's really tough to do well. It takes a lot of work, and probably you'll end up scratching up your piece and making a mess anyway. Um, so this is, this is the sort of situation that I was confronted with when I started working. Uh, so here's my initial drawing. Uh, this, is the, this is the CAD drawing that I made that I stared at for a long time and said, what am I going to do with this? Uh, so the first thought I had is, well, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just go for it. I'll, at the very least, I'll learn something. Uh, so the way I did it was I took every face that you see here, I extracted them out of the CAD, and I had them made. So it's a lot of faces. Um, uh, I got back a big pile of metal. I spent a long time sorting and counting and making sure I built the boxes correctly, and then I started putting them together. Um, it actually worked surprisingly well. Uh, I'm sorry to show you a crappy old cell phone photo, but this is the sort of digital record I get from when I'm working in the shop. Um, so the way I did this was I assembled each of the six boxes, I cleaned them up, and then I started attaching them together. Uh, I realized exactly what I was just describing to you before, this idea that making these fillet welds was going to be really challenging. So, um, so like in here, in the middle, uh, it was going to be really tough to get my welding torch in there. And if I could, it was going to be really tough to clean up the weld. So what I did for this one was I just put in little teeny tiny tack welds and sort of cleverly picked places so that I could get the whole thing to stick together. Um, so I was really excited that I got my sculpture together. Um, you know, for a prototype, for a first try, this was really great. But um, there was no way that I was ever going to be able to show something like this. Uh, it doesn't really look very good. You know, you can see the construction process on it pretty clearly, and it's really not strong at all. Um, so I started thinking about it, and I said, well, since fillet welds are hard, I'm just going to make them go away. Uh, I don't want to do them well. I just want to not do them. So how are we going to do it? If I can't work on the outside, I should work on the inside of the piece. So the way I solved the problem as a start was uh, this is a different sculpture, but it's the one I had a good picture of the process for. Yeah. Uh, the lower box uh, is a full rectangular prism, and the upper box has a cutout. So the lower box extends into the upper box. Uh, I then got some uh, scrap metal, little bits, of, little bits and pieces that I welded to the outside of the lower box and the inside of the upper box as I left a face open. And so I did a whole bunch of work installing little bits and pieces uh, in various directions, and I could get it to stick. Um, I had to plan out a face that I could leave off that I could install later on so that I could do the work on the inside and then close it up. But, um, uh, but this way, I was actually able to get my pieces together, and it worked okay. Um, so here's a bunch of sculptures that I built. 
Um, first one is called uh, Six of One. This is the initial one that I drew. Uh, also, uh, this one is called Retroflex and Node of Thistle. Um, I got a lot of work done this way. I showed a bunch of sculptures. It was pretty great, but it still wasn't strong enough. I was still worried about killing children. Um, uh, every time I installed one, I was real nervous, um, but, but it worked pretty well. Uh, also, the assembly process, uh, since I was sort of figuring it out on the fly where I was going to put the little pieces of scrap, uh, it, was, it was just a mess. I was never sure if I was going to be able to do a good job of it. Um, so I knew that I had to have a, a plan where it was, it was really planned out. I knew that it was going to go the right way because I planned it to go the right way. Um, so here is my design problem that I had to figure out. Uh, I wanted the sculptures to be strong and stiff, uh, as strong as if they were welded up all around, except for I didn't want those welds to show and be there. Um, I wanted the lines to be clean, which meant that even if I, wasn't, uh, if, even if I didn't have the welds on the outside, uh, I wanted to have them or I wouldn't be able to have them on the inside either. If I just welded up those seams on the inside, the outside would be destroyed from the heat damage anyway. Um, I wanted there to not be any polishing required on the sculpture after the pieces are put together permanently, because if that was required, inevitably there'd be some arrangement of things that I came up with where I wouldn't be able to get the polishing tools in after the fact, and it just wouldn't look good. Uh, and finally, I wanted the joint alignment to be perfect. Since these things are sitting in these weird non-orthogonal configurations, it's really hard to get the alignment perfect, and um, it's really important to me that I do it right. Uh, any technique that I used that involved um, joining the pieces with uh, welding was likely to not be able to produce perfect joint alignment because what would happen would be I would get it right, I would do the welding, and everything, uh, the heat distortion from the welding would cause stuff to move and bend the joint out of place. So I knew I had to figure out some technique that I could use to join the pieces uh, that didn't get them hot. Uh, it turns out that there's a pretty good technique for joining things together without heat uh, that is pretty well known. Uh, it's called bolts. Uh, so all I had to do was figure out how to bolt my things together, which is a little complicated anyway. But once I had that inspiration of like put down the welder, I know it's the thing that I use for all of my sculpture processes. But let's use something else. Uh, uh, that was a, that was it was you know easy from there. Uh, a side benefit of using bolts for this process is that after I join the pieces together, after I make that permanent uh, configuration and get it all set, I actually can take it back apart, which lets me do all the finish uh, cleanup um, on the pieces separately from one another so I can get everything looking perfect, and then I just put it back together and have my sculpture. Um, there's always going to be faces that I have to leave off and uh, do welding on those at the end, but I can, I can plan it out so I know that those are going to be sort of easy ones to work on. Um, so here's how I here's how I did it. Um, this is sort of analogous to what I showed before with the bits of scrap metal. Uh, this piece is the complete rectangular prism. This piece has the cutout. But now inside of the cutout, I have another piece that I've carefully worked out in CAD. So it perfectly sits inside of the cutout hole, and it perfectly sits flush on the other box. Um, and I plan out bolt holes that are going to line up. Um, so now that I have this all worked out, it's pretty easy to go and build it and have it come out right. Um, the way the process goes, so you can see it. Uh, first step, uh, I take the pieces that are going to be for this box, and I weld nuts uh, on the inside faces of them. Uh, and I have some tricks to get the bolts perfectly, or the nuts perfectly lined up inside of the, uh, and with perfectly lined up with the holes. Uh, then I take those three pieces and I weld them together into the box. So that's that's this here. You can come and look at uh, afterwards if you like. So there's nuts on the inside. Um, then it's a little tough to see the difference here, but um, here I'm assembling this um, inside piece uh, onto the closed piece. Uh, this, uh, this ensures that the bolt holes on the inside piece and the closed piece are going to line up in reality and not just in CAD. Uh, so I take the three pieces, I bolt them to the, to the box. When they're all uh, bolted down nice and tight, then I put in these welds. Uh, then I take all the bolts off, and I take that piece off. Uh, next step, I make the other piece. Um, so now we have this big cutout hole that the first piece fits perfectly into. And the way I install the inside piece into the hole uh, is with everything in place. So in the background here, this piece is the piece with the internal nuts. In the foreground, this piece is the piece that's going to have the inside piece welded to it. And here is the inside piece bolted to the open piece. So I'll put that together later. 
Uh, but the inside piece holds the open piece onto the closed piece in exactly the right configuration. Once I, once I hold it in place, uh, it's, it's aligned just right, and then I can just go and put in some welds in this seam here. Uh, it doesn't take a ton. It takes two or three sizable tack welds on each, um, on each line, and, uh, and it's held as strong as you could ever hope for. So here they are sitting next to each other, so I've turned my CAD into reality, which is always a satisfying situation. Uh, I've taken all the bolts out, and now the pieces are sitting next to each other. So all I have to do now is all of my finish work. I can take, I can go weld up all of these seams, polish them, grind them, do everything, uh, clean up the heat distortion on the outside uh, so that you don't see those marks anymore, uh, make everything look perfect, and then I put them together and close up the outside. Uh, so here's a few sculptures I've made with this technique. You can see that I'm able to do really far out cantilevered things. Um, you know, sculptures where it looks like pieces are kind of floating because they're just sitting on a joint that you can't even see. Uh, big stuff, this piece is about eight feet tall. Um, so it's, it's worked for me really well. It's, it's pretty exciting getting it all worked out. Uh, so just quickly, my sort of design ahas in the, in the process of the sculptures. Um, since I can't weld and grind every single fillet to make them all look nice, I wanted to just make them go away. Uh, don't do fillets, do something else that'll work better. Since I can't work on the outside, well, don't, don't try to do a nice job of work on the outside. Just put the work on the inside. Maybe I have to figure out how I'm going to do that, but I can figure that out. Um, since my ad hoc assembly process is a mess, I shouldn't have an ad hoc assembly process. I should have an assembly process that I plan out from the start. Uh, and finally, um, since welding is going to mess up things in a way that I can't fix, don't use it. Um, so in general, as I've solved design problems, uh, as I've been working on sculpture, I've found over and over and over again that when I have a really hard problem that I can't solve, the answer is make the problem go away, take a step back in design and do something different. Uh, so, so for some final thoughts, um, my sculptures uh, did all the things I was hoping for. They're complex, uh, clean lines, and strong. Um, this process also is adaptable to less uh, orthogonal elements. I don't have to use these rectangular prisms. I could make uh, octagons or crazy, funny, poly surface things. Um, they could, uh, all, uh, uh, all they have to do is overlap a bit, and I can use this technique to join them. Uh, even if they're round, it would be sort of a big challenge, but uh, I'm, I can still pretty much adapt it. Uh, it's also adaptable to different materials. Since the, um, since the different elements aren't welded directly together, uh, they don't have to be made of the same metal. Uh, so I got a commission for a piece that involves stainless steel and copper. Um, and it was a bit of a trick figuring out how to weld copper and adapt it exactly right, but I was able to do it um, because this technique is pretty adaptable. Uh, finally, uh, this is a really labor-intensive process, and it's pretty exhausting, um, especially working in the... This piece I built this January, and it was very, very cold, and it was months of hard work in the, in the cold Portland winter. But anyway, uh, I was pretty excited that I, I got all this to work. So uh, that's what I got to say today. Um, if you're interested, uh, I have some, I have the two demo pieces that I built, if you want to come and see, and um, the, one of my sculptures is upstairs on the second floor, uh, if you want to go check it out. Uh, are there any questions? Um, uh, yeah, so um, let's see. So the, maybe I will put this back on. Um, uh, the way I make sure everything fits exactly is that I make sure it, everything fits exactly uh, in the CAD. So there's no, there's no approximations there. Um, uh, oh, right. This is what I get for doing Google Slides. Um, yeah, I guess that's what I mean by tolerance, like the difference between CAD right. and reality. So one thing that was a, a the the thing that I had the most problem with tolerance actually was um, uh, with the bolt holes. Mm -hmm. uh, other things, basically because I plan it out in the CAD using the metal thickness that it's going to be, uh, things work how they're supposed to. And the metal, it comes out, it, like when I buy metal, it's exactly the thickness they tell me it's going to be. Um, uh, one difficult thing was, uh, since these bolt holes are essential to the process, um, 
and they're not, right, I, I make those, I need them to come out just right. Um, my first few iterations of this, I had a friend that had a uh, plasma cutting table, and so I was doing this with plasma cutting. Uh, plasma cutting stainless steel works, but it doesn't work super great. Um, the edges were a little wobbly and there was dross. I had to do a fair bit of cleanup after to get the parts to be how they are in reality. Um, and so it was particularly important for the bolt holes. Uh, I, would, I would have to go grind off both sides, drill them out, and re-grind. Re anyway. Uh, it was a lot of work to get the holes really clean, and that was, um, if I didn't do that work, um, so the, the trick that I do to align the, um, the, bolt, uh, the nuts onto the holes is that I tighten the nuts down using a flat head screw on the other side, so the flat head screw centers the nut on the hole, and then I weld it down and I take the screw out. Um, but if there's crap in the hole, the screw never comes out. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I had that happen to me like one out of every three or four holes um, before I got really rigorous about getting the holes clean and, and perfect. Uh, now I use um, laser cutting, uh, which actually uh, laser cut steel is a pretty cost effective process. Um, these, these are 12 gauge, 105 thousandths steel. And um, uh, for me, the budget to get a whole sculpture cut, um, which is about half of a sheet, it's like $400 for the steel and the cutting. So it's, it's only about $50 to $100 for cutting. Um, it really, it's, it's, uh, it's totally a reasonable process to do. I initially avoided it because I thought it was gonna be prohibitively expensive. Uh, and laser cutting is amazing and there's no dross and I don't have to worry about the bolt holes at all. Uh, they just come out good. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so the way I deal with tolerances is I plan things out, uh, taking everything into account and um, uh, Mostly metal is what you expect it to be. Um, I guess there are other places where, for instance, like um, uh, if I put a weld here, if I put a weld in the area where the two pieces go together, I have to be really careful to grind it back so it's not going to get in the way. Um, uh, so I, I just try to make sure that any work that I do after I get the cutting back doesn't mess up the process. Uh, anything else? Uh, oh, with pulse TIG welding. Um, so let's see. Uh, welding is uh, a skill that is different from other sort of crafty skills that I've learned. Um, like if, if I were gonna give somebody advice on how to learn woodworking, I'd say go build a dining table. But that's not the case for welding because it's really a skill that takes practice, um, uh, like a lot of it. Uh, so. Um, uh, if, you, uh, if you want to learn to weld um, and you have access to somewhere where you can go regularly, um, don't plan out a practice project, plan out, plan out a practice piece that you can do over and over and over and over again, and that you don't care about getting this one really nice so that you can go off and finish your table. You just want to like fill up, uh, fill up lines with weld over and over and over again until you get good at it. Um, Unfortunately, the best resource in Portland for that would, was ADX, but they stopped doing public classes. I was teaching TIG welding there until they, until they stopped. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, if you're interested in welding and you have a garage or someplace that you can do it yourself, uh, go get a cheap welder from Harbor Freight and just practice over and over and over again. Um, my welder has, um, has a Pulse DC mode that goes up to, um, goes up to 50 hertz. Um, uh, frustratingly, if you want it to go faster than that, you have to pay them for a SD card that you plug in and it enables the higher frequencies. <laughs> it's really criminal. Um, uh, so in my experience on stainless steel, I kind of like the pulsed. It does a better job of triggering my helmet to, to go dark, but it actually doesn't really matter too much. Um, I found with welding copper that using the pulsed mode didn't work as well. I, I had better results melting copper uh, without the pulse mode turned on. Um, copper was really challenging to weld because you have to preheat it. Um, it's such an effective conductor of heat that you basically have to get the whole piece really hot in order to melt anything. Um, so for, for whatever, whatever complex reason, um, copper, it didn't work very well. Uh, I've done a little bit of um, reading some literature on pulse DC and the literature says it's useful at higher frequencies than I had access to, like 200, 250 hertz. I haven't really played with that. Um, but for, for this kind of welding, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yep. So when you put the bolts together, and bolts are not to be put in lock tight or anything to keep it from galling, or so they won't torque you? Uh, so what I do is that, um, so like I said, there's an, a set of steps in my process where I put the piece up, uh, together and take it apart and put it together again. Uh, and what I typically do is when I put it together and it's the last time and I'm done, I go weld the heads of the nuts or, or the, weld the heads of the bolts down to the to the piece so they just never come out again. Um, uh, I've had mechanical engineer friends of mine tell me that if I tighten the bolts down really hard, they really should never come out again. But I just don't want to sweat it. Um, so yeah, I weld them down. It's pretty easy, uh, and it's always like a sort of a big moment for me because. Uh, it's the one process in this whole thing that's really challenging to undo. Um, you know, most thing, most of the things here, like I could take those pieces and cut them apart in 10 minutes and like do whatever I needed to do if I realized I made a mistake. But when I weld those heads down, it would be really, really hard to go in there with a grinder and cut those walls and get them back out. So when you back weld the piece in, Um, uh, there's a little bit of, um, so you can, if you want to come up and look, you can see, um, there's a bit of, well, I did an okay job. If I, if I don't do a very good job of these welds, which is the thing that happens, I, I buckle the surface out here a bit. Um, so like this one, I was a lot slower than this one, for instance, you can see it has a much bigger heat mark. Um, and if I'm really slow, it makes these big bumps. Yeah, this one has a little bump. Uh, I go uh, after, you know, in my whole cleaning process, uh, I'll polish these spots off. And in the places where I was slow, you can still see the bulges afterwards because it's just hard to get rid of them. And if I were to hit it with the grinder, I would never get those grinder scratches out. So it's, I just leave the bulges because it's the, sort of the best, best option. Um, but yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't deform anything so that these holes aren't going to line up anymore. Um, one problem I had actually was that, um, I've had to get a little bit more careful um, welding the nuts down. So this actually can cause some heat, heat deformation. Uh, like if when I do these eight little welds to put the nuts in, um, this whole thing is going to bulge a little bit if, if I'm not careful about it. And then that can, um, since this is going inside of that, that bulge can keep the line from being quite perfect. Um, so um, I've just had to get more careful about it. I'll like do one nut, and then I'll go to this other piece, and I'll do one here, and I'll, I'll just switch off so the piece has a chance to cool, so it doesn't build up too much heat. Uh, anything else? Okay. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Appreciate it.
Okay. Um, you all have USB devices. You're about to become very scared of them, I think. Um, really happy to have Kate and Michaela. Uh, they work with uh, Great Scott Gadgets. Um, they're going to tell us a whole bunch of stuff about uh, USB. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks. Take it away. I think this is on. All right, good to be able to have a microphone. This is amazing. So, welcome, uh, Kate Temkin. This is Michaela Zakelli. I'll give you bio slides in a second because I know everyone loves those. But this talk is on making USB accessible. I am almost definitely going during this talk going to walk away from this microphone. So, it is wireless, but that'll probably work better. But if I start pacing too much and it starts being super distracting, just yell at me. Same thing if I talk too fast. So this is, the proper title is Making USB Accessible. I like to make slide titles that I cannot fit on the title slide, so this is the short version, but you are in the right place. We are gonna be talking about USB tools, and though there is, are some scary stuff about USB, especially in USB 3 and 4, the uh, USB 4 being forthcoming and looking a lot like PCI is kind of scary to me. The, kind of goal of this talk is to demonstrate that USB is, with the right tooling, a pretty accessible thing. So really, the lack of tools are the thing that's kind of creating that gap between accessible USB things and uh, accessible USB access and where we are right now. And hopefully, we'll be showing you how we started filling the gap. So I'm Kate Temkin. I lead the software division of Great Scott Gadgets. My business card says Hardware Hacker, which is probably a better description, considering though I am the software lead, I will see build hardware as much as I do software. Um, I mostly focus on educational reverse engineering stuff, so I love education and less fa have a less favorable opinion of a lot of the stuff related to information security. <laughs> so I, I much prefer building things to breaking things, though I've done a fair amount of both. And then I'm Michaela Zakelli, uh, handle Kyriad. And I'm a student, which means obviously I know everything. And especially after meeting this one, I managed to dive into open source USB stuff and got really deep into it. Yeah, and there's, there's no coming out now. No, but. definitely not. So um, one thing that is a, a kind of a fundamental difference between us is I am apparently a cyber criminal, according to the Daily Mail. Michaela is not. We both worked on the same thing. She actually manages uh, and maintains some tools for an exploit I wrote for the Nintendo Switch. But apparently, I'm the cyber criminal. I this wasn't caught. Is, yeah, apparently, Michaela is better at cyber crime. So here I am, cyber criminal. I love this slide. Um, especially as, and I, I keep using this slide over and over again because this is like the best press I've ever received. By short circuiting a wire, apparently I can reach the most basic command level of the Nintendo Switch. And then I can run whatever software I wish. So if you have licensed software, sorry, it's mine now. <laughs> the, so I'm going to start this with a story. Um, and hopefully the story will go and kind of continue into USB and I won't ramble distractedly. But the, so this started with a USB training. Uh, I actually maintain a few open source USB tools, including Face Dancer, which was uh, it's a library for emulating USB devices. And there was originally a, a training that's kind of, I think the name with Face Dancer is growing more and more stale. But this was a training where we taught students the basics of USB. And I've offered this with Michaela, I've offered this uh, kind of before that point. And this is a really neat course where we kind of cover USB from the ground up and get to the point where you're hacking on USB devices, both figuring out how to reverse engineer them, figure out how to use them for, um, for things other than their intended purposes, kind of the true hardware hacker model of how do I get into this and how do I make it do something that's cool and neat and not its original purpose. And so one of the things that was necessary for this tool, one of the things I wanted students to be able to do when they started off the classes, I wanted them to be able to pick up the 
you know, their USB boards, their target boards, and get a set of packets out of this thing just kind of off the bat. So I wanted them to be able to do USB analysis. That normally would require a piece of hardware, which we really don't have the budget for in a training kind of environment. Students are paying for their own tickets. If I include USB analyzers in those tickets, or use of USB analyzers, the ticket price is going to go way up. So what we have been doing is using uh, USB Mon, which is a Linux kernel module that gives you an insight into the Linux USB stack. USB Mon is kind of, it's a nice thing in that you get to see Linux's view of USB, but you get it in a very Linux-centric format. Pretty much you get it in the format that Linux, that you, Linux likes to request data from that Linux likes to, Linux's view of how USB works. And that is very, it's not, it's not super, it's not super, uh, straightforward, it's not straightforward. It's because the kernel has its own model of how to interface with USB. That doesn't mean that that is a model of USB itself. In the USB repair. New group myself. This is the fun thing about live demos. Also, keep in mind you're not presenting as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm new gripping myself here. Okay. Multiple monitors going on, but Wireshark. All right, so if we run Wireshark, what we see is a interface that looks like, I think, Open Office is going to need me to close the slides for a second. I've started using LibreOffice, which is kind of its own terrifying challenge. And so if you look at Wireshark, what you get here is a collection of devices that are kind of intended to be, uh, to give you a USB analysis, that are going to give you uh, IP analysis, not USB analysis. And so if you open Wireshark and you tell it to look at USB packets, what you actually see is a bunch of kernel data structures. You'll see collapsed immediately something that says herb, and that's it. Herb is a USB request block. It's the Linux kernel's view of USB. You'll start seeing things like status equals negative E in progress, or status equals negative E no dev, or status equals negative pipe. Those have absolutely no mapping to USB. So USB mon is a great thing because it's free. But the tools that parse USB Mon data kind of suck. And so given the cost requirements, I've handed this to students you know, numerous times. And I think it's pretty fair to say that they've been kind of baffled by the way Wireshark outputs this data, baffled by using the tool. It's not super straightforward. If you scroll down there, there's a USB Mon device. There's several USB Mon devices that correspond to the USB buses on your computer and one that coalesces all of them. And just, there's absolutely nothing that tells you what any of this stuff means in a USB level. You can see some of the data that's carried by USB, but the, there's not a one-to-one -one mapping between Wireshark and USB packets. So that's definitely a challenge in using this stuff. USB Mon as is gives you, a again, a kernel-centric view of, of USB. And then you feed that through Wireshark, which is which was made for like TCP analysis. So you're kind of fitting the kernel's view of USB into a sort of TCP model, and you end up with weird things like that. So we have a tool that gives us USB analysis, but it just doesn't go far enough. It doesn't actually give us a view of what's going on in USB terms. And it is filtered to the kernel, so if something goes wrong, the device doesn't show itself to Linux. If Linux doesn't actually get packets out to that, there's nothing that's going to say, hey, this really early problem happened here. Some of those packets that are done in the early enumeration stages, in the early device discovery stages, are consumed by Linux, and it doesn't forward them to you. So if we want a much truer to reality view, we can start using devices like this super cheap uh, SIGROC-based logic and analyzers. And so these are generally inexpensive if you order them uh, from across the world. And Things like AliExpress, you can find these things for three or four bucks. If you want them off, off Amazon, they're, they're like $7 Prime, $6.99 Prime. I love the one-star review on these things. It's by, <laughs> these it's, are very cheap devices, and I think people have 
both the wrong expectations of them and a misunderstanding of what logic analyzers are on Amazon? Not just a single, like, not just one star, isn't that like a single? Yeah, it's a, a one single, single one star, star review. review. So these things are really freaking cheap and they can capture up to 24 megahertz, which is enough to analyze low speed and full speed USB. This does not exist for high speed USB. So if I wanna use this to, with my training course, I have to arbitrarily limit my high speed device to full speed in order to kind of see those packets. And I don't think that's a great experience for students either. So SIGROC will do low speed, full speed analysis up to the point where it's breaking things down into requests, but it doesn't really tell you what this request means. In this case, this is 08, 06, and if you actually look at that setup, the packet, the data stage of this setup packet, you can go, and if you're really familiar with USB, you can recognize this as, oh, it's asking for the device descriptor. SIGROC doesn't tell you that. So SIGROC is great, libsigroc decode is great, it's awesome at getting USB packets out of the, your tr traces and captures, but it doesn't go far enough. And you can't expect people to just look at some hex from a USB packet and know what it is unless you're a USB wizard. Yeah, like me at dinner the other night at Autodesk, I was sitting there like someone was reading me USB hex. I was going, like, yeah. Yeah, you just decoded the matrix of USB on the fly. <laughs> it is kind of like this matrix where the guy is saying, like, I, I don't even see the, the numbers anymore. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so the state of the art in these things, if you want something that gives you good high-speed analysis, if you want something that's gonna give you a breakdown of packets into their component pieces and kind of give you the full protocol, you are talking about something that is $1,100 in singles. Uh, this is the cheapest one that has that kind of software capability right now that is usable, really. The, there is a low-speed and full-speed version that is only $300, which compared to the $3 board is kind of a hard price tag to swallow. But, the, but this thing is really nice to use in a lot of ways if you're doing USB stuff. It's just also really inaccessible. You're yeah, you're paying for the software on this thing. I'm bit of the hardware, but there's, there's a lot of kind of leading to this conclusion where people kind of say, isn't USB this really complicated protocol? Don't I take, not want to take my microcontroller and implement USB? And USB really isn't that complicated, especially for things that are just, hey, I want to get a little bit of data over the bus. But if you can't see it, it might as well be magic, right? So if you're just setting your microcontroller up, something's not going right, Windows is saying, hey, this isn't a valid USB device, or Linux is uh, spamming device won't accept address zero, or device won't accept address one repeatedly in dmessage, you're going to think that USB is kind of black magic. So the fact that tools aren't accessible makes people think that USB is this kind of mystical, crazy black magic. For low speed and full speed, it is absolutely not black magic. Once you get up to the uh, kind of super speed level, it gets a little bit more complicated. And theoretically, USB 4 is going to be sending PCIe frames over it. So yeah, USB 4 might be black magic. That's a hell of an abstraction we'll, stack. We'll, we'll stick to USB 2 mostly for now. They haven't released the spec in its final form, and they've only really talked about what's in it. So yeah. our conjecture about USB 4 is that it may be black magic. <laughs> so USB is inaccessible to the point where people don't really want to test their USB devices. This is. And this is the, an output of some data captured from the NVIDIA bootloader that's present in every NVIDIA Tegra device, every one of their embedded devices, uh, up until the Tegra X1, which is the processor both in a bunch of the Tesla uh, control centers and the little kind of infotainment system that both controls some of the car functions and displays a bunch of things, and in the Nintendo Switch. And the Shield TV. And the Shield TV, and I think a bunch of things like that. This is the most Famous example here, I think that people are aware of, is the Nintendo Switch. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of, I've joked around that if you want something red teamed, hiring a red team is not a good, as good an option as just putting it in a game console. <laughs> but this, uh, this device has a pretty severe USB vulnerability that allows you to completely compromise its root of trust. Um, it's a really simple vulnerability, especially as if you look at the get status request here. This request that has the vulnerability is request number zero. 
So if you're iterating through all of the different requests and trying to see what is actually vulnerable on these devices, well, you start at zero and you end at zero. So this is actually just a packet that's saying, hey, give me, normally it'd say, give me two bytes of status. And I said, give me a whole bunch of bytes of status. Give me something like 65,000 bytes of status. And what I get back is an obligingly large amount of status data. 65,000 bytes of status. <laughs> that data itself happens to be copied into a tiny DMA buffer that is only 4096 bytes large. So copying 65,000 bytes into a 4096 byte buffer, not super fun, not for the device anyway. I was not the first person to want an open source USB analyzer, uh, not by far. There was actually a fairly major Kickstarter that uh, was funded back in 2010 by Bushing, who is the uh, a fell overflow fame, was a fell overflow fame, uh, and Bushing created uh, a device called Open Vista. Open Vista, I think, was is well known as being one of the longest Kickstarters to actually longest uh, Kickstarter production time to actually deliver, because I think they didn't get the boards out until 2014, after a long point of which people kind of assumed this project wasn't happening. The Open Vista board is relatively simple hardware. If you have one of these, like I do, sitting on this table here then you can do some really basic USB analysis on a device that is, it was $250 when the Kickstarter started. Now it's about 120 euros, which is just under 150 bucks USD uh, plus shipping. For a while, you could not buy these anymore, but stock has been found. They are available again. They are pretty good uh, USB analyzers if you're willing to deal with the software. Want to take this away, set this up. So the Open Vista in particular is also, as well as the Total Phase Beagle, is also high speed, which, again, like is at a, just under one hundred fifty dollars, is considerably more accessible than a thousand per piece. But again, the software for Open Vista was a bit lacking. So here, I'm gonna kill. Once I figure out what my mouse is, your mouse is in the terminal. You gotta kill yeah. Wireshark. Doing a narrative, what I'm doing. I'm putting the microphone yeah. down. So, what we have is a tool that Kate used to. Kate kind of rewrote most of Open Vista's software stack. Uh, yeah, we'll get to that. This is actually okay. the original Open Vista. Oh, is so. it? Okay. This, this is, is. So this is what you get. Well, this is the startup. Right, so right now uh, Open Vista is saying there's no USB device plugged in. I'm going to plug in a USB device. I had another one on my desk, but at the last minute I decided to plug in a great fat because I figured I should use my own products and demonstrations. It would help to analyze the USB device instead of just air. All right, so this is a set of, this is it interpreting USB packets. This is not incredibly useful. I'm going to restart the software and hopefully we can see kind of the this thing not repeatedly requesting data. Any year now, my terminal will stop outputting the data from the thing I canceled. If it actually wants to. That is not the right old tab. Did that die yet? Oh my god, no. Nope. Okay, just kill it. That way. So ooh, that's fun. So Open Vista gives you a really, really, really difficult to interpret USB packet level view. It actually kind of ends up giving you a very similar view to what you get with Sigrox Pulse View. You get the packet ID and you get some hex. Yep. So again, it can do full. It can do high speed. So we've improved from from using a logic analyzer. And I don't know if you'd call the user experience right now uh, super desirable. This is the out of the box experience with Open Vista. And so Open Vista has a really, really, really well defined hardware layout, but hardware layout, hardware design, um, it has boards that are very well tested, but what it lacks is an actual kind of uh, environment for doing USB analysis in any meaningful way. So if I take a great fat device here, 
And let me just plug it into my computer and we'll see the kind of enumeration of this device from Open Vista's perspective. All right, so yeah, what we see we here go. is actually the device enumerating itself. And if you are really familiar with USB, you can take a look at all of this output and say, okay, I have basically the same thing we saw from SIGROC, uh, but for a high-speed device. This is the host actually requesting the device descriptor. This whole piece here is a control transfer. It's one simple verb asking the USB device to describe itself. But unless you happen to speak raw USB in hex, and you can go and say, okay, well, 80 is actually an endpoint zero standard device request. It is going, it's asking the device for information, and the next byte is six, so it's a get descriptor request, and the next byte is one, so it is a get device descriptor request. Unless you know all that stuff at the top of your head, this is not super useful to you. You need something to parse and process this. And OpenVisla also, the software will not will not group anything. A lot of a lot of USB packets are logically grouped together, and then those are logically grouped together. And the OpenVisla software will just show you them by themselves. So OpenVisla exists. It's still kind of on the expensive side of what I want. I would love something I could hand out in trainings. So. There's kind of a commonality between the things that exist. They're expensive, especially if you're kind of looking for something you can hand out in trainings. And they are, the software stacks that drive them are very, very, very difficult to interpret, to use, to work with. So USB, kind of the, one of the driving problems there is that USB is very, very, very fast at high speed. The data signaling happens at 480 megabits per second which means that toggling on USB happens at up to 480 megabits per second, and the voltage is relatively low. So that's how they get the signaling as high a speed as they do, is by pulling the overall voltage swing very, very low. We have a lot of difficulty sampling that on even high-end logic analyzers. If you take a Salier, Salier's 500 megahertz analyzer cannot sample USB high speed, because even though theoretically 480 megahertz is less than 500 megahertz, the sampling is not synchronous to the device. It's not synchronized to the device's clock, which means you need to sample a bunch of times in order to figure out where the clock edge is and see that USB data. Ideally twice as fast. Ideally twice, more than twice as fast, ideally yeah. like ten, five or 10 times as fast over sampling. Nyquist says theoretically you can do it at uh, twice as fast and see the frequency signal there, see the toggling, but it's really difficult to do clock recovery on things that are that slow. So if you are a digital device and you want to capture USB high-speed data, you need to be at like five to 10 times the speed of 480 megabits per second in order to be able to figure out when the USB signal is toggling, in order to be able to figure out how to, when you should sample that USB signal. And high-end logic analyzers, even high-end log logic analyzers, that's going to be a, a bit difficult to. Yeah, so you, you have a hard time finding logic analyzers above like 500 megahertz in common uh, use, even <laughs> you know, multi-gigahertz scopes have difficulty with this. So what we have here is a device called the USB Phi. It's the physical layer for USB. This device is the key to cheap USB analysis because what it does is take all of that nice USB data that coming in at 480 megabits per second, sample it, do clock recovery, and spit it out as eight bits of parallel data at 60 megahertz, right? 480 divided by eight makes sense to get 60 out of there. And what that means is that you've taken something that was well outside the range of what's sampleable by a cheap device and you've pulled it into that kind of range. And this is actually one of the operating things behind the open Visla design is they take a USB Phi, use it to decode uh, or to deserialize the USB data signals and then squirt them into an FPGA, which does all the processing. So essentially, the Phi is our kind of magic bullet for this because it handles all of that uh, clock recovery, it handles all the deserialization, and it puts everything in a domain that we can be synchronous to. So we can easily sample this on, uh, on a lot of different pieces of consumer hardware. One of my favorite things to use on this, one of my favorite microcontrollers is the LP34330. The LP34330 is amazing in that it has a synchronous, really configurable serial engine called SGPIO or Serial GPIO that you can use to construct 
all kinds of different uh, serial peripherals. So this thing is capable of sampling 16 pins at up to 204 megahertz, putting that in device memory without requiring any CPU time. The LPC4330 has on board uh, either two or three microcontroller cores as a Cortex M4 and one or two M0s. This thing can do all of that data capture without using any of those cores, which means that any post-processing you want, you can do with this device. Also has a really, really, really neat feature where it can do all of this uh, sampling, not just based off an arbitrary clock, but you can add conditions to it. You can add shift qualifiers, so you can have it only shift in data when the data is indicated as valid by another device, like your phi. You can also do pattern matching on the data that you shift in, so it doesn't bother storing things unless they meet a certain mask pattern. So this is a really, really, really powerful serial engine, and it's really fun to write the drivers for this thing, but like several weeks to get a fully general driver working. But being um, able to pattern match against this lets you, like we already have enough, enough speed for high speed, but even aside from that, you can pattern match against things that we don't care about, like USB start of frame packets or start of frame fields. Right, so given that you're capturing data to a microcontroller now, you need to be very, very, very frugal about what you are capturing and omit any unnecessary data. Even if you add a big SDRAM uh, chip to that microcontroller, you need to actually make sure that you are not capturing excess data because at some point you're going to need to take all of that data that's on the SDRAM and forward it up to the host, right? And that means that you are going to need to saturate a USB bus and if you're going for inexpensive, you're still talking high speed and not super speed, which means any more data than is necessary is going to be a real headache for you. I, uh, full disclosure, the company that I uh, work for, the company that pays me, manufactures this board. This is one LPC4330 board. I feel okay talking about it because it is open hardware. So it's fully open source, which means you can build them yourselves. You can go and buy these boards pre-made from various people, but if you have a few hours and a soldering iron and you're comfortable soldering TQFPs, and uh, 0603 service mount parts. You can put one of these together using you know, just the parts you buy off DigiKey and the board you buy off Oshpark. So by all means, build these yourself. They have, this, this board kind of acts like a prototyping crucible for doing things like capturing data from a ULPI fi It has a USB stack that has been written by a bunch of people I've s since done a little bit of rewriting on it to reduce the amount of CPU that it uses, but um, it has a super fast USB stack, which we can, which can basically saturate USB buses, which is rare to see on a microcontroller. So this is a high-speed USB port here that is capable of actually, on the regular, outputting 40 megabits per second, 40 uh, megabytes per second, to a USB high-speed host, and it can saturate the bus. So depending on your individual host you can start pushing up to like 50 megabit, megabytes per second. I keep saying megabit. The, so this is a very, very, very fast USB peripheral. And this thing has some very generic SGPIO drivers that are super easy to configure that let you just take sets of parallel data, write some little structures to say, OK, I want to use these pins. These are the conditions under which I want to shift. And that data will just be streamed right up to your host without you doing really much at all provide a little structure that describes it, and you say, start USB streaming, and the device does it. So this is kind of a cool multi-tool for hardware hacking, I like to think of. the Really, the LPC4330 is an amazing microcontroller for this stuff, both because of that streaming serial engine and because it has two USB ports on it, one high speed and one full speed. If you buy the version that comes in a BGA package instead of the version that comes in TQFP, it has two high speed USB uh, interfaces. One of them has a physical PHY built into the chip. The other has a ULPI output, so you can hook it up to something like this PHY, and it'll handle all the USB stuff for you. So I love this thing for doing fast USB ha USB style hacking. Uh, it is a face dancer board, which means that you can emulate other USB devices with it. It has a support for something called USB proxy, which is a, another tool uh, that I maintain. So this is kind of an awesome board for 
this kind of stuff. And really, that's because this chip is an awesome chip. That kind of brings me to what's called grape fat rhododendron. Every one of the grape fat devices is codenamed after a flower going in alphabetical order. We have since run out of alphabetical letters, so uh, I think we're looping back around to A. Uh, but grape fat one was codenamed azalea. This board here is codenamed rhododendron. And rhododendron is essentially just a USB Phi, two USB ports connected to pass through USB, some support hardware, sitting on top of a great fat neighbor, neighbors being the boards that plug into this header. This is a prototype that's designed to answer the question of how much USB can we capture using just a ULPI Phi and no SDRAM. So the great fat itself has only about 300K of flash, but it can get data out very, very, very quickly. And so the question kind of becomes, well, what, what kind of USB traffic can you capture just using that? Is it enough to hand this 10 cent uh, to you know, dollar five, depending on your quantity, on a board to students and have them be able to analyze most high-speed devices? And the answer, amazingly, is that this can actually do more high-speed stuff than you'd expect. This is good for anything that doesn't have sustained little bursts of packet activity. So if you're just doing enumeration stuff, that's pretty easy. That's just saying, OK, who are you? What do you do? That's sending little tiny exchanges of data. That we can do super easily. Surprisingly, things like flash drives that are bulk devices that you think of as fast devices when you think of USB, we can capture those too, because usually the, those high-speed flash drives are limited by the controller on the flash memory. They tend to peak at about 30 megabytes per second, which is well within what we can actually get off kind of live streaming from the device. So it turns out you can do a lot of USB capture using just a ULPI Phi and no RAM buffering. Especially since it's, it's considerably unlikely that you'll have to anal analyze a device that will consistently saturate the bus. It's honestly more likely that your, your host, your computer, will not have a host controller that's fast enough to sample this, rather than the great fat being the limiting factor? Yeah, so, but then again, you have kind of the difficulty where it's interesting to see how the interplay of various devices works with that, because if you plug rhododendron in with another device on the same host, yeah. if you're analyzing that device, who knows how that's affecting things, because it slows down both the rhododendron's ability to capture things and the device itself they're competing for bandwidth now doesn't really change things that much. If you plug in another device that's not the device you want to analyze, often that will actually wind up interspersing its packets with the first device. So analyzing two flash drives and analyzing one of two flash drives that are plugged in can be easier than analyzing one because they have to share the bus and suddenly you have half the bandwidth to report up to the host. Is that a technique that you could use? You know, even if you do come across a device that saturates the bus, just plug in a flash drive and you start a file clear. transfer? If, if you have that kind of thing, theoretically, <laughs> yes. So. The recipe for a high-speed analyzer here is really just a microcontroller that has the ability to send data to a host fast. Theoretically, a lot of, uh, I think, Cypress chips have a similar thing. The FX2's FIFO isn't good enough for this, but the FX3, which is a super speed chip, has something that's very akin to SGPIO and a really fast pipe to your host. They also tend to be expensive chips. Uh, FTDI has a FIFO chip that is almost good enough. It can't do enough to capture ULPI data by itself. So you need something to help it translate it, like a tiny ICE-40 FPGA or something like that. But you could do an ICE-40 FPGA and a FIFO chip. Some, and there are plenty of boards that do that already. I'm looking directly at Piot. The this icebreaker board does a similar thing. But you put some kind of digital processing on here. I like the LPC-4330 because it's all in one, kind of it's an all in one solution for that. You want to put probably an SDRAM for packet buffering. This is pretty optional if you want to produce an ultra cheap device because essentially that SDRAM is the thing that is driving up your cost. Because you pop an SDRAM on there, both, they're both kind of expensive parts for significant size, and your board becomes complex enough that you're switching to probably a four layer design where you could have been doing a two layer. So having to do all those nice trace match patterns for the SDRAM controller means that you're going to have a lot of difficulty crossing your signals across the board. So Having that SDRAM does significantly buffer the, the price and makes this difficult to make as cheaply. ULPI-5s are less than a dollar. 
even in singles. So they are super cheap. You can buy uh, microchip parts, the USB uh, 3, 4 XX series. It's hard not to say 40, 30. Uh, those fives are like 30 cents in, uh, in reasonable quantities, like hundreds, and much cheaper if you buy them in thousands. And for the LPC 4330, um, the variants that do not have flash on them are actually cheaper than the variants that do. So a little SPI flash ROM and a LPC 4330, for example, is cheaper than one of the LPC parts that has onboard flash. And so this gets you a really, really, really super cheap uh, overall design. The LPC 4330 is about FTDI price. So you're talking around $5 in reasonable small quantities for a 2232H, which is the fast one. So this is like a FGDI that's much more capable if you're willing to write a little bit of software uh, or use ours. This is about $5. SDRAM really varies a lot. If we omit that, we have a $5 part, a less than a dollar part, a less than a dollar part, put together a PCB, PCBA, that's really gonna depend on how you produce things, but you're still talking about a device that has a bomb cost that is super low. Right? This thing's less than $10 in bomb cost um, at any reasonable quantity. So you get a super cheap analyzer that's capable of doing a ton of USB stuff. If you compare this to $1,100, this design looks pretty good. So uh, hopefully, again, we'll get to the point where I can start taking the rhododendron design uh, and giving it to people who are already getting uh, great feds in a training. And eventually my goal is to take this and once that's kind of has a stable design, move to something that is a dedicated board that has kind of a, the USB hacking tools all on one board, like an LPC 4330, has both of those USB ports brought to headers and then has the ULPI Fi uh, connected such that you can do this kind of analysis. So this is a super, super cheap design. And I love the fact that this is, this is really all that you need to do most analysis in hardware. Though we have the, we just figured out, okay, good, we can, we can build a hardware analyzer. But we also realized kind of embarrassingly recently that we still have the same problem with a lot of the things that we talked about before. We need software to actually do the to actually do something with the data that we get from our hardware analyzer. So if you're the kind of person who thinks of yourself as mostly a hardware engineer, you are probably in the same boat that we were, where you have a, you know, a prototype and a proof of concept in the form of some really simple microcontroller code, and you kind of get to the point where you're like, wait, wait a minute, this thing actually needs some software. I got back from hardware.io where I gave a workshop last week on Sunday. Uh, I got back late at night, Monday morning at 6 a.m., initial commit on so, the USB analyzer software. So when I say embarrassingly recently, I mean less than a week ago. So I went, when I say, when I show you this stuff, I think the stuff that we've produced looks really good. Um, and uh, that is especially within the context of this being one week into the design for the software. I am super excited about the software to the point where like, I woke up this morning and started trying to add more decoders and features to it. Uh, even though I was giving a talk on it, I was kind of afraid to touch the code base. Not, not just that, to the point where you were trying to modify it less than an hour before this talk. I've, and that was not like, this thing has a really good working dammable state that it's in, so it's not like trying to get it done at the last minute. This is just like, I super love the way this thing is. Oh yeah, this wasn't, this wasn't you need to fix something, this was just you don't know when to stop. Yeah, this, that's definitely a problem I have. So initial commit Monday, Tuesday, implement most of the analyzer. Uh, so I'll talk about the software, because I think the software that we're building here kind of winds up being a distinguishing piece of everything. Do you want to kind of walk through the architecture? Yeah, so the architecture Water. is, hmm, ah. the architecture itself is very modular, and to the point where each, the back end and the decoders and the front end all run in separate processes. The back end is what talks to our hardware analyzer, like, uh, the Great Fat Rhododendron or anything else. The decoders are what take that data from the back end and then try to parse it as much as they can into a more friendly format. Anytime an individual decoder takes some data, it will pass it back along to as many decoders as it can and try to parse that data as far as it can possibly go. And then once it's finally done, it will send that to whatever front end you want. If you want a you know, a TUI or a GUI, whatever you want. 
and all of this is very easy to implement yourself. To the point of that, part of why I am here right now at this conference talking to all of you is because I really love producing open source things. When an open source project goes well, it is other people picking this stuff up and doing things they love with it, both because it's very inexpensive, they just go and clone the software for free, and because when they go and build their own USB analyzer hardware or hardware that can incidentally do USB analysis, they can take the software, modify it a little, and be able to kind of run their own USB analysis stack atop their hardware. And speaking of, of implementing backends, Kate managed to so, so I'm here partially to convince you that it is super easy to implement your own backends. The, in order to do that, one of the things that I did starting around Wednesday was implementing a backend for OpenVista. So OpenVista up until this point, which is a project that I have no real affiliation with, had no software front end. It's a pity because a bunch of them were given out via Kickstarter. They are nice hardware. You can go and buy them still. Uh, people like TND have done a lot of work in getting them up and running again, but the software stack for OpenVista is still super, was still super lacking as of Wednesday. Uh, so I started looking at the software stack. It was basically one Python file. One Python file for the communications, and there's a Python uh, front end for it that tells it, that accepts the command line arguments. It, that one file did a ton of low level stuff. Did a lot of like, hey, send, send this register right to the target board. And it was just, uh, I won't say it was horrific to look at, as I think that's really an aesthetic thing, but it definitely was kind of like sitting there and going, I was kind of going, like, okay, I really don't want to put this in the rest of my code base because this is, I'm just like super neurotic about this. So Wednesday I sat and rewrote the OpenVista software stack. So uh, there's now PyOpenVista. PyOpenVista is a proper Python module. The C backend for this, uh, some of the functionality is uh, it's still the same, but the Python code has been completely refactored. So if you want, you can now just, uh, I'll probably upload this to pip once I'm sure it's stable, so you'll be able to type in pip install pyopenvista and get an open Vista software stack. Uh, this doesn't do any of the analysis, but it is a neat, easily organized stack that lets you use USB captures in your own applications, which was super easy for, uh, which made it super nice to actually capture data from, uh, you know, from a device like that. And I will show you how simple that is in a second. Let me just switch to my terminal. Close out of this. It's really hard to see where my mouse is on this thing. There it is. I'm just gonna open another new terminal. You wanna talk through what I'm doing? Yeah. So. The OpenVisla backend is something that we. What are you doing right now? Uh, something that Kate in particular implemented, you know, very very quickly, and that's because the implementing a backend for uh, ViewSB, the software, is only really as difficult as interfacing with whatever your backend is, which is why Kate rewrote. Open Vista software stack to make exactly that easier. And just to kind of show you what that looks like, actually, as I do this, this is the entirety of the backend code for um, this is the core that does the USB processing code for the Open Vista device. Uh, there's code not on here that opens the Open Vista device and hooks up the right callback, but this callback is called every time Open Vista wants to report a USB packet. The whole code here for analysis. Can I laser pointer, is essentially if we have a raw packet, we wrap it in a view SB packet. We say create from a raw packet an actual analyzer packet, and we submit it to our, uh, to the analysis stack for analysis. So raw USB packets are all handled by the analysis stack from there. So if you have a USB analyzer that you're implementing, you need to open a connection to it start your packet flow, and then we do the rest. This is running in its own process, which means that you can sit there and do your packet checking in a while loop, and it will not affect the analyzer. It is designed to be as simple for people to implement these modules as possible. And what that means is that you can sit there and spin weight, capture packets, and just submit them. 
they'll automatically go over uh, a pipe to the main analyzer process, which will handle those asynchronously for you. You do not have to do anything beyond write the Python code that captures stuff from your device. Question? Um, I noticed you're skipping zero link data packets. This is actually not, uh, this is encoded packets, so it's not the data packet itself. The data packet still has the header on it. Uh -huh. So this is actually just if we're getting, sometimes OpenVSL spuriously calls the callback. So this is actually just, we're not skipping ZLPs. So yeah, if you're a USB person, then you know that zero length packets are actually an important part of the protocol. So this is on the raw packet level, not on the data packet level. So you'll get a data transaction that says, okay, I'm a, right after your token, you get the data packet. It still has a header and a CRC on it. So that actually winds up coming in here anyway. So let me show you what the capturing from OpenVSL looks like, assuming I managed to close the device previously. And let me open just the CLI version. The CLI version is a super primitive debug tool. I need to run demo, not the FUSB program. Demo it's CLI. simple to the point where we're basically just printing the data that we get, like almost as I don't think this is raw as we can. Demo CLI open Vista. Yeah, there you go. And I have to actually have USB uh, open Vista plugged in. I am very, very, very good at USB, you can tell. The Very good at USB live I, demos. Uh, I actually have only two USB A ports on my laptop, so I'm swapping between the presentation remote and OpenVSLA. So here we go. I have an OpenVSLA device plugged in. I do not have any data going through it. If I plug in a device into OpenVSLA and have it enumerate itself, I see data from OpenVSLA. This is just, I have the analysis stack actually off. Thank you. So this is without the analysis stack running. This, is without, this front end just prints things. This is literally seeing the data I'm getting from, uh, from the open piece of the raw. So um, with one modification, I do group them into transactions because otherwise this makes a really poor demo. And this because you don't really know when to stop. To see. Yeah, and both. This, I don't know where to stop even when I'm implementing demos, I guess. Yes, the, which is why you use those characters to make that nice tree view. Yeah, that is true. I use Unicode. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just a really raw view of packets coming from OpenVSL. And this is just implementation of a single backend. It's not particularly good until you start adding in decoders. And decoders on this are super simple, super, super simple. They are, this is a standard uh, request decoder that happens to, like if you have a standard request something that USB is already doing, you implement a, basically a boilerplate type. This is the entire, uh, this, this is the entire parsing for the standard request uh, that is set address. This is all you have to write. Essentially, all this thing does, you fill out some fields, you f fill out a summary, super easy. If you want to create something that's more complicated, an anal analyzer that does things that's not at this level, it's not just if you want to implement your own vendor request analyzer or anything like that, then you really have the responsibility of running, writing two functions, essentially. One of them is your summary function. So there's, there's a set of summary functions you can implement. By default, summarize is enough to give you a text description of the packet. You could say summarize data, which gives you a bigger description of the data payload. Uh, there's a bunch of other little things that you can implement. And there is a function called consume packets. Consume packets, you choose whether or not you want to consume a packet that's going through the analyzer stack. If you do, you can then re-emit another formatted packet to the stack. So if you implement the consume packets function, you get a nicely formatted USB level packet that you can then manipulate and decode and change into something nicer. There does not have to be a one-to-one -one relationship between the packets captured, packets uh, consumed, and the packets decoded. So you are free to, for example, grab three packets and emit one, which is useful for like the transaction grouping that we just saw. In fact, very frequently that is the case because USB has a habit of liking to group things into two or optionally three. So what you're actually seeing is USB is accepting those USB packet uh, structures that you saw being created in the OpenVSL backend here. It is taking them, interpreting them. So it says, okay, I've got a token packet, a data packet, and a handshake packet, the kind of fundamental piece of USB transactions. And it squishes those all into a single USB transaction object, which then kind of, kind of consumes three and emits one. And typically when you consume them, you can leave them as subordinate packets. They all wind up in, uh, displayed in your front end. 
And I'm trying to go to the next slide by typing into my terminal. And I call myself a software person, sort of. You, I'll give you a presenter back. You don't really, but yeah, I don't. Uh, and speaking of front ends, again, the design of USB is modular enough that you can implement a front end simply by writing a function like. Oh, you un that's right, you unplug the presentation remote. You can hit next. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I handed it back to you and I was setting up for failure. Yep. The, uh, all you really need to say is define a function, it's handle incoming packet, and then do whatever you, lo you want to do uh, in your own front end logic, which makes, again, as with the back ends, implementing a front end is really only as difficult as fighting whatever front end software you're going to use, like Qt, which is what I've been doing. So. All that you have to do is handle this function when it is, uh, essentially you get a queue of data. There's a built-in function that you will call handle incoming packet on that queue if you want to use that boilerplate, if you can handle updating your data on an event loop. But this also runs in its own process, which means that you get everything here kind of for, uh, for mostly free, and it's being its own process based. You can while loop, you can do whatever you want to. You're not going to stall the analyzer. So let me show you an example front end for this. This is one of a few examples that we've created. Uh, Michaela has been creating a Qt UI, which is a kind of cross-platform UI that has proper GUI properties. But like two days ago, she said that she would love having a text UI interface, the curses interface to this thing. An offhand remark. Because then it would be nice to just like SSH in and be able to touch USB stuff. And I made the mistake of looking into, I wonder if there are you know, nice things that wrap curses these days. And sure enough, there are. And by the time I looked at that, I had kind of, it was like the next morning and I had implemented a text UI. And so let me actually use some pre-captured packets so I don't have to mess with them. And so let's see what I've got here. Pre-captured USB type in. Definitely the best way to, uh, to navigate through here. So this is the text user interface. And the text user interface is taking, this has the full analysis stack behind it now. It is taking all of the packets that you get, interpreting them through the full decoder stack. I haven't written decoders for everything here, but what you're actually seeing is uh, there's a USB hub in line during this capture that is reporting the status of the device as you plug it in. You see the device descriptor. The device descriptor is parsed, you have a packet view on the right. So essentially from the view of raw hex, you get kind of a view out of this that arises that is uh, that's pretty well decoded. Implementing descriptor types is super easy. You implement like one little data structure and you get all this stuff out of it. So this thing is super easy to use for analyzers, especially if you're just saying, okay, I want to add a hid descriptor analyzer to this. I want to add something that can interpret mouse packets. Implementing descriptors is simple enough to the point where often all you really need to do is specify the USB standard names of the descriptor because they have things like the size encoded in them. Yeah, so I've, I've did a lot of syntax sugar for this stuff. This is the text user interface. There is also a Qt user interface that is in progress, but trying to get Qt working on a computer that's different than Michaela's during a demo uh, is kind of frightening to me. So this is kind of the uh, this is kind of the demoable version of this right now. This is all on GitHub, by the way. So if you have a uh, if you have any of these devices, you can go and uh, use this right now. But not everyone has these devices, so looping back to the beginning. I implemented proper USB MON support. Uh, actually, that was on the Plane 2 teardown. I didn't want to be sitting there on a tray table plugging and unplugging USB devices, having nests of wires, both because airline flight attendants don't tend to take well to you having like 15 different embedded systems on your tray table. And, uh, and it's just generally a nice thing to have that I'd love to use in the training. So if I tell this instead of using pre-captured data, let's clip out of this and tell it to use I think Inerdy use USB mod. Hold this for a second. Might as well just plug in the yeah. the. Um, yeah. So um, USB mod again is the kernel module. So all you have to do theoretically is uh, load the module, and hopefully in a live demo everything will work fine. And if you use that on the on mod zero, that gets everything that's going through all of your USB buses, USB. Uh, and I'm hmm? device, 
Yeah, and so Kate's going to plug in a great fit, and hopefully we're going to see enumeration. Right now we're just getting the things like the hub. So this data? Yeah. This live analysis here is happening as I'm plugging in this great fit. You can actually see it's saying, I got a device. It is a great fit. You can see the string is going through here. It's a great Scott Gadgets great fit that I'm plugging in. This is happening just using a software analyzer on Linux. So the, the same software analyzer that Wireshark was using. And you do not have to know what an herb is. You do not have to know what negative E pipe means. I looked in the kernel source, figured that out for you, and I decoded into stuff that is USB. So. <laughs> So what that means is if you have a Linux device, even a Raspberry Pi, you can do things like USB analysis with it up to theoretically super speed, because Linux will talk super speed. Uh, good luck understanding the you know, thousands of bulk transactions that happen if you actually have a, a something that's using the full nature of super speed, but this can theoretically parse that. So that is kind of the whole demo here. So this is USB. it is on GitHub. I went about a year ago to register an organization for the set of USB tools we had, typed in the organization name USB tools, and somehow in 2019, 2018, whatever it was, the USB tools organization name was still available. So it is github.com slash USB dash tools. I think that, that shows how little people think about USB, how much people think about USB yeah, as I'm black really magic. Yeah, I'm really surprised no one was name squatting that. So, from here, I had bonus slides. I'm not going to go through the bonus slides because I kind of knew that we'd be out of time here. But I will open the floor for questions. And before I do that, one last thing here is I think I have a minute for exactly you one question. You have exactly question. a minute, basically. Uh, but the what I'm kind of imploring everyone to do, especially as we have basic Linux USB mon support, grab this. If you want to write a decoder, if you implement a device, go ahead and contribute a decoder for it. This is the kind of thing that is much better if we all work on it together. Or fine and I think this is really kind of filling a niche that I've wished something existed in for years. I'm super excited about having uh, the support. One question. Anyone? Um, I'll just say, well, wait. Yeah, so I'll repeat is, your question. Is the round trip to a URB and back lossless, or are you moving a little bit? So the question is, when we process the herbs that Linux submits back and forth, is that lossless? And the answer is that is not lossless. So I am converting, I'm generating USB transfers from those. You will see in the analyzer only the transfer level. You will not see the individual packets. So you're limited by what your analyzer can do. We can kind of gather what some of the packets were, but we're not going to get much more than that. All right, awesome. Thank you all so much. I will be outside if you have further questions. I'll be out there if you have further questions. I'm going to gather my stuff and get off the stage so that you can continue this. But uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Yes, thank you both.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, yeah. The, the Reaper drones are just you know, flying around and around. Um, hey, so this is pretty informal. Uh, <laughs> we're here to answer questions about anything. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what CrowdSupply has been up to in the last year. Uh, who, who was here last year? Anyone? OK, cool. Uh, so in the last year-ish, um, we were acquired by Mauser Electronics, uh, which has been fantastic. Um, that has really opened up a lot for us. Uh, you may not have noticed that we were acquired by Mauser Electronics because it's business as usual, right? We were doing the same thing we were before. We're just doing it with more resources and uh, in a way that we can make longer term plans. So um, they've been really supportive. Uh, one of the big things that you might start noticing is that you'll be receiving your packages from Texas instead of Portland. Uh, and that's because we're transitioning, almost finished transitioning all of our fulfillment uh, from here in our office to their enormous, amazing facility in Mansfield, Texas. Um, and so that's been a, a, a bunch of work for everyone. Uh, this year so far. Um, we're also, uh, we also have a, li a bit more leeway to partner with, uh, in, in longer term ways, with um, companies like those that are, are uh, sponsoring Teardown. So in particular, Microchip, Molex, and Corvo are our platinum sponsors. And as I said at the beginning uh, of Teardown, we have these longer term plans with them. Um, uh, over the course of 2019, um, so that's that's something we're exploring, and that it's really still focused on the thing we've always been focused on, which is which is projects, right? Delivering new products to to backers and helping our creators do that. Um, I'll give a quick overview of CrowdSupply in case you've never used it or uh, know what we're about. We are a crowdfunding platform for open source electronics. We handle most of the stuff that. Uh, creators don't want to, so like um, a lot of customer support, fulfillment, uh, messaging, media asset production. Um, we have in the last year done a lot more with distribution. So uh, we sell, we make our money mostly through selling products that launch with us after they've filled their crowdfunding campaigns. I um, mean, we take a small cut of, of those sales, but but the real money is is afterwards. It's kind of a long tail play. Um, and now we're selling, reselling to other distributors, right? We want these products to get all over the place. Uh, there's no reason they need to be just sold on crowd supply. Um, and we work with a, you know, each, each, each creator, each project that we work with is, is, uh, its own flavor. There isn't really a cookie cutter mold, um, that, that we use. Uh, as a result, we don't work with very many projects at a time, right? It's, it's a relatively small number compared to, uh, other other places where you could do this stuff, um, yeah. Uh, one of the thing that I mentioned, or kind of obliquely last year, was that we were going to start engaging with our backers more, which we don't really do, except to send them their order and like change their address and you know relatively mundane stuff. Uh, but it, it's pretty clear that you know there are thousands of backers out there using hundreds or more products, um, and mo most of these products are, de are products are dev boards or evaluation boards or something brand new that you can't get anywhere else, and they enable something brand new that you couldn't do before. So, what are those things? What are the what's, what are people doing with them? Uh, so, we launched this field reports program. Uh, I think we just launched our first few field reports. These are submissions from backers telling the world about what they were doing with, say, a Lime SDR or a tiny FPGA or a whatever, um, and yeah, so we're we're we're, culti we're soliciting those and 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 refining them and, and putting them out into the world. Um, that's kind of the the high level stuff that's changed. Uh, of course, we've grown also. There's a lot more blue shirts. We didn't have shirts last year, but uh, a lot more crowd supply folks. Every, everyone from crowd supply, raise your hand. Okay. This is how many people were at CrowdSupply last year, 
right? Uh, but this is less than half of us now. So we have, we're up to 10 now. Uh, still small, but we doubled in, in headcount last year um, or over the course of a year. Uh, and that has been exciting and, and uh, we're not all doing everything anymore, which is amazing. Um, yeah. Uh, so any, any questions about, yeah, project ideas or, yeah, Alvera. Uh, no, I was just wondering. Here, let me get you a microphone. You use this one. Uh, oh. so, so, yeah, well, from what I understand, one of the greatest things you all provide is um, kind of help assistance with all the things that, like you say, are not fun. Are you or have you looked at um, the FCC certification, regulatory stuff, kind of helping people out through that, or in a perfect world, having an open source hardware testing lab that doesn't yes. gouge prices. And yes. So, uh, and I'll, I'll, I don't want to make it look like we're doing the hard work because we didn't, but um, we have a partnership or a, a close relationship with uh, uh, PSU, which I'll, I should mention in a second. Uh, PSU is Portland State University. They're right here in town. Um, and they have a pretty cool uh, anechoic chamber that is orders of magnitude less expensive than a, a testing facility. Now you can't get certified there, but you can rent the space for on the order of hundreds of dollars f instead of thousands of dollars. Yeah, but you only uh, go get certified once, not back and forth while you tweak your product. That's right, yeah. So I mean, and, and the biggest problem people have is they walk in, they have no idea what kind of emission they have, you know, and it, even if it's something simple, it still costs you $10,000, right? So, um, so yeah, th there's that, you know, we're, we're a fan of not providing those services ourselves, uh, but um, kind of enabling that network of people and providers. Yeah. Um, along those exact same lines, like uh, I'm looking for a pretty heavy duty scope to you know validate my five gigabit certes on my board. Um, so any help there from anywhere <laughs> would be super awesome. Yeah, I, I bet we can find a gigahertz level scope somewhere like maybe 20 gigahertz mm, yeah <laughs> yeah i bet in our network we have that there somewhere i don't know where yet okay. actually no i think i do know where yeah well okay. we should talk okay yeah. cool okay uh there's a question back there so besides the obvious people getting the bomb cost wrong I, could you summarize like the three or four typical things that don't go well oh yes uh, <laughs> Could you keep it down to less than 10? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, let's see, where to begin? So, you know, every project runs into something, inevitably, right? Um, there, there are supply chain issues, right? You, you, you designed around a part that no longer exists or is in a short supply. Uh, maybe that's foreseeable, maybe not. Um, there, there's creature feep. No. <laughs> Feature creep. Uh, yeah, I, I have my spoonerism filter on. Sorry. Uh, uh, and so, so you know, somebody is about to go to production and they make a change because they think it's going to be better and it's way worse because it broke it. Um, there are just a lot of human foibles, uh, uh, not getting enough sleep and saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. Um, you know, we 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 try to mitigate that by being almost a communications uh, team for, for, the, for the project. You, you'll note that we don't have a public forum on the site. You can't post anything. Anyone, no one can post anything without going through a crowd supply person, and that's very intentional. Um, uh, there are, uh, a lot of times it's not the bomb, it's, it's the stuff other than the bomb. Right, it's the assembly or the shipping or the the uh, insurance or you know what's the what's the uh, what's your failure rate and things like that. So, um, and then uh, you know one of the most common mistakes I think, and we 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 make a change to almost every project in this regard is what the minimum order quantity is, right? Because that's very hard to know without looking at the entire picture and even if you're not literally graphing it out, you know, there's always a, a almost always a, a soft spot in that curve, which is the right spot to be, right? So instead of being at 100 or 10,000 units, or you know, you're at 2,500 or whatever. 
Um, so figuring that out, uh, the range of um, SKUs, right? If you're, if you're so feature rich and have so many options that you just confuse the hell out of everyone, no one's gonna buy anything. I think I've extended my welcome on this one, but uh, yeah. But there's there's a lot more. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, you mentioned insurance, so I'm going to talk about health insurance. Mm. Um, I don't know, uh, for the folks that want to do this full time, mm -hmm. uh, if you all have suggestions or resources about, you know, uh, at least in the United States, I guess. Yeah. It's really hard, unfortunately. I mean, that's the system we live in right now. And um, it, I think it's one of the most disappointing things. Uh, yeah, that healthcare is tied to jobs so tightly. Uh, it really inhibits a lot of great things. Um, uh, a lot of people work at a, a job where they have healthcare and you know they, they like it enough, but they have a side gig. Um, you know, our, our creators range from uh, you know hobby you know, professionals who are just doing this one project as a side project for fun to um, people who are, are trying to reach escape velocity from whatever job they're doing right now and do this full time, like you're saying, to small startups, to established companies, to multinational organizations that need something weird. Um, for the, those trying to reach escape velocity, um, I think that the biggest yeah, actually, uh, uh, Steve's talk really captured it well, right? That, that the long tail of hardware is, uh, you know, there's not a great ecosystem for that yet. It's, it's getting better, but that's really where you need to be as a, a lone entrepreneur, I think. Um, and he, he had this term that I had not heard before, uh, the economy of scope, right? Where you're not necessarily scaling to hundreds of thousands or millions of units, but you're using the same foundation to build a handful or more of product, right? Each of which might be a niche product, uh, but if you if you um, combine them, it, it may become sustainable. And you know that's kind of what the manufacturing panel is about, or one of the things we're going to discuss uh, there. And if Peter's in the room, he probably has a lot to say about it. But uh, um, yeah, it's, it's it's really hard. Um, so, I, you know, I expect we'll run out of questions, but uh, anybody have project ideas? Or, or first of all, yeah. We're talking about project Okay. <laughs> um, so recently, I've I've run up against a hard upper limit of how fast I can type, mm. um, and I, I just <laughs> I want to know Damn if you. <laughs> you have any ideas that might. Um, uh. Mitigate that, just yeah. perhaps updates or it's kind of embarrassing. Um, yeah, so Zach is referring to my Stenosaurus project, which is still alive. Uh, I, I so at Supercon, um, I sat next to Robert Nelson, who is you know one of the experts in Pocket Beagle and uh, it works at DigiKey, and. Uh, I asked him, how do I make my Pocket Beagle into an HID, uh, to, into a keyboard mouse thing? Because it can do all this other stuff. It can be a mass storage device. It can be uh, you know, whatever else you can be. Um, and he's like, oh, yeah, let me show you. And he pulled up the code. And he's like, you just change these things. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's easy. And then I left. And <laughs> I don't even know what file he pulled up, right? Like, I, I just need to. I just need to figure out the file again. So let me talk to Jason. Is he here right now? Okay. I should ask him. Uh, so, but but once once that's done, um, it should be pretty quick because it has the I/O, it has the uh, the memory and all that, and so that is my project after teardown. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I want to hear about other people's projects. So, if you have a project, want to talk about it? Come on up. Um, love to hear about it. Luke, do, yeah. Oh yeah, uh, you fill out a form. Uh, <laughs> there's a there's a project submission form. So we have a launch page that kind of explains what we do, and I have to read it again. But I think it's up to date. 
Um, and then you fill out a fairly extensive form that minimizes back and forth between us. Uh, we'll probably ask you a couple questions over email. Um, maybe have a phone call or something. Um, and what we're looking for is, uh, is pretty simple. It's always been the same thing. Do you have a sufficiently good plan to deliver what you're promising given what you're asking for? Right? So each of those clauses is very important. Uh, you're asking for a certain amount of money. It, can you do what you're trying to do with that amount of money? And um, is, it, is it a good plan or are you just making stuff up? Uh, so if you don't have a good plan, you know, it's not just we just say no. We, you know, many, many times, most of the time, the plan needs to change before we're willing to launch it. Um, but you know, that's always a conversation and, and uh, um, I think everyone is happy with the outcome. So. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a very manual process. Uh, I, I think from what I know of venture capital, we probably vet our project, each individual project, more than most angel investors vet their $50,000 investments, right? Um, uh, and that's, that's worked out really well for us. I mean, we, it's a lot of work up front, but um, the thing we're most uh, pleased with right now, or always, is the uh, the delivery rate. Right, every one of our projects that's received funding from from Crowd Supply or through Crowd Supply has delivered or is on track to deliver. <clears throat> yes, Kenny, right, the microphone, please. Yeah. What stage of development of the, the the project idea do you want people to come to you at? Like, mm. oh, I just woke up with this awesome idea, or something more like, oh, I'm on my third run of the prototype and it's really smooth now. I think I'm ready to yeah. maybe do it. It really varies uh, by person, right? Like, we also look at the team. It's not just the idea is like almost the least important thing, right? When we vet something, um, it's really you know. Who are you? What kind of support do you have? What kind of track record do you have? Are you trying to do something that's, that other people have done successfully or that you've done successfully? And so at this point, a lot of our projects that we launch are uh, creators that we've, we've worked with before. And so in those cases, we know them well enough that the vetting process is pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, I just was speaking with Ibrahim from Lime SDR or from Lime Microsystems and uh, yesterday we pre-launched the um, Lime uh, crowd cell, right? Which is a very sophisticated piece of equipment. And uh, I didn't have to look at it for very long because it was built on stuff that we all sold before. And, and I know his team and they were all here. And so, you know, that counts for a lot. Um, but on the other hand, we've launched projects within days of meeting somebody if it's really all together and it's clear that they know what they're doing um, and, and they've done it, you know, they've done their homework. So spreadsheets don't lie and as boring as they are, they really do tell you a lot. Um, as far as like the ideal case, um, the earlier the better really, just because we can give you feedback on like, no, that's, that's not a great idea. Or it'd be great, even better if you did this, right? Or maybe we know somebody who is doing something similar and you could collaborate with them. Um, uh, and we've had projects in pre-launch for over a year, you know, and that's not a problem. You know, it's, it's in some cases better. Um, so it really depends is the answer. Yeah. One is that you have to make at least one. Uh, oh, uh, not really. I mean, it's it's more. I'm not sure if we've ever turned away a project that fit the the flavor of project you'd see on crowd supply, so kind of open source electronics, uh, because it had a minimum. It was too small, right? I mean, that's not. Um, there's a lot of value in small projects. Uh, just. It, bring, it, it introduces us to new people. It's something that we can ca continue to carry for a long time. Um, and so I, I don't think we've ever rejected somebody because of that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, curious, what do you advise in terms of early stages of how open to be and also like patents and things like that? Mm -hmm. Like, 
when you're in the early phase, it may or may not happen. Where, where is it advantageous to talk about things? And then do you have any general recommendations about making sure that there's enough, like, do you have to do, is there a current patent conflict or mm -hmm. any, any tips on navigating? Yeah. So that? we don't, we don't generally give much advice on patents in particular. Um, and in fact, uh, you, you can read this great, um, article or, or blog post by G Chi, who was the co-founder of Chibitronics with Bunny Huang. Uh, she um, invented Chibitronics, or uh, the circuit, circuit stickers, and Bunny helped bring it uh, to market through manufacturing. Um, they had a, a patent issue, and uh, the whole story of how they handled it was really interesting, and I think really eye-opening. You know, things can go wrong pretty quickly, um, but there's, you know, d depending on the size and scope of the project, there, there's not much you can do or it's worth doing, right? You just kind of sit tight and let it go. Now, if you are talking about hundreds of millions of dollars instead of hundreds of thousands, then it changes, I think. Uh, so the scale of, of what you're working on, you know, patents at hundreds of millions of dollars really matter because that's a lot of money and people will sue you for it. Um, in terms of open source, uh, a lot of people are worried that somebody's going to steal their design and make it, and I don't think I've ever seen that. There might be one case. Uh, has anybody seen that? Has anybody seen an open source project that is being sold on the open market that was copied? Hmm? Proxmark, yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, 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 I guess it does happen, uh, but I think the value, you know, it's easy to reverse engineer something like that. Um, the value that you're building or that you have, the leverage that you have is the supply chain and the knowledge and, you know, the, the manufacturing knowledge, I think. Uh, and, and you'll always be the yeah. Right. You'll always be the original. Yep. Yeah, of say what, say it again. Support. What about support? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you good. Yeah, um, So generally, we you know for for this category of product, almost every category that, that we see on Crowd Supply, we encourage the more open the better, right? Because it's that's not true for all products across you know the world, but for Crowd Supply products, it's almost always the right choice. It, it, it's also, you, it lessens your support burden because you can talk about things. You can, you can release schematics and code and all that, let people answer their own questions. Um, there is a first mover advantage, right? As somebody said earlier, uh, you, you do build up a, a community, um, you build up trust. If you're, if you're doing something that is dealing with people's personal information, it kind of has to be open source, I think, for at least for our community. Um, so. The business case for it, I think, is pretty strong, and I've had this discussion many times, uh, and it's almost always yielded a more open product. People kind of see, oh yeah, that was just a knee-jerk reaction. I wanted to keep it closed. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, there, there are some uh, some exceptions, I think, but but generally, it's almost always more open source than not. It depends what you're calling open source too, right? There's the long list of things that goes into a product. Uh, a good example is, well, Raspberry Pi was mentioned earlier, right? You can't get that chip, so how open source is that? Um, at the same time, you know, there's, there's Pocket Beagle, which is more open source, but buying the chip is more expensive than buying the board. Uh, so it's not really practical in small quantities to, to make uh, your, your own revision, at least economically viable. Um, there's actually what I'm one project I'm really excited about. That I think is launching today. If it hasn't already launched, is the giant board. I don't mean, know if you saw it on in the demo floor upstairs. Uh, it is the first SBC in a feather form factor, um, and the chip is readily available, and the chip isn't more expensive than the board. So you could really go out and fab your own SBC, and even sell it and make some money. Um, and that's the first time I, that I know of that that's happened. Um, 
you know, then, then there's the different layers of, of hardware, right? You're talking, well, yeah, the board and the layout and the schematics are all open source, but, and the chips are available, but I don't know how the chip works. I had to sign an NDA to get the special uh, audio license or, or audio codec working. Um, you know, I think Risk Five is is uh, addressing that a little bit. Um, yeah, so it, there's a lot of complexity in calling something open source. Yeah. Okay, let's dive into projects. So, what do you got? Yeah. <laughs> this is more like an interactive. Oh no! This is heckling. Oh no! This is, this is heckling. <laughs> um, so this might be more of an interactive uh, presentation, if you will, lightning talk. But hypothetically, let's say uh, that I made a, a set of uh, temperature and humidity sensors for measuring things. The so cheese making. Um, some people want to do meat curing, uh, and other things where you might want to measure temperature, humidity in some way. And right now I have a controller board with a bunch of cables going to the smaller boards for the sensors. And it's kind of a pain to have all these wires going into your fridge and stuff like that. So I've already been working with Bluetooth. I figured let's just make them wireless. But what I don't know is what I kind of want to hear from other folks, what would be um, better, like I'm thinking you could have a little rechargeable LiPo battery, but then you have to, you know, the shipping LiPos, the lithium batteries is a pain. You have a coin cell, you're gonna have limited battery life. You can have like double A's, it's gonna make it a little bit bigger. So I'm just wondering what, like if people have any, uh, not you, <laughs> no, no. I, I'm wondering you know, if, if what, what people would be, um, would be better. Uh, I, I kind of tend to the like, rechargeable double A's are less wasteful because you can do that, but you know, it's not a small, that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wondering what people would be. Yeah, I, I'm all about the rechargeable double A's. Yeah. Uh, just I have a ton of them in my house, and I use them all the time, and that's that's the standard for me. Okay. Yeah. I would also question that coin cells don't last very long. I think you can make them last. I mean, they have a shelf life of ten years, and I think if you're careful with sampling and sleep modes and stuff. Yeah, I, no, I, no, I, I can get down to like tens of microamps. Uh, yeah, it's just at a lower temperature, especially in the fridge situation. Um, but again, you don't need to measure more than like every minute, every ten minutes. So you could definitely last for months. Um, but have, yep. have, you, have you tested the have I tested performance of like coin cells or light bulbs or I, I know people who have a very detailed uh, Jack Gansel, I think, did a very thorough review and, and basically concluded that your capacitors are probably leaking more than your microcontroller and, and these very low and, and I've done some of my previous jobs as well but um, what about like the lipos? Because I know lipos yeah. I mean as I understand it, they don't like Temperature at all. That's true. I mean, it's not super cold. Like it'll still be about freezing usually, uh, and and you're not like actually in cold temperatures, they're not going to discharge as much self discharge. Uh -huh. But if you're pulling current, for, this is what I understand. I, I might be wrong. If you are pulling a lot of current, then they'll be less efficient. But with these tiny tiny current draws, I, I might be negligible. All right, I'm going to ask the questions everyone wants to know the answer to. When are you launching this, and who are you launching this on? <laughs> I don't know uh, when I'm launching it, but this would be a, a crowd supply project, yes. Josh, when is he going to do it? Very soon. Put a date on it for us. Alex? <laughs> I don't know. What is, what is your favorite type of cheese? Oh, that is, uh, that, I don't pick a single favorite cheese, but I can tell you a class of cheeses that I like. Cheese for every yeah. occasion. Yeah. Um, so... For, for the uninitiated, a, a very good uh, starter cheese is, <laughs> yeah, gate, which, like people like the breeze, the, the camemberts, but um, uh, there's this triple milk cheese that I love that's called Latour, and it's uh, cow's, goat, and sheep's milk, and it's a soft cheese. It's a bit on the stinkier side, but not like a blue cheese stinky, that's but like a good stinky. <laughs> I love that. If you like melted cheese, raclette is fantastic. And if you've ever been to Switzerland or to like a Swiss restaurant, getting a raclette or a French is fantastic, where you have the quarter wheel of cheese or half wheel. You have a very hot kind of uh, filament, and it's literally melting off the cheese, and you just put a piece of bread or something. It's so delicious. So yeah, the, the, the hard cheeses, the goudas, the... Yeah, anyway, uh, I should stop. 
But yeah, if you want to talk about Chiefs, come find me. And also Jared Boone, somewhere around outside. He's a fellow Chiefs fanatic. So yeah. Thank you for oh. Thank you. One of the things I, I, I'm currently a bit paranoid about is, um, is thinking about tolerance, right? Because if you're at any point when you go from a prototype, you build a prototype, you switch it on, it kind of works, right? You think, good, this is good. But if you want to start making more of them, you've got to think about how things might differ, right? From the environments you run them in or, or the components you use. So just to that point, I think someone raised it earlier. If you're thinking about taking a battery and putting it in a cold environment, relatively cold environment, then, you know, like in a, just a refrigerated few degrees C, then I test a few of them. You know, I don't just try one and say, yeah, it oh, worked no, once yeah. for me. You need to get a bunch Lots. and see what happens. Um, and, then, and then to your other point, another thing I'm th I think about is recently is this, uh, I, I think um, Eric Pan uh, used this phrase for the first time I heard it a long time ago. And it's kind of a weird phrase. He talked about design from manufacturing. And it seemed like a really smart phrase. And then, then I thought about it for a while, and I'm like, hang on, I don't understand what the difference between design for manufacturing and design from manufacturing is, but I've come back to it. So I think it is kind of interesting. And so what he did is, uh, they do this seed studio, I've done this little oscilloscope. Is it the DS Nano? Is that right? For, for many years. And it comes in this, it looks like it's a really nice finished product. Um, it's quite low spec. It's a bit of a crappy oscilloscope, I mean, it's pretty cheap. But, uh, and, and you plug your probes in, I think, using a stereo headphone jack, but it's quite low bandwidth, so it's like, okay, fair enough, it's not got BNC. But it turns out this thing, it's got an LCD on the back or whatever, but the, the enclosure is from an MP3 player. So someone decided early on, right, I'm gonna make this oscilloscope, but I'm gonna need some enclosures. I can't afford tooling to make my own enclosure. I'm gonna find a, you know, and then they make it, and you wouldn't know, you wouldn't know it wasn't designed for it. It's, you know, all the buttons have got <laughs> silk screen on them, which it will seem sensible. Anyway, so this idea of design for manufacturing, go to the supply chain, see what you can get cheaply, readily, and see if you can then mold your product around it for low-volume stuff, right, to get to this long tail of hardware. And sorry, there's a bit of a long answer. But uh, so I, I recently, when it comes to batteries, you know, maybe the Nokia BL5C, right, it's a really standard uh, rechargeable battery. If it's rough, it's 1,000 milliampere hours. Oh, well, so, that's huge. So rather than getting a, I mean, it depends what, you know, what you want it for and how long you want yeah. Of course. But if you're in that kind of range, rather than just getting one of these kind of generic lipos um, that comes in the in the pocket, you've got something that, you, you know, you need a particular mechanism to clip it into. But I think you can... You yeah, can no, no. I, that, if if I were going to lipo, that I think that would be a, a, a better better choice to something that's out there. Because dealing with this little connectors is not fun either. Um, so I spent a few years selling industrial instruments, and wireless was always kind of scary because yep. it was noisy and explosion proof was hard and there's all these other issues. So there are, there are two really interesting wi wired methods that might be worth exploring. One is Dallas One Wire, um, mm -hmm. which can use a coaxial cable and you get power and data. Um, and coaxial cable, if you can get it cheap, is durable and thin and easy to string. Um, but most of the plants I worked with ran on 4 to 20 milliamp, 24 volt current loops. Um, and again, you can get power and data over a twisted pair um, to a very high degree of accuracy. I mean, you you know, we'd have thousand foot twisted pair runs, and we could still get tenth of a percent how, accuracy. How flat are the cables? Because so the, the 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 fun thing with the fridge is if you're having cables go into it, uh, you either have to cut the seal, drill a hole into the fridge, which as you if you, anyone saw my talk last year, you might run into freon pipes, and then um, yeah, so so you either putting the cable through the seal and then there's kind of a gap so air gets in and that's a humidity nightmare if you have a humid uh, outside um, or you have to kind of cut a little bit around yeah I mean it's, these are electrical protocols but I would, yeah. I would think 4 to 20 milliamp in particular is pretty cable agnostic um, because you're dealing with current as opposed to voltage so you can you yeah. can handle a pretty high voltage drop on a very thin diameter I, conductor I should look into that which My, might be worthwhile yeah the, 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 that's uh, I've been looking at those. I've been doing I squared C, which I shouldn't be using for long distances, but whatever it works. Um, but my main concern when it comes to the cabling now as well is just the the manufacturing assembly um, complexity. Because now once you're dealing with wire harnesses, it gets much more complex, and then the users, uh, that kind of stuff. So I figured, um, yes, the wireless might not be as great. Yeah, I mean, if you have a metal for a <laughs> metal line fridge, like well, tough, right? But um, it, the, the, the only benefit there is for the ease of use, I guess, and ease of manufacturing. Because now you just have a board, 
some sort of enclosure. I'm thinking now conformal coating because it's going to be humidity and, and like moisture and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, the, the the cable thing for me is what I've been using. But I, I I'm trying to think of if it wasn't me using it. Again, on cables, and I, I think you're, you're bringing up good points. Um, Helen Sox, she talked about how a lot of engineers don't know about silicon, silicone cables. Oh, they're nice and soft, uh, yes. Yeah, so if you're, I'm if you're using fan. them, then you're, yeah, that's great. Yes. Yeah, but, but still, like the, the, you've got to crimp it or screw it in. Or, and and if, I, if I want a, a cheesemaker that might not be technical to, to use this, I, I don't want it to have to take out a screwdriver. And like, it would be great if they just kind of you know, sticky tape it into a, like their fridge or to a Tupperware container and then use their phone or some other thing to just monitor. Anyway, I've been talking for way too long. Who else wants to talk about anything but my project? All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so I maybe want more feedback on the concept than whether well, let me let me tell you what. So, so I'm I'm not as young as I appear. Um, I grew up in the day when you know you kind of learned to program and micro, you know, with microprocessors kind of simultaneously and all that. Um, something originally the RCA 1802. So, if anybody has even heard of it, oh, all right, Steve. Okay. Anyway, so forever I've been I I, I started as a software guy. I'm a bit of a cl closet hardware guy. Won't go into my story. Forever I've been fantasizing about a custom CPU project. There's like you know as quite a few custom CPU projects on the internet. Um, so I've been fantasizing about an 8-bit custom CPU project where, you know, not, no, no ALUs even. You have to do the ALU stuff in, in logic. And I, and I have a prototype that's getting sort of far along. I, it's probably the most expensive counter in terms of chips available. Um, it's a very sophisticated state machine. And it, it sort of almost works. And I'm sort of my vision is at least to get it as far as you could um, run basic on it so someone could see the whole thing my whole stick was you know I grew up in this world where I started with the hardware and software simultaneously and I kind of understood registers and all this and for a lot of people it all looks like magic so I'm thinking there's at least some group of people who'd like to understand the relationship between the metal and the language and that's my project I s almost have it going I I'm not running basic yet but I'm getting on the closer side lots of soldering uh, you know, multiple boards, lots of soldering. It's a huge state machine for all intents and purposes. I'd be curious thoughts or questions. I want this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Let me get on my order book. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm thinking it would be like a kit. Um, so part of what I have is um, a board. I have a, a bus controller board that actually gets driven from an Arduino that can control all the signal lines so you can actually like test the memory board and test the, the you know the logic and so forth so you can actually um, sort of build it stepwise and kind of see the functions as you go and control um, sort of all the news so you, you you know I have some software that communicates with an Arduino over a, 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 30, a 328, not an Arduino, but I have a, a control board that I can drive the bus and sort of see what's going on and test it and it all runs like at one megahertz or something super fast. But yeah, so I'm, thi I'm thinking a kit. The only thing I'm thinking of pre-soldering is I'm using these 96 pin DIN connectors. Um, they're really mechanically solid, so I like them for the bus, but they're a pain in the butt to solder. If you're not an experienced soldering person, they're not great. The rest of it's all through hole, so it's easy. This is through hole too. But I'm thinking maybe that comes pre-soldered. I don't. I don't know. Cool. Yeah. Um, maybe not at this state, but once you get the full functioning prototype together, um, I don't know if you thought about this, but I think there's a lot of opportunity to possibly um, break it down into steps and modulize it and make it like little learning modules and distribute it to middle schoolers yeah. and beyond. I saw something go by the other day. I can't remember. I bookmarked it. I saw somebody's doing a project where they're building up, I think, a four-bit CPU yeah. bit by bit by bit, and it looked kind of interesting. And they got the price point really far down, which I, I don't know how they did that. Um, but yeah, I, I yes, I've been struggling with sort of the part of the experiences in the building and testing and learning as you go. So once you do it, it's not really useful to the next mm -hmm. student. Like they'd have to do it again, but it could all be dip socketed and yes, but I, yes. Uh, I listened to the Amp Hour, uh, this podcast that 
over there, Chris runs. And I think it was a Ben Eater uh, does a similar thing with an 8 bit micro and teaching stuff. I don't know if you've seen his uh, YouTube videos. Which one is it? Ben Eater, is it? Or? Yeah. I'll have to think. I, I may have. I've got a whole just, list. You just know, Justin, I, think, yeah. I was sort of following the. There's a project, some profs in Israel, like Nan to Frogger or something. I can't remember what it's called. Yeah, I've heard of that one too. Yeah, something like that. Anyway, uh, thank you for any other questions. Come find me if you want to talk about it. Thanks. <laughs> Would you be interested? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> S submit a proposal. <laughs> yeah. Cool, yeah. Uh, in this box here is Archimedes, who is my robot owl that I've been carrying around. And all weekend I've been saying, oh, tomorrow I'm going to have him do audio responsive stuff because I'm going to rip the brain out of this robot, which is called Trio, because he's made of a third hand and he's going to have little claws on it, which I've lost. And I just ripped off Archimedes' head because Alvaro and I were going to uh, swap out the... So, uh, what I need is to like put a full pie in, but his head right now only fits a Raspi Zero W. The problem is that I'm trying to run this protocol called Chirp, data over audio. It sounds like R2D2. It's fantastic. It allows machines to talk to each other and to your phone and stuff. It's very cool. Um, the problem is that when you run it on the Pi Zero W or any Zero, I think uh, it seems to just go for a little bit and then do a kernel panic, <laughs> which is suboptimal. Uh, so the pr thing that I'm facing right now is that doing audio on the Pi is a pain, a million pains in the ass uh, at once. And so I was trying to do it with the audio out on the big Pi. Uh, USB sound cards are a little bit more friendly, but being able to set the precise audio in and out that you want is a huge pain. And so I'm curious if anyone has recommendations for a standalone audio module that, because I'm thinking that A, Sorry, this is, he's all Cthulhu mode right now. <laughs> this is, this is, <laughs> he's, he's a little, he's a little, I'll put his head on top. Maybe that'll that be better. That fits right in. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's better, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is where he is right now. Um, he's, that's going to be flipped around so it's in the back. Uh, where, where are you? Oh, yeah, so. A, I want to make like a wrist-mounted module that you can push little buttons on and go beep boop, and then it'll go beep 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 beep, and he'll do like his own little emotion and dance, whatever kind of routine. Uh, so you can sort of tell him what to do, and he'll do it. It'll be awesome. And also, I'll be able to ideally trigger that thing, you know, off of a GPIO pin on the on the Pi, and that way he'll be able to talk back to you and tell him what you tell you what he's feeling. Uh, the problem is that, yeah, I would love to find a good audio module that would let me do this standalone. Like just, you know, I push one of, basically like, if you know the bare conductive touch board, it's got like 12 touch inputs uh, and each one triggers a separate MP3 file. It's very easy. I found little MP3 modules, but all you can do is like trigger the next track or say start or stop on a single track and it's a huge pain. I just want to know what, what people know about for audio modules that would make this less of a Lovecraftian nightmare. <laughs> so I don't see Paul in the room, so I'm just going to say, oh. have you played with Teensy? I have. The Teensy audio module is a little big, so maybe I would be able to... But he's a super helpful guy, so maybe he knows... <laughs> it like, yeah. Ideally, just output, because I could put one in him that he can talk through, and I could put one on my wrist that it can talk to him. Huh. And it's like a so it. <laughs> All right. So Paul has uh, a, a backpack for the TNC that's a DAC 8211, and it's like $3 for the kit, and it's basically a so it eight and a couple caps. And that sounds amazing. it's mad cheap. So I have a ton of those. Mad cheap is my favorite. Right. Price. It, yeah. It's like three bucks, or if you want the part, it's like 20 cents. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You have to have it with a TNC, right? You can't just have like a little standalone. Um, but th it's, I mean, I can make it, that small. It, it's it's a super 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 cheap Soic Eight DAC module. Um, mm -hmm. It's not Spy or I squared C. It's some weird bit bang thing, but it works really well for what it is. And Paul's got the library for it Ooh. that he wrote, so you might be able to pillage that. And do you happen to know off the top of your head how you put the audio into it? Like, is it a micro SD card, or because that's like the optimal thing? Is you like load it onto yeah, it by a um, USB or a micro USB mm. SD? But there's nothing. I'm I'm amazed there's nothing like good for this yet. Right. <laughs> 
there, there's my crowd supply project. Uh, I know, right? Yeah. That to you, next you would week. think there'd just be like me a, a little wrist mounted beep boop that. machine. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's all I want. Yeah. Thank you. Let's see. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and then if anyone has questions about Archie, you know, I'm going to be publishing Archimedes 2. This is the 2 version. He's better than before because he's number 2. Uh, yeah, and including like improvements to these. I think one of the coolest things is the way that the wings are mounted. So there's no motors here. He's just like got these little zip tie hinges. Uh, and yeah, uh, he's gonna have a voice interactive module because um, you can run on this matrix. This is the matrix creator device and inside his head there's a smaller one called the matrix voice and they both have a bunch of sensors and LED rings and, uh, and Xilinx FPGA and stuff. And what you can do is run your own Alexa or uh, Google Home or Snips.ai or Mycroft, which are both privacy focused open voice assistants, which are, yeah, so much better than Google or Amazon. Yay! Okay, I think people are getting. Oh, oh okay. What? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Maybe it should call your mom or something. <laughs> or my mom. My mom would like that. Yeah. Um, I've been absolutely racking my brain because I can't remember the person that did this project, but sometime in the last six months, I met someone who built little plant, like moisture sensors <gasps> that she put around her apartment huh? that then talked to each other over encrypted audio channels. I think I know this person. Yeah. I think, is that Scott Kildall and whoever? I don't remember. I just remember I like hearing about this amazing apartment. thing. And, and so what oh. they, one of the things they figured out was how to get audio frequency Encrypted communications to work in the real world on like encrypt or on on microcontrollers. That so is that's the pro I think this. that's a good project to look up for this for this one. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was that was exactly the point. Yes, yes. It was encrypted because plants deserve privacy. Privacy as, is as for well everyone. As if I remember the project, I'll tell you about it. But yeah. I oh, don't yes, know. please. <laughs> I think I remember something similar, but it's not the same thing. I I saw a board at Maker Fair. Uh, Rest in peace. Um, MOVI. Um, sorry. What um, was it called? I, it was called MOVI, and it was an Arduino board. But oh. then they had like a, I, I'm actually looking at it. They had some stuff on how to connect it to a Pi, and it's audio recognition and generation. Oh shit! Uh, so I, I can show you the link in a second. Nice. Yeah, you don't have to guess. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't have to stand up here and <laughs> Google it. <laughs> sorry. I think I saw somebody else yeah, who wanted so to say a thing. The protocol you're originally talking about, where you're saying it was called Chirp? Chirp.io, yeah. Okay, is that a coincidence? Uh, I mean, I don't know why they called it that. Okay. Uh, but it's pretty. So, the way that I <laughs> want to talk to Archimedes over it is, is I'm sending uh, emojis. So, you can do like owl happy, owl sad, and stuff. This is so meta. <laughs> but he's going to be able to talk to other companions. And my idea is that maybe you can have like channels where like they all listen for like generic happy, sad, whatever, but then you can preface it with their own, like, if you built an owl or a spider or whatever, and they can respond to their own one, and we can, like, so you can have a group address or, like, an individual address and, like, have an oh. Emoji chirp channels. Okay. For owls. Yes. Okay, cool. Just check Owls it. and other things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm about this. Uh, <laughs> no. I also need to see Clash of the Titans, apparently, because there's, everyone thinks he's boo-boo. Is the name of the owl in the in the thing? Or are you doing something with that microphone? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just holding it. All right, cool. <laughs> I, I think. <laughs> what? Uh, face noises. Uh, have you looked at the Sparkphone modules? There's the little soundy and the Papa soundy, and I think you can just send them a serial byte. So if you're Ooh. using the Raspi, then like. I've got like a, a Sparkphone module or two in here, and I remember looking it up, and then and people being like. I hate this, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that might have been a different one. This is the micro SD audio module, which I think was yeah. maybe terrible. There's there's little soundy uh. and then Papa Soundy, which has its own SD card. I think the little soundy doesn't have SD. Cool. Uh, but Papa those soundy. might be worth looking at. We use some at the museum, like the Papa Soundies. Sweet. So. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna harass everyone after this and be like, what were the links you said? 
Um, just the timing. Anybody who is really into platformer games, Ori in the Will of the Wisps drops this year. So there's like big money behind Baby Owls that you might be able to seek for sponsorship. Also, so. there's gonna be a His Dark Materials series coming out on on like Netflix or some some yeah. something. So there's I think there's HBO. I think there could be there's money in owls right Demons. now. Demons. So yeah, 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 that. yeah. So totally, <laughs> slightly. I just this just gave me an idea, and I don't know if this happens already or should happen. But is there a thing as a open hardware, open source hardware, open source software, um, community design reviews kind of thing? Because this is very useful, and I don't know if this is like we need to start a little uh, recurring. Because I would benefit from it a lot, and and like I've learned a lot of that I've, I've made a lot of mistakes that I could also be like, hey, don't do that, and and yeah. Okay, so real quick, uh, this is something we've thought about for a long time at Crowd Supply, and like, how do we get folks like you all, like our potential creators or past creators or future creators, uh, to help each other? And in a room, it's easy, right? Because we're all here and friendly. Uh, but as soon as we get online, we're really mean. No, just just kidding. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, but that's not really the, the issue. But but like, what mechanism would, other than being in person, you be like, yeah, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna help. I'm gonna check. I'm gonna review some stuff and give feedback or ask for feedback. Like what? I don't know what that looks like yet. Just like a chat room. We yeah we have we actually have a uh, a Discord channel on Adafruit. So Adafruit's Discord server uh, has a CrowdSpot channel, yeah. I think one thing you could do is just next year call it a hardware, say you're going to have a hardware design review. And I think then people will great, great people idea. will come to this yeah, yeah, yeah. with looking for that kind of feedback. Okay. Yeah, that's... It'd be cool to have some like uh, industry experts too for some of the content yeah. like right. five gigabit thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I one thing before I sit down. Which is that uh, I've been studying ham radio, and we're gonna do it, start doing a thing I think called ham and cheese, which is like a <laughs> 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 like a weekly or something hangout online where we uh, talk about ham radio and study and stuff, and maybe take the the exam at DEF CON and stuff, but also cheese because everyone's got to it's BYOC because like we're gonna be in different places, but it'll be online, yeah. B B B Y O C, bring your own cheese, because oh oh. Well, Alvaro is building that. Yeah. Yeah. Where where is this gonna be? Online. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> Just look on Twitter or some something. Like one of us will probably post about it. Uh, out of curiosity, you all here are licensed operators. This is awesome. Oh too. my goodness. Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Nerds. I, I feel like there are not enough events outside of the traditional what like my my like family's gener like parents and beyond's generation has done over and over and over. Um, there's not really like a lot going on. And that would, I know, but that's still like Everybody what I did with my dad when I was 10 years old. <laughs> yeah, we, I think we have like an obligation to like really yeah. redefine what we can do and how much I, I think having a, like a testing station set up next year we, would be pretty awesome. It's, it's something so easy I've been to get people to out to come and, test. Cause you, you could, yeah. you could study on Friday, take it on Sunday yeah. and you're probably done. Right. Yeah. Like that'd be great. So if yep. anyone, I don't have deep connections in that world. So I know you do, and some of you folks, yeah. Uh, be awesome. Let us know. Let us know about ham and cheese. We'll we'll post on the teardown as a teardown update. Um, I believe we are plum out of time. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, there is a talk here next, and a talk I believe in Hammer also. Thanks.
Hello again. I uh, have a feature as Phil Donahue. Um, this is our manufacturing panel. Uh, yeah, right? Right. Um, so this is a, like our last panel, but if you, if you didn't see it, I'll describe it. Uh, fairly informal. We're going to uh, have them introduce themselves. Um, I'll moderate some questions. And then I think the most interesting part is uh, opening up to questions from you. Um, but yeah, why don't we just kick off right away? Um, hi, Whoop. loud, all right. Hi, my name is Jason Kreidner. I'm uh, with the BeagleBoard.org Foundation. Um, started that up about 11 years ago. I'm also, uh, but I still keep my full-time job at uh, Texas Instruments, um, so I don't take a salary from, from BeagleBoard, um, who is a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, you know, we've been uh, kind of growing quietly, about 25% uh, year on year in terms of board sales. We're up to about 350,000 a year. Um, for dev board is not too bad. Um, most of that is in like, um, you know, under about 100 boards per, um, you know, there's I think like one customer that's bought like 5,000 boards last year. Everybody else is like under 1,000. Um, and so we have a pretty broad user base, um, entirely open source. Um, you know, not a lot of barriers to entry for other people, but, um, you know, except we've got a little brand. And, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, we're trying to change the world through um, open source hardware and um, Linux computing. Hi, my name's Jeff Kaiser. Uh, I develop and sell open source electronics kits. I have a website, mightyohm.com, and I spent this past seven years working for Valve Corporation developing consumer electronics. and. Uh, during the time that I was at Valve, I primarily worked on a project which became the Steam Controller. Uh, and so got to work on one of the largest automated assembly lines for consumer electronics in the world. And sort of in the time that I was at Valve, did a lot of prototyping in the, you know, ones and tens and hundreds. Uh, and then eventually got to work on a mass manufacturing line and got to make millions of something. And so sort of was directly involved in that whole process. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Piotr Zantemski. I'm the founder of OneBit Squared, and uh, we make uh, open source electronics of our own design as well as for other open source projects to support their communities. Uh, we do uh, Blackmagic Probe, the JTAG programmer debugger with built in GDB server, which is uh, one of the main products we do. And we are now involved in making the Icebreaker FPGA board for teaching people use the open source FPGA synthesis tools, um, as well as now uh, getting into like Glasgow uh, uh, Digital Interface Explorer and other projects. Um, this is much, much smaller <laughs> quantity than the other guys. So, um, but uh, yeah, we do crowdfunding campaigns for our products to launch them and uh, get the word out um, to also promote through them the open source projects that are powering the tools that we make. Hey, my name is Mihir Shah. We own and operate quick turn printed circuit board fabrication and assembly shops here in the US, so Royal Circuits and Advanced Assembly. We have four factories here in the Bay Area, Los Angeles, and Denver areas. And our main specialty is what we call home of the miracle turn, meaning quick turn, like same day, next day, two day turns on boards as simple as two and four layer all the way up to crazy HDI, four lamp cycle, et cetera, kind of boards. And on the assembly side, we will do the same as far as literally fab and assemble just one board in just a few days. So our main business is quick turn prototype fabrication here in the US, um, PCB manufacturing. Hello, I'm Nadia Peek. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Washington uh, for our, I am in machine agency. There are five of us machine agents here at Teardown. Uh, why is a professor on a manufacturing panel? Good question. Uh, I think the, I'm currently very interested in the concept of fabricatability or how, if you have open source hardware, what are the, um, what are the resources and machines that you need to be able to make that? So how do you actually go about 
copying in the way that is very easy with software and is not easy with hardware. But most of the time with manufacturing, my main claim to fame is that I'm very good at writing bash scripts that translate really archaic file formats into other really archaic <laughs> file formats. Uh -huh. And so I'll do that for lots of turret punches or uh, lasers or any kind of weird machine that you might need um, controlling for. I'm Steve Hodges. I'm a, a principal researcher at Microsoft Research in Cambridge in the UK. I've been at Microsoft for um, 15 years now. And uh, prior to that, I, uh, I worked at AT&T and Olivetti had a research lab in Cambridge. And I worked at the university on and off. So I, I've been lucky enough to spend most of my career uh, designing, building gadgets, which is what I'm passionate about. You know, don't tell any of my employers that I'd, I'd be doing it for free if they weren't paying me to do it. But um, along the way, sometimes I'm doing prototyping, but, but in the last few years, I've got much more involved in uh, in high volume or higher volumes. Uh, as Josh mentioned, uh, I've been involved in the microbit, uh, where we made, uh, I think they manufactured 4 million microbits in total now. Uh, I've also you know, been involved in and, and you know, had some contact with some Microsoft products which sell in super high volume, as well as uh, uh, you know, struggling sometimes with prototypes that I've built and wanting to you know, build them up more organically. So uh, I'm really interested in in how you scale, right? How you can come, you know, for a given product, how you can work out how to manufacture it at a different volume, and then maybe if the product's successful, how you can transition sort of from one level of volume to the next. Uh, so that's something I've been thinking about, and I'm happy to learn more about as well. Great, uh, Steve. You gave a talk yesterday that elaborated a lot more on on that. Uh, the long tail part. If you didn't see it, the videos should be up soon. Um, and in that talk, you mentioned the economy of scope, right, instead of the economy of scale. Peter, I see you as a prime example of that. And a lot of what we do at CrowdSupply uh, as the economy of scope, you, you listed off a number, uh, half a dozen different products just then. It's all using the same assembly line. Can you talk a bit about that? So yeah, I don't do it how I do it. I have my own pick and place machine in my garage. So. Um, basically, I um, so how it. I, I think the history how it happened that I'm actually doing the assembly myself is an interesting one because um, I was making those small quantity open source UAV autopilots and assembling them with a CM as you would do, but um, because we were making stuff and also had contacts in China, we were trying to make small quantity boards in China and had terrible experience with that. So we were getting boards back where capacitors were, where resistors were and vice versa. And even though we tried to provide all the documentation necessary about, it was 2010 things, I, I know things got better since then, but that was my experience back then. So we were like, we have to have the CM locally. We were in the Bay Area, so uh, there are several CMs, we could use them. We are doing assembly. So, and then I l left the Bay Area um, to Oregon. There are some CMs, but they are very expensive. So um, in about a year, I spent so much money on CM because I do it, w did it locally as I would spend on a full pick and place machine line myself. So basically the decision was, what do we do? And we decided to get a pick and place machine. And um, I, I started doing the assembly that way because of just the economy of the quantity we are producing because it is in this band above 10 <laughs> and below 1,000 where um, the spin up costs and like the complexities of do I buy a plane ticket to go to Shenzhen to do it there? Uh, does it make sense? It's like in many cases it does. And in many cases, if you have those contacts developed, it makes sense. So um, in now it is like grandfathered in in a certain way. So the machine has to work for itself. <laughs> so it has to earn money for itself. And so we keep doing that. Feed I'm not the sure. Machine. Hmm? Feed the machine. Yeah, feed the machine. And this is the question. Do you... Do you, when do you make the cutoffs at the quantities that you need? It's like, for example, uh, Icebreaker, we, we, did, um, we are still in the middle of fulfilling that uh, crowdfunding campaign. And so uh, there's a ton of very simple PMODs that plug in into it. 
this is something I ended up ordering from China because it's simple. I don't have to like be too scared that I get something that won't work exactly how I need it. So I did make that there because that worked out. But the icebreakers, for example, I have parts that I would have to ship across borders several times and deal with customs, delays, and, and payments. So I, doing it myself in my shop where I know how the machine is set up. I can control all the parameters of doing the assembly and having the full vertical integration really pays off. Mm -hmm. So Mir, you mentioned that you're based in, in the US. Um, you know, we're diving into geopolitics now a little bit, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know. The, Tariffs have been good for us, yeah. yeah right, right. <laughs> um, do, do you, do, what do you foresee you know, at, at a you know, coarser time scale? So I'll just give everyone a really brief overview of the industry at large. In 2008, there was over 2,000 quick turn printed circuit board shops here in the United States. Today, a decade later roughly, there's about 135. So a 95% reduction in the supply, yet the demand is at minimum two times higher because of things like IoT and just the general idea of democratized hardware. People are designing more, more people are designing more, et cetera. So how does that make sense in any sort of economics like structure? A large part of that can, of course, be attributed to China. But the other thing is also the hardware people are designing is more and more complex. And yeah, there's a whole military aspect to that. Fine, there's one portion of that that you cannot go overseas. But even people that are designing, they're looking for high quality and they're looking for speed. And the price they're looking for is fair. And that is really the market that has shown to be the most sustained. And that's what's really kept a lot of the US guys in business. And then of course, going to the more high end stuff, which a lot of people here are designing in larger quantities. Like people are designing FPGA type boards without having some crazy advanced degree and they're putting really, really tight PGAs on their board that may need to be four or six layers or eight layers with tight buried and blind vias, kind of kind of things like that. So they're choosing to go to a US manufacturer because you have to, if you have to spend a couple thousand dollars, it's generally better to do it with somebody that you know where they're located, you can talk to the support and things like that. And then you have people like Osh Park, which is probably the best resource that's come out of the United States for that market that people are like, oh, I'll go to China. Because if you actually add up all the spec, what Osh Park gives you versus what like a JLC PCB gives you, like high TG, Enig finish, getting your boards in like a week, and the customer service and support, et cetera, it's actually far cheaper. So I really encourage people to actually do that comparison, but it's a whole different than when you compare apples and apples. So both of you guys, though, you really aren't necessarily at the, the far extremes from each other, right? I mean, your mm -hmm. pick-and-place machine was probably still pretty expensive, right? I so have thoughts on, a lot of thoughts on that. I think you're doing it wrong, but <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the, the, the stuff that you're doing, you know, you're doing a lot of volume, but your real focus here is like, is like quick turn and speed. Quick turn, low volume per order, but the overall volume of boards that we do is quite high. Right. But the, the order volume on these are like one so, to ten. So why do we have 135 folks doing that when we should have 135,000? Right. Right. So where is the rep wrap um, so for pick and place, right? So we've seen no, no. Uh, the 3D printing started to take off now. Mm -hmm. um, but that started with the, you know, the movement of rep wrap and building the demand for the <laughs> users to, to reproduce their own yeah. machines, right? Why aren't we reproducing our own electronics in the same way? So CMs, there are thousands in the US. Board shops, I'm saying there's a low amount because the run and assembly shop is easy. And that's, that's the other thing. A contract manufacturer is one of the worst businesses that you can go into if you're trying to do any sort of scale. They're like sub 5% net margin. The only way a CM makes money, and this is especially good for people that don't do any sort of volume, is they make their profit not on the pick and place because how much can they possibly charge you? Or how much are you willing to pay for someone to place a resistor on a board? Probably not that much. It's on the order of cents, maybe low double digit cents. So the only way a CM makes profit in their business is on the markup on the bare board that they outsource. So they come to us and they strangle us and try to get boards for 200 bucks and then they add a 600 markup that then gets put to the end customer. That's the profit for their business. So that's, it, doing it at scale doesn't really work, but there's thousands of these guys that have 30 employees, sub $5 million businesses that do that. But at scale, it's a whole different, different ballgame. Doing the quick turn stuff is one thing that very few shops do. We've we've seen some some really kind of 
uh, I don't, I don't want to disparage anyone too much, but the, 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 some efforts to actually do manufacturing of PCBs, right, at the individual level, right? So not just, not just doing the assembly, but actually doing either milling. I mean, we see a lot of use of laser cutters, you know, a lot of other technologies where people are building up PCBs in their own. Um, some of the uglier ones, right, include, you know, um, squirting ink, you know, right, conductive ink. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So you could... So, so no, it's, yeah, not yet. Yeah. This is kind of your, your wheelhouse, I feel like. Machines, uh, you know, Jason asked uh, about the rep wrap of PCB and boards. Yeah. What's uh, up there? A uh, long time ago, I designed, together with Jonathan Ward, a milling machine that was makeable on another milling machine to mill circuit boards. And the idea there was to make crappy circuit boards in 10 minutes rather than semi crappy for circuit boards in 12 hours or whatever the fastest turnaround you can get now is. And there I think it was largely a failure because even though, and that's really informed my ideas about what's possible for open source hardware, because even though we documented that project to the extent that we thought was necessary for someone to replicate it, people didn't actually replicate it because the amount of tacit knowledge that we already had and were able to invest into the machine building process was far higher than someone who's like reading through a description on the internet and assembling and milling parts and assembling them. And so what for for hardware in electronics, there are actually a lot of really explicit things like boards are 1.7 millimeters or boards are 3.2 millimeters. Like there's all these really explicit requirements that everyone agrees on. But as soon as you start manufacturing other things like machines, there's suddenly a lot of things that people don't agree on. Um, RepRap is interesting because there, the thing that they seem to agree on is you have to make explicit the things that you can't make yourself. So the idea is you should be able to make as much as you can as possible. Uh, as much as possible of a rep rep and everything else is a vitamin like the things that your body can't synthesize you have to eat um, so the mechanical vitamins of a rep rep are things that you have to buy uh, and that and that I think is not something that uh, um, is really well understood yet like what are the things that we can make and what are the things that we have to buy and if we buy things um, how do you do quality control in low volume uh, for that kind of process how do you do quality control at all when you're not um, when you're not uh, when you're not doing probabilistic quality control so so is, is it, was it an issue of you needed be better if you had better documentation do you think people would replicate it or do you think that even if perfect well, documentation I think that basically by the time you had enough skill this is my read on it was by the time you had enough skill to be able to mill assemble make the controller board um, like connect everything, run the software. Uh, you had enough experience with all of those processes that you probably wanted to design your own machine or you wanted mm -hmm. to be able to, to make it slightly different um, to better accommodate whatever the thing is that you were trying to automate. And so the, the direction that we went in after that was instead of making these like simple machines that people could replicate, we were interested in making infrastructure to make it easy to automate other arbitrary things. So. How do, you, uh, how do you make controllers that are extensible and reconfigurable? How do you make mechanical modules that are extensible and reconfigurable? I got yelled at by a lot of mechanical engineers. They're like, every time you introduce a connection, there's a point of failure, uh, which is true. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's kind of the same argument that they made about packet switching networks and like, let's see who right. won that one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You should see how many connections there are in this pick and place machine I have. It's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so like the, the wire harnesses go from like the power driver board over five connections and connectors until they end up in the motor. It's crazy. Uh, it's a quad. It's uh, it's was bought later by by Tyco, yeah. and then now it's there is only a company in uh, some in Massachusetts that uh, it's PPM. Uh, precision placing the machines, they yeah. buy old machines, refurbish them, rebuild them, and put new computers in them. Yeah. And this is the machine I have. And uh, this is, uh, this brings me like a little bit, this is apropos, because this came up like 15 times when I was here. At, um, and I see that on Twitter, that question so many times. Do you, d yeah, <laughs> the, the people are already <laughs> laughing because I complain <laughs> about it. Um, so. Uh, people are asking, it's like, do you like measure all the parts every time you pick them up, or do you just rely that it will pick up it uh, uh, accurately enough and not scan it at all? This is a misconception generated by OpenPNP and Neoden machines and all the cheap machines because they don't have any sensor that when you pick up the part, it uh, it 
either you, you are very slow and go to the upward looking camera and measure it and then place it, or you just pick it up and just hope for the best, which is a terrible idea. No proper machine does that. They have some way of scanning the parts always. So they have something either on the head, like my machine has like a beam that shines and makes a shadow that you can measure where it is on the nozzle, or you have a camera that can look sideways on the part, or you scan the, the part in flight when you fly over, you don't stop. You, the vision is fast enough. Mm -hmm. We have the tools. Open PMP, I think, could do that if they really knew that this is actually an issue. And I think this is a misconception in the so DIY machines. Oh, it's also an architectural problem, right? There's, yeah. There's state, in, there's state in the machine. So you have, if you want to do any kind of feedback loop through computer vision, you have to understand what's, you have to stop the machine while it's moving somewhere. And by nature of how G-code and machines work, yeah. you don't know where it's going. Yeah, it's so you fun. have to have like a stupid way in which instead of having like a nice hierarchy of how um, process calls are being made, you're constantly going all the way up and down the stack, which is dumb, which is why maybe open source people are like, yeah, maybe we should wait for that. So, so <laughs> I hey. think it's understandable. <laughs> so Nadia, you, you, you brought up, we'll have plenty of opportunity to talk about that. Uh, uh, Nadia, you brought up failure analysis. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, I watched your video about the Steam controller and the machines that test other machines. It was... Uh, it was it was like machines hugging each other or like <laughs> being sensual with each other. Tell us about uh, your design, <laughs> your your, uh, your production uh, line. Uh, so uh, when I worked at Valve, uh, we built this enormously spatially large and also very complex automated assembly line. And uh, to my knowledge, you know, one of the it was in the U.S., yeah. So, so within the U.S., I, I, I'm pretty sure this was unprecedented at the scale that we did it. Uh, and that, yeah, there were machines that tested products. The machines weren't testing each other, but they were testing <laughs> products. Uh, and it was an interesting experience because automation, uh, automation gets talked about a lot. Uh, and I think there's a lot of interest in automation, you know, particularly within the U.S. as a way of doing cost-effective uh, manufacture. Uh, and I think automation is very interesting. Automation has a lot of trade-offs, and there are pros and cons to automation. And one of the things that you run into is that uh, unlike, uh, unlike robots, humans are very perceptive. Uh, they're very flexible. They're very reprogrammable. Uh, and they see things. Uh, you can have a, a jam in a machine somewhere, and a human operator might walk up, and they hear the noise that the machine's making because there's a part jammed, and they're like, oh, I need to fix the jam, and you sort of just flick it, and you know the line kind of continues on. Uh, robots are really bad at doing that, and I'm sure that there are groups, uh, companies that are trying to solve a lot of these problems, but uh, especially when it comes to things like... Uh, uh, like surface finish, like cosmetics. Uh, machines are not super great at doing cosmetic inspection, especially if the range of issues is not super well known. Uh, if you know what the issues are, then yeah, robots are great. Computer vision is great. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that it was, it was an inter interesting uh, experience in trying to figure out what the right level of automation was and like what robots are good at doing. Uh, they're good at doing things very repeatedly. Uh, uh, doing the same thing over and over and doing it very fast. Uh, but it's w when you have a new, sort of when you're designing an automation line, you may not know the types of failures that you're likely to encounter. And that's kind of hard to anticipate. Like if you haven't ever built that type of product before, how do you anticipate all the possible failure modes and build robots that will exercise all those failure modes? So uh, that was certainly something that was interesting. And there was actually a, uh, an episode of the Amp Hour, uh, and I, I think it was Chris, was it Chrissy Meyer? Uh, so Chrissy Meyer was uh, on an episode of the Amp Hour and talked about issues that she encountered during her career at Apple and, and other manufacturers, and so much of it hit home um, because uh, she mentioned that uh, like wet processes are sort of your worst nightmare in manufacturing. Like anything that uses glue, like consumables in general are hard, but anything that uses liquids uh, is incredibly challenging, and that, that's something that I think is sort of unique. Uh, that uh, until you've been there, you don't know how painful that is, but that was also a, kind of an interesting 
lesson learned. If I could go back in time, I would make a lot of very, very different decisions uh, because of how challenging it is uh, to like dispense fluids properly and, and do things like that time and time again. Uh, and, and you know, those are sort of the things that you, you, you learn by being there and actually designing those systems, right? You might change how you do that the next way around. I mean, we've, we've, we talked a little bit about those, those vitamins, right? So the, the, the vitamins we can, I, I feel like that's a more solvable problem in a lot of ways than the individual democratization of manufacturing because if, if you know what the vitamins are in the semiconductor world, we've kind of, it's very wet process and we've kind of figured it out, right? I mean, when you make millions and millions and millions a day, right, you see all the errors. You talked about you have to see the errors to find them. We've seen a lot of them, right? You do the process variations, you test at the corners, right? You have the machines to test for all the types of failure modes that you would, um, you know, that you've encountered over years and years of an iterative, you know, process step improvements. But if in order to kind of leverage that scale of manufacturing, you've got to make um, millions of them in order to, to, to leverage it, right? So we, we, we've, that vitamin, right? Um, but figuring out what that right vitamin is so that it really democratizes things, I think is a real challenge for it. And I think we're, we're wrong if we kind of punt on that, that problem um, um, and don't um, try to enable individuals to have the same access to manufacturing that we do. But I think a very good example is uh, uh, Prusa, for example. It's like, uh, oh, the, the 3D printers is a very good example of the democratization, in my opinion, because so far I still don't have a 3D printer because I hear too many horror stories. But now if friends are getting the current Prusas. They just work out of the box. So they produced enough of them. They had enough users use them, find all the corner cases, and they adapted the design many, 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 many times until the Prusas became reliable machines. You probably know better about this kind of mach machines that are for I users. Think, I think that, that te <laughs> <laughs> testing and tuning is, a, is an important component of it. I don't know, I'm kind of reminded now of, I was on another panel uh, at the White House, the previous administration, <laughs> but yeah. and there, the whole idea of the panel was like the, the White House had heard about this thing called the maker movement. They're like, ooh, makers, what are makers gonna do? And we want makers to grow up to be manufacturers. And, and I was a little bit contrary on the panel because I was like, manufacturing is fundamentally super broken. Like we have to offset the spin up costs with this giant economy of scale. So unless you make a million of something, you can't make money off of it because doing the first thing the first time takes all of this time where you're constantly banging your head against all these problems that you're encountering and maybe there's a way that you can test for it you like you have tests that you can run to make sure that things aren't going to fail uh in in certain ways but i think that there there's just something really wrong with how we make currently manufacture things. being able to do tuning and constant testing um as you're doing the production or being able to do simulation you know civil engineers don't do a bunch of tests first <laughs> they just build bridge <laughs> Uh, and so being able to do simulation and tuning and testing along the way are things, I think, that really need to be built into the infrastructure that's um, internal to manufacturing. And before that changes, a lot of these other things can. And, and the benefit that Prusa has had is because so much of their tooling and so much of their process is tools that they've developed themselves in-house, they can build all of that, like, software-inspired unit testing into their production line, and that allows for reliability to come even from a relatively low-volume product. I think they're also making a product that people want, and I think you that- guys, I think we should make Steve say something. <laughs> re re real quick, I, I have very strong opinions about desktop milling machines for PCB manufacture, and I, I have a bit of experience. I haven't used them all. It, Unlike 3D printing, that's an area that I don't know makes sense. And I'm actually curious to hear other people's thoughts about that because uh, it seems like with Osh Park, uh, with uh, overnight PCB fabrication, which is it's still quite expensive, uh, but is available, like widely available, I don't know what the situations are where it would make sense for someone to be milling PCBs at home. And I've seen a number of products in that area, uh, you know, both fairly inexpensive, kind of targeted at makers, as well as really, really expensive high performance machines that are kind of targeted at larger corporations. And I think 10 years ago, it was super different. Like 
I don't know if anyone remembers Batch PCB. Like, th it was not fast, right? It was faster than some of the alternatives, but it wasn't really fast. I think now that you can get a PCB within two weeks, uh, rather than kind of mess around with my home PCB mill or my semi or even professional grade PCB mill, uh, it's much better for me to be doing design or ordering parts or you know going outside. <laughs> I don't know, doing something else. So it's not really clear to me what niche that fills. Whereas 3D printing, I think, is the total opposite. Like 3D printing is awesome, and you can do a bunch of stuff, and it totally makes sense. And those parts are directly usable. Like PCB mills, a lot of times, I think I'm not really aware of a PCB mill that has a good through hole process. And like that's like so fundamental. Double sided is a challenge too. And trace and space, they tend to be pretty chunky. And the world is not at chunky anymore. You're doing surface mount. You're doing 0.3 millimeter pitch. You're doing BGAs. Like the, the PCB mill, mill industry, and, and again, I don't want to discredit the guys that are trying really hard to make that work. I just don't understand how that makes sense. So why would I ever 3D print anything when I can just go online and order it and have it shipped to me overnight anyway? So why would I 3D print anything? Because it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, maybe that's why people use PCB mills, right? That's not so, fun. I've so, done it. It's not fun. <laughs> so if you seriously want to ask, ask the audience, we should do it before we tip the, uh, the discussion any further in one particular direction. But like, who here thinks that PCB mills are good for prototyping? There's a few. And who here uh, thinks that PCB mills are not good for prototyping? Uh, more. <laughs> cool. Uh, so I, I don't think they're any good for prototyping, but I, I thought that 10 years ago. <laughs> so for 15 years, for example, whenever anyone says, hey, should we get a PCB mill? I've said, uh, really? Uh, but I also, uh, so, so one, of the, one of the observations I made is, a lot, of, a lot of people that I work with, I work for Microsoft, right? So uh, they come from a software background. And with software, you design your product. And when you design your product, when, what do you need to do? You need to make copies of it and distribute them. And with software, that's actually quite easy. I mean, it's not trivial, but, uh, but it is relatively easy. You make a copy, and guess what? You know, well, you can check to see if it's perfect or not. It probably was, but maybe you just double check. And if it's not, you can start over again, and you've got a perfect copy. And this replication challenge we have with hardware it doesn't matter how much you spend. You need a whole process which is customized for each piece of hardware, typically. And, and, and no matter how much you invest in that, when you then make a copy, guess what? It's not the same. It's not identical. So it depends on, on the, you know, it's different for different aspects of hardware. And I think in the case of bare PCBs, uh, I, don't, I don't normally worry. I get my, I, you know, I check the box if, if, if it's even an option these days. Usually it's default, right? I, I get my board, bare board tested. But like, I'm going to assume it's a, a pretty good, render of my, you know, my Altium file or my Gerber file. So I'm not worried about the replication of PCBs. I don't use a mill. I'm, I'm shipping the stuff out. And then when it comes to PCB assembly, well, there's still, you know, my board doesn't work. Well, maybe it was misassembled. Maybe there's a solder bridge somewhere. But I'm also reasonably confident about PCB assembly. So we talked a lot about PCB bareboard manufacturing assembly. But for me, they're not really the bottleneck anymore. So if you look at, and for, you know, for products like a lot of the crowd supply products, well, that is the main manufacturing process, right? So and I think that's what enables uh, some of these products to, to be viable in lower volumes because that technology is reasonably you know, well understood now and, and it scales. I think PCB, uh, bareboard manufacturing, PCB assembly kind of scales. Now, obviously, if you make more of them, you get more economies of scale. The, per unit, the unit price comes down. But it doesn't stop most of us um, Maybe the few people, who, you know, people using mills don't do this, but most of us would use the same fundamental process for building our first prototype that Apple used in however many tens of millions of iPhones they make every month. So, so I feel like that scales. Uh, for me, you know, the, the bottleneck might be elsewhere. And so uh, I think enclosures is a big deal. And we talked about 3D printing, and I have to confess, I'm probably not up to speed with the latest developments in 3D printing. But certainly until recently, even 3D printing, you, you know, it's great for prototyping, but it wouldn't necessarily, depends on what the product is, I wouldn't ship a product because the finish might not be good enough, the material qualities might not be suitable, right? I might not be able to get the wall th thickness I want or it might just not be strong enough. So I think that that is slowly changing for, for 3D printing, but I think that, that's a, you know, a plastic type enclosure for, for me is a challenge because like, I, you know, when you get to 10,000 pieces a year, you can afford the, in, you know, the injection molded tooling probably, but when you're just thinking about your first thousand units, so you can make them out of wood, right? You can, uh, and, and you know, you can laser, you can, uh, you can, sure. Uh, I mean, milling, I, I, I think this is all really interesting. Like what kind of, uh, 
for what kind of products do you think milling is cost effective? Yeah, I guess if you're milling wood and plastic, it's pretty fast, right? iPhone. <laughs> and all those Mac computers, they're milled. Yeah, yeah, like a huge volume, absolutely. Yeah, but they're CNC milled. Yes. So the I want to hear you. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I, in defense of milling machines, I guess PCB, uh, PCB oh, mills. I was talking about PCB mills, right? Yeah, Not yeah. milling machines full stop. Well, I think that there, there's a, a misnomer. Maybe if the workflow that everyone is familiar with is that the, the mill is being used to mill PCB boards, then uh, then you're like, okay, this is actually not a very good way of making PCBs, and that's been well established by the market. But milling as a way of making things um, allows you to do things with high accuracy, high repeatability, and once you have the vocabulary of milling, anything, including PCB, you can also start milling other stuff. So if you wanted to make a gigantic heat sink or if you wanted to make a enclosure, imagine if you wanted your enclosure to be transparent. Uh, no thanks, 3D printing. <laughs> so I guess the, that there, um, part of the argument that I would make is understanding how you make stuff, including how do I buy stuff that I'm going to be putting on the thing that I'm making. How do I order something? Actually, ordering PCBs might be like very obvious to everyone here, but I teach undergraduates electronics, and that's like a pretty scare, like if there's money involved, you know, making them say, telling them, why don't you just like make a board that you can put this one transistor on and also like a power connector, and you can make it on this mill now. Then you start, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like a, um, how do, you, how do you scaffold learning in that regard? And how do you get people to make more stuff um, more quickly and, and then build confidence so that more people engage in the diversity of production? Okay. I, I would like also to defend the PCB mills uh, <laughs> in a very specific, really tiny niche. It's like uh, Joe Fitz, you might know him, Security Fitz, his class is doing uh, security for in hardware. You need one adapter board for this specific thing today, now, in half an hour. That's a perfect application of a PCB mill. It's you don't want to wait a week or even a day for that part to come here that you ordered from a PCB manufacturer. That's, but they, they are very, or, or that. I, I, I think we discovered the Emacs versus Vim uh, of, of hardware. Um, I, I would like to say that it, it I think my argument is that PCB mills for as part of product development, especially beyond early, early, early stage, probably doesn't make sense in my opinion. I, I, I don't that. disagree that as a vehicle for education, I definitely see opportunity there. And as a vehicle for doing kind of one-off, th there definitely is a niche. I've designed antennas. I've used PCB mills to do antenna prototyping. That's definitely a niche that there are machines that are designed to kind of fulfill that niche. Um, but yeah, as a when you have to modify your design to kind of work with the capabilities of the machine, that gets old really fast, and that's been my experience. Yeah. Okay. I agree on that. <laughs> Mayor and Jason, you both talked about growth and uh, you know the, the the lack of supply and the growing demand. How does that how does that work? You mentioned twenty five percent year over year growth in sales in in Pocket Beagle. Earlier, I don't remember which. I think I think it was the previous panel. Maybe um, uh, we discussed how Linux, you know, embedded Linux, which of course is kind of pioneered by, by Pocket Beagle in a way, um, or uh, by BeagleBoard, uh, is, is about to make a breakthrough. Um, is, that, is that going to affect your business? And, and how do you get your stuff manufactured right now? Uh, I mean, for, for us, I mean, we, we have manufacturing partners, and, and the, the, the hardware is kind of the easiest thing um, for us. I mean, all that we're complaining about all this hardware, I mean, the, the hardware is easy. Um, the hard part, and our bottleneck's innovation is, is software and collaboration with our community, all right? If I could put, like, if I could put one version one in, you know, 100,000 people's hands, and they can find all the issues, and then just all of a sudden hit reprint, and they'd have version two, Right, and and we you know we found all the bugs, and that would be great. But right, trying to find a rollout process for 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 a new platform where you're like you you want to get into the right people's hands to find the issues, and then spin, and then a few more people at software. And it's always the software development that is is our uh, barrier to to new product introduction. 
Um, so um, and and trying to to solve more more problems for for people. So we would um, we'd be spinning boards every week if um, if it wasn't for uh, software. So how many? Uh, when's your next board coming out? Do you have a what's the next version? So we have we're working on BeagleBone AI right now. So we've got um, you know a bunch of boards that we we've, we've built and we're we're you know we're giving them to try to give those to people right now for alpha testing and getting feedback on those. We're Probably going to launch in about September. Um, we've had boards since November, um, so we'll probably been um, ten months of having um, the boards before we actually start shipping them in, in volumes. So I'll look. For, so I'll look for those files in my email for us to build. <laughs> <laughs> so we can get the the nice AR video yeah. going for that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> was your question more on like so what's stalling growth in manufacturing? Or was it? I, I guess where's the growth coming from, and and is is embedded Linux going to have an effect there uh, that would impact your company? Yeah, ultimately, I think all those things. Anything that allows people to create more and democratizes hardware even further, yeah, totally, has a huge impact. IoT has been massive. And also the amount of venture capital money going into these kind of startups and going into these kind of ventures is insane in San Francisco and LA and New York and all these other cities. And we're kind of tapped into that. And you see these startups with like $100 million funding for sensor companies and this and that, and that a huge chunk of that is going towards hardware and quick, quick iteration, where your time is way more valuable than waiting even three days for boards. So that's where a huge source of growth and okay, orders. Qu quick poll of our panelists. How long is the w term IoT going to be around for? <laughs> yeah, I keep it. Oh, wrong question, because I thought we were going to talk about AI. <laughs> uh, maybe too long? <laughs> I don't use it. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> it's going to be a term like IPv6. <laughs> All right, thanks. I think it's going to be around for a while, the term, yeah. It doesn't mean it's quite vacuous, right? Yeah, so it's just a generic. It, yeah. I don't know if that's good or bad. Is that good or bad? We have things, we like our things to talk, right? So they talk to us, they talk to the network, you know, preferably a network, because I don't want to hear my things talking to me anymore. They need to shut up. Okay, right, let's open up uh, the floor to the audience. I don't even know how much time we have, but uh, first question. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a semi-retired double E and uh, new to Portland and interested in how a person with RF and uh, microwave experience might contribute to this chain. So I'm an RF and microwave engineer. <laughs> uh, at least I started my career there. Uh, I think RF continues to be something that a lot of people consider black magic. And so there's always a need for people that understand that. Um, particularly if you look at the number of 2.4 gigahertz devices that are operating in the ISM band, there's so much out there. And I think still RF is not well understood by most of the people that are using it. Uh, I've seen a, a lot of, there's a lot of pitfalls that product teams fall into. Um, you think about like antenna placement and sort of how industrial design relates to opportunities for antenna placement and even just fundamental sort of the, the, I suspect that the vast majority of companies and product development teams that are putting 2.4 gigahertz radios into their products have never done a link budget. And that's a very, 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 very bad idea, particularly if you're going to ship a lot of something and it's very hard to make changes, and it usually is. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity. RF, uh, I remember when I was in, in grad school, uh, we were worried that hardware RF was going away. It was all, all, all going to be software-defined radios. It was all going to be software. So why do we need any RF people? Uh, and that was 20 years ago. And we still need RF people. In fact, I think we need them more because every product has RF. Uh, and I think there's a, a tremendous opportunity, especially antenna design is especially still black art, uh, black magic. Uh, there are very few people that are comfortable working around antennas. I'd say the vast majority of antennas that are implemented are implemented incorrectly or poorly or in a way that is hampering performance. You know, you see a lot of products that uh, they, like that, that kind of customer perception that RF is flaky <laughs> is because the engineers didn't do a good job designing those products. And of course, these products operate in really hostile environments too. So I, I think that uh, my experience has been that 
having RF, having an RF background is very helpful to fall back on because there's always going to be some like late game crisis in the RF space, and there's a need, an ever present need for people that can solve those problems. So I, it I think there is uh, not enough. So what is actually like enabling and like fueling? Uh, a lot of these things that we are making it's uh, are more designs that use certain technologies and are shared and are documented and are written about and there are videos about it there are more slowly like channels on youtube coming up of actual people that really know they, what they're doing making videos about what they really know about and sharing it and putting it in formats that are not old dusty books that people are having trouble parsing. And that books that require a lot of background to even parse these content of those books. Especially I think RF uh, contains a lot of really hard physics background that is necessary and bringing that easier to people that might not have that background. I, it's like, I'm a software engineer. I shouldn't be doing any of this. So I learned pretty much everything from wonderful people that shared their knowledge in form of objects and blog posts and videos. And the more of that, the more the community gets better at this. And then the design, because of the democratization, this is what I think you are talking to. It's like we have tons of the IoT devices <laughs> that have RF in them, and people are just copying someone else's design that's the best they can do. And it's still badly placed. It has like a backplane in there or something. It just doesn't work right. It, it works well enough that on the bench it works, and that's it. I think you could you could start by going to some of your local hacker spaces, maker spaces, and teach them how to use the basic tools for getting some visualization, network analyzers, you know, near field probes, and just get some some idea to actually build some visualizations. And talking about um, uh, you know certification processes, right? The the FCC, CE testing stuff doesn't have to be that complicated, but it's a huge barrier for for a lot of us, and a lot of us have don't know how to approach that. So if you have a little bit of regulatory, you know, look at the stuff that's needed, um, then walk, helping to walk people through some of those processes would be tremendously valued because otherwise they're going to spend way too much money and not be ready for it when they're there. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, I became kind of the lead regulatory compliance guy uh, at Valve because I was the RF guy. It's just there's tons of overlap there. And the ability to go to a lab where product's being tested and kind of call BS and say, yeah, you know, what, you guys are testing it wrong or these results don't make sense. The ability to, to sort of understand how those tests work and how they're conceived. Um, I think there's a huge amount of overlap between regulatory compliance and RF design. Uh, and if you have the RF side, I think it's pretty easy to kind of start reading the, the rules and understanding the regulatory side. Next question. <laughs> One more. Yeah. And Jason's wrong. <laughs> Oh, Jeff, you mentioned uh, that the, that RF is uh, seen as perceived as flaky by consumers or even other engineers is actually a misconception. Can anyone think of any other common misconceptions in, about the engineering discipline that, where the people have just come up with the wrong understanding because of a bad practice? <laughs> no. I can I can <laughs> give I can elaborate and if yeah. I mean, at least as far as what it takes to manufacture a PCV, that's probably one of the biggest things that nobody really learns in school. And people don't realize that even a two-layer board goes through like over 90% of the same processes as a 10-layer board with crazy, crazy stuff going on. It still has to touch over 20 individual people, go through all these expensive machines, wet processes, and that's time being taken away from other orders, and that everybody wants it for free. And there's like huge costs associated with this, especially when you're in like, the US, but that's why you kind of offset that with different quality and, and things like that. And you wonder how can China do it so cheap? And I mean, it has to do with subsidies and labor costs and quality and things like that. But just how much complexity and money and capital intensiveness goes into running a printed circuit board manufacturing shop is crazy. I mean, one of our, we just bought a new laser two weeks ago, it was $1.2 million just for a laser. We have seven of them. And drill machines are over $600,000 a piece. And it's just like how much money and time and effort goes into making even something as simple as a quick two-layer board and 
that's why people like Osh Park and these guys exist who can kind of amortize the cost over a group of people on like a panel. But knowing the complexity that actually went into it is pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Um, I actually have two examples that are not so customer facing as within engineering that are, I think, misconceptions. And I think one is that a lot of people think regulatory compliance is bad, right? It's, it's overhead. Um, I think that it is true that there's a lot of red tape, but I also think that there's a lot about regulatory compliance that actually results in you making a better product, like especially a lot of the European requirements, like CE has product safety requirements that you know are pretty generic, but are well-intentioned certainly, and I think that as an engineer, you have kind of a responsibility to make a safe product. Um, similarly, a lot of the electromagnetic compatibility stuff, like ESD, uh, the requirement is that your product survives ESD. That's that's important. <laughs> that's actually good to make products that survive ESD uh, because it, a lot of times the goal uh, to pass is that the product works as intended and that's really good. Um, the other misconception that maybe this is my misconception or maybe it's a misconception in the industry but when I started the industry quality like quality was always seen as kind of like oh man I've got to fill out all this paperwork and I've got to do a PFMEA and all this stuff for quality. Um, I used to think that until I was sort of responsible for shipping a high quality product <laughs> and all of a sudden I cared a lot uh, care and suddenly cared a lot about how you enforce quality and how you get manufacturers to consistently make things of a very high quality and suddenly you you I went from sort of dreading and, and maybe not thinking that was something it was really how I wanted to spend my time to something that I spent time on and I became very passionate about because I realized that it was valuable and it took me a while to kind of come around to that, but eventually I did. Yeah, I, to this point, I think what um, is missing in our, com especially in talking about this like crowd supply, small manufacturers, small groups, uh, uh, communities, we are still lacking a lot of tools in that realm. It's like, uh, do you have like a 10,000 volt like, zapper for to check your boards that they survive it? Do you have an uh, anaconic chamber? Do you have a, a Faraday cage to a do RF testing? Hmm? A three-year-old. Yeah. Very good, yeah, quality <laughs> tester, for sure. Not everyone has those. Um, <laughs> Right, <laughs> but yeah, but we are slowly getting those tools. Actually, it's like we have the um, um, the some of the like uh, uh, current uh, use tools and uh, uh, tools like uh, HackRF are helpful, and we need to focus more on using those tools and describing how to use them to do the and. People like you should write about this and share it with the people that don't have the background. So Steve or not yet? Yeah. I think that uh, something to be taken into consideration for how things get made is that there's this concept, it's like Fordist concept that y you have a task and you break it into small subtasks. People do those subtasks efficiently and a project manager sticks everything together and then you have like a good product. But there's high interrelation between all of the processes and through the whole network of assembled ad hoc actors, there's risk and risk is born by different people more severely. Like you don't really, he you sometimes hear about like Frank Gehry getting sued over a design, but you much more often hear about some subcontractor that didn't get paid because their whoever whoever ordered the parts from them like went bankrupt or some some horrible thing down the line where a bunch of people didn't make money, lost their jobs, and and risk is 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 unfairly borne by them. Um, and how do we, as people interested in manufacturing and maybe the future of manufacturing, understand how to fairly distribute? risk in a new kind of project network where we're dealing with crowdfunding, where people are funding the work, uh, the, the manufacturing from um, as a consumer, where you're dealing with people who are doing things in low volume, that so risk isn't amortized over high, high mass. So I think that the, the question of like, what are the aha things that, um, what are the aha things that people don't really think about? I think it's like almost every people don't understand almost anything and how do we make <laughs> how so do we make that better we're gonna have to end there uh, those are <laughs> good questions to think about thank you Nadia uh, right, thank, let's thank our panel okay there's uh, a talk in this room and in hammer uh, upstairs 
Um, I ran over a bit on time. Thanks for your patience and, uh, and for your questions. There's so many things I don't write this book about where we got to yeah. the manufacturing stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, serve around customer. Okay. So one announcement uh, while we're waiting. Um, Zach Archer's talk that was scheduled for Friday uh, has been uh, resurrected at 5 o'clock in Hammer, I believe. Um, what's that? Uh, it is the e-paper mega info dump. Yeah. Um, which was uh, added added to the schedule late, but uh, okay, um, ready? I can't detect the display. Hmm. Okay, let me get you a different laptop. Is is the screen on? What are you running? Uh, Windows. Do you have your um, presentation on Google Slides? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, this is a different one. Oh, it's, it's like a big ass thing you'll have to download over. Okay, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Megan, you were using this one before with this. Yeah, we had some new ones. Shoes are for coming down here, I think, for this. Okay. So, um,
Okay. What are you looking for? I just need the speaker notes oh. as well. Um, I have no idea. Oh, fuck. Okay. Um. <laughs> I lost the notes again. <laughs> All right, never mind. <laughs> we'll do it without the notes. <laughs> okay, this is exciting. Oh my God. Uh, closing down, tear down. Um, <clears throat> All right, hello everyone. Um, I'm Amitabh and I like to make stuff. Some of the stuff that I have made um, is a height sensor for elephants. The green thing that you see over there is a six and a half foot PCB. Uh, the final version was a 13-foot PCB that took me about a dozen movies to solder. Interesting experience. Um, I made Super Suit, which was kind of like laser tag for the 21st century. Um, I embedded sensors and lights into concrete, and of course, uh, I made a concrete soldering stand <laughs> for my soldering iron. But today, I'm here to talk about Programmable Air, which is an open source kit for controlling pneumatics for soft robotics and inflatable soft robots. What is soft robotics, you ask? <laughs> um, that's not it. Soft robotics is the field of robotics that deals with uh, making mechanisms out of highly flexible materials. And it's seeing growing applications in industrial automation and for prosthetics. I started Programmable Air in Carrie Love's soft robotics class. Carrie literally wrote the book on soft robotics. Uh, and for the final project, I wanted to make something like this. This is a crawling soft robot that came out of Harvard back in 2011. And I was like, wow, this thing moves so animated. And I just want to make something like this. And I started looking into it. Turns out it's pretty simple to make something like this. You can just 3D print a mold and pour in some silicone. And uh, yeah, you can make something for a 100 bucks, that's as good as something coming out of a top tier university. But it's controlling the soft robot that's very difficult. And these were kind of the only two controllers 
that I could find. And they're like designed by researchers for researchers, you know, thousand dollars, big, clunky, difficult to use. And so I decided I want to make something for hobbyists to control soft robots with. Uh, did some research, uh, you know, designed a circuit board, did some prototyping, and pretty quickly I had a working prototype. And, you know, I could inflate and deflate a balloon. So at this point, the engineer in my brain goes, good job, task done, let's move on to the next thing. But uh, where I saw just a balloon going, uh, you know, inflating and deflating here, my friend Kim saw a sculpture. Uh, this is Foxy Lovelace, a sculpture about female sexuality with accentuated lips, uh, which it does not allow you to touch. When you approach it, it blows a bubble. And then when you move away, it sucks the balloon back in. Uh, so I was like, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll explore some more. So it turns out, you know, pneumatics is pretty fun. You can make a pick and place machine pretty easily. Uh, so, it, you know, suddenly the speed of making boards went up by 50%. Um, you know, uh, pneumatics is counterintuitive as well. This tiny pump can lift me up. Just put a Ziploc bag under your feet and it'll just lift you up. Like it's insane gear ratio. Um, anything that has air becomes a sensor. So this is Mr. Piggy, generally a squeaky toy, but currently controlling these lights. And the cool thing is that it's very scalable. Like you can totally imagine this squeaky toy being replaced by a bouncy castle and suddenly the lights are in sync with your jumps, right? It's like, yeah, that's cool. I should share this with people. So I took it to Maker Fair where people seem to like it. I got some validation. The maker community seemed to like it as well. So I was like, yeah, uh, you know, excited. I was like, okay, open source all the way, write down all the documentation. I made the code super simple, like literally just blow, suck, vent, read pressure, and you can you know, start controlling your soft robots. Um, by the way, you guys, Dark theme on the Arduino. Get with the dark theme on the Arduino ID, please. <coughs> just like, ah, my eyes. OK. Uh, so uh, I documented it really well. And um, this was one of the happiest days of my life when I just typed programmable air into the Arduino list of managed libraries. And I was like, oh, wow, look at that. My thing is on Arduino. Um, and you know, I put a website up, uh, and I was like, all right, now people will start making their own programmable AI boards, and you know, they'll start making fun projects with it. But of course, things don't work like that. Turns out, if you want people to use your things, you have to sell it to them so that they can use it. So I started manufacturing this thing by hand in my tiny New York apartment, my nice little Black & Decker, which if you set to medium toast, then it bakes PCBs pretty well. <coughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> and pretty soon, programmable air was all over the map, literally, you know, uh, shipped it out all over the place. And importantly, people used it to make interesting projects. Enough interesting projects, in fact, that when I tried to put all of them in, Chrome crashed. Uh, so this is not even nearly all of them. And there's no way that in this talk I can do justice to all of them. So instead, I'm going to just give you a flavor of what some people have made using programmable air. Uh, Arnav, who's a friend of mine, made Flexo. Flexo um, are plug-and-play soft actuators for the VEX robotic system. And so with that, you can, for example, make this grabber. And it's going to pick up this thing and then move around a little bit and control by programmable air. Uh, you might have seen this hand uh, in the demo upstairs or on Twitter around, uh, also made with Flexo. This is Julia. She made uh, a silicone heart as a part of her ongoing artistic practice called Mechanics of Being Human. And she controls it, you know, the beating of the heart with just programmable air. Uh, Rashida made Birthday Cake 3000, uh, which is a birthday cake with some straws and edible gl glitter inside them. The entire cake is a capacitive touch sensor. So when you, so when you cut it, it sends out a little puff of air, and edible glitter just poof, out of the cake. <laughs> uh, the name 3000 is for the 3000 milliseconds of delay between you cutting the cake and the air coming out. Like, yeah, edible pneumatics, that's interesting. Um, LD made uh, an inflatable bra. Turns out 25% uh, women suffer from asymmetrical breasts, and uh, her project aims to make 
uh, a breast that's like adjustable so that it supports both breasts equally. Um, Aditya, who I couldn't find a photo of, makes origami. <laughs> he invented that uh, origami um, uh, Doctor Strange there. But uh, we worked together to make an origami gripper based on something uh, that came out of MIT Media Lab, uh, MIT C sale uh, in March of this year, and turns out like very easy to make something that can uh, that weighs only a couple grams but can lift a kilo of weight. Uh, so yeah, uh, these were some of the interesting projects that came out of. Now, if I had my speaker notes, I'd know what to say here. <coughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, so we know some of what is possible with programmable air. Let us now see how it works. Uh, pneumatics, as it turns out, pretty non-trivial and for some reason or the other, not yet embraced by the maker community. So um, it was a lot of like figuring out things as I was going. So um, how do you control uh, a soft robot? It has one line of tube going into it and you want to be able to push air in, pull air out, and you know, read the pressure and let it exchange air with the atmosphere as well. So this is kind of what I came up with. Um, you have a compressor, which is trying to push air in this direction. You have a vacuum pump, which is trying to pull air out of it. This is a valve that will allow air to pass in this direction. This is a valve that's closed, and it will block any passage of air. That's your soft robot, and that's a pressure sensor. Okay. So now let's say I want to push air into my soft robot. I can have this connection, and now this valve is open. This compressor is pushing air into my soft robot. Then if I want to pull air out of it, I can switch on this valve, close this one, and now my vacuum pump will pull out all the air. And then if I switch on this valve, I can let it freely exchange air with the atmosphere. And all the while, this pressure sensor that's always connected to my soft robot through a single tube is giving me feedback on where, uh, what the state of my actuator is, right? Um, and this is something that I like to call full channel air control. Um, it's not something that I've seen used anywhere else, so I kind of invented it, I guess. Uh, but I like to think of it as, as the base of, like, you know, the very base of um, m the most minimal thing that will allow you to do everything that you want to do with your soft robot. You cannot remove any of these components and have a fully functioning system. So for example, people have tried doing things with, with two-way valves and reduce the number of valves required. But then that doesn't allow you to be able to close all of these valves and completely switch off your system. Um, you cannot remove the pressure sensor, for example. Uh, if you remove this uh, atmospheric pressure valve, you lose the ability of compensating uh, for the changes in atmospheric pressure. With this, what you can do is, like in the beginning of your code, you just switch on this valve for a few seconds take a few air pressure readings. Everything is uh, based off of that uh, threshold pressure. And your code works the same whether you're in Portland or in New York or on the top of Mount Everest. Um, so this is programmable air. It's based on the same full air channel control. So you have these two pumps. They, pump, uh, uh, they can act as compressor or vacuum pump. So they pull in air from one end and then push air out of the other end. And then you have these three valves, and uh, they allow you to uh, control your soft robot. Um, so some interesting uh, design challenges came as I was designing uh, programmable air. These pumps, for example, uh, you might not have seen uh, them uh, you know, put on a, a circuit board like this ever before. Uh, and that's because they're not meant to be mounted like that. Um, and when I did mount them, they would tend to, the leads would just tend to vibrate and break off. So I was like, okay, I can put some hot glue below it and just glue it, glue it to the PCB. And that worked fine for a couple of months. Uh, but then the motor gets hot and eventually cures the uh, hot glue into a, a thick, dark brown material that's not sticky or uh, uh, vibration dampening at all. So now I'm using silicone. Um, I was like, pneumatics is difficult, you guys. Uh, Electronics themselves, uh, by itself, is difficult because you know when you're designing a system, you have to make sure that all of your components are rated for the same voltage values and the same current values. Pneumatics, especially electro-pneumatics, adds the fact that they have to support the same pressure range, the same flow rate, and then they have to same the, have the same nozzle size, right? 
and so try as I might, I couldn't find a, a way where some cheap components would fit in together with the same nozzle size. So for example, my pressure sensor had this really tiny nozzle and everything else had a bigger nozzle. So I was like, okay, I know Fusion 360. I'll design this adapter that goes on top of my valve and then my uh, thick uh, uh, tube will come in here and then a tiny tube at the bottom. I was like, so happy with myself. Yes, I designed this system. And uh, then I had a good night of sleep and then I realized this is what I should be doing, which is, <laughs> this is a little tube of, um, a, 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 of a different diameter that I just put on the pressure sensor that increases the thickness of the pressure sensor, then put in my tube and then just zip tie it. And <coughs> that works so much better and so much cheaper. <laughs> um, yeah, and I wanted it, uh, things to be just like, you know, good, easy for the user to use. For example, these buttons are color coded. There are a few buttons on the back as well, and they're all a different color. So that in the tutorials, I could just be like, press the red button instead of press button number two, right? And turns out there's just one factory in China that makes like uh, colored buttons that are this tiny, and I had to track them down, and they're giving me these buttons as a loose bag, right? Not on a tape and reel that I could feed into um, uh, in a pick and place machine. So paying extra for that, but you know, I think it's worth it. Uh, I think that not enough uh, uh, development boards, well, maybe now they do, uh, but a year uh, back, not enough development boards had some kind of user output. So I put some NeoPixels so that the user could, you know, just quickly see some feedback from their system. Um, and then, of course, things I thought were not hard enough already. So I made it harder on myself. So version 0.5 and 0.6 look pretty similar. But in 0.6, all the capacitors are oriented ver vertically and all the resistors are oriented horizontally. Did I need to do that? Not at all. I'm so happy that I did it. So much more elegant. Nobody knows the difference except for me. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I feel like all the engineering challenges have been solved and uh, Programmable Air is live on Crowd Supply as we speak. Um, and uh, you can go on the website and purchase it and it comes in this beautiful uh, foam case, which honestly I'm sometimes more proud of than I am. <laughs> Again, not my laptop. <laughs> uh, is which one? Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, this, this case took a lot of uh, late night WeChat conversations. Uh, but yeah, uh, and you can, you know, make some little soft robots with the kit. Um, but a great product is just that. Any open source project really depends on the community. So I've been taking workshops and just talking to people about how they can use pneumatics in their own projects. And uh, I've been writing tutorials. Um, on um, you know how to make some soft robots, uh, and I've been trying to work with uh, some other uh, organizations, open soft machines, for example, um, based out of University of Tokyo. They make these amazing recipes for uh, like uh, soft robots that you can make out of just polyethylene tubes and Ziploc bags, and uh, we've, we're working together to make you know programmable air, open source, uh, open soft machines kits. <coughs> no worries. <laughs> and then my friend Joe uh, from Protosauce invented uh, probably the most flexible 3D printing filament. And we are working together to make uh, a service where you can essentially design your soft robots and get them 3D printed directly to you uh, without ever having to do any assembly, touch silicone, or do anything else. So yeah, that's, that's uh, something to look forward to. Um, Last month, NASA tweeted this uh, this thing, they uh, about you know using soft robots for uh, exploring space, and I was like, whoa, yeah, that's great. You know, more people should get into soft robotics. And then when I looked into the blog, I saw this ridiculous mess of a thing, <laughs> that's like multi-thousand dollar equipment controlling this pretty simple soft robot. So I was like, no, you guys, do it this way. <laughs> so that's a very similar soft robot being controlled by programmable air. And uh, yeah, I hope that, uh, uh, I hope that uh, you know, more of you think about uh, soft robotics the next time you want to get some linear motion 
instead of thinking about a lead screw, think about a syringe. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, that's me. I'm all too happy to uh, learn more about your projects and uh, talk about how you can incorporate soft robotics in them. Uh, yeah, at this point, I'd uh, love for you to ask any questions if you have them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, like okay, so yeah, see, uh, this is one of the things that I totally forgot about um, mentioning because I didn't have my slides. Um, one of the big things that went into programmable air was mostly the whole of the project, the engineering design, was just cost reduction. So the pumps, for example, are pumps that are used in blood pressure cuffs and uh, um, breast milk pumps. And uh, they are, uh, because they're generally used in the medical industry, they're pretty high grade, and the rubbers, um, uh, and all the flexible material that's used in there is pretty uh, insensitive to um, chemical reactions. The valves that I'm using are used traditionally in Keurig machines, so they can handle uh, uh, water, they can handle steam, uh, they're pretty robust. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if you just hooked up a, a propane tank to it, that you'd be able to handle it. The pressure inside, I, I don't know about propane particularly, I know butane, the pressure isn't all that high. It's not much more than, uh, uh, n not much more than one atmosphere uh, over pressure. So you can, the valves can definitely handle it, yeah. And uh, I, I like the direction that you're thinking. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, uh, but I will not be legally liable for <laughs> anything you do with that. <laughs> Smart man. Uh, <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, here. I didn't get a chance to look at the API very closely. Uh, uh -huh. When you do the blow and suck, can you control like how strongly or is it just on a... Mm -hmm. So you can control the speed of the motors and uh, essentially uh, how, how, how quickly the motor is pushing air or pulling in air. The valves themselves are just on and off toggle valves and it takes about 20 milliseconds for them to, from, from you saying, you know, toggle to them doing the thing. Um, so you can't like PWM the valves and uh, uh, work that way. You can do, um, what you can do is, so pneumatics, Excuse me. The analogy of uh, electronics to pneumatics translates pretty easily. So a motor is essentially a battery or a pressure source. Uh, a tube of a particular diameter has a particular resistance. And any volume of air is essentially capacitance. So when you want to get, um, when you want to convert a PWM into an analog value, you use a capacitor, right? Um, same, similarly, if you wanted to get a particular pressure, just attach a Coke bottle to act as a capacitor and then just, uh, and then just switch on and off the valve to get a particular pressure output in the bottle. Yeah. I was just curious, so <clears throat> during your like, inventing process and figuring out how everything was gonna work, were there any resources you used as informational that you found really interesting, like maybe like scrolling through patent information that's available to try and find ideas in like niches and corners? Hmm. Or was it mostly just trial and error? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think back. This was almost a year back, so it's difficult. Mostly what I did was I, um, because the patent information uh, is great, um, and I did a lot of that, but it's, it doesn't translate at the end, it was just a race to reduce cost. I knew this thing was possible because there were products uh, that were doing that for $1,000. So for me, it was important to just tap into mass markets. So basically, most of it was just scrolling through uh, Alibaba and AliExpress and just you know being like, okay, this is this, and just ordering dozens of uh, pumps and valves and being like, does this work with that? How much pressure can it support? And these things don't really have data sheets. So it was like, you know, okay, I hooked this up to that and that leaks. So 
probably not compatible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, if there are any more questions, I think we can take them outside as well. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. That's the most important question. <laughs> yes, you have uh, three days, four days to act. Four days to act, you guys. Yeah. Buy it now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, without any further ado. Thank you. Um, we'll wait a minute for people to come in. Uh, come on in. <clears throat> yeah, good. No, it's <laughs> I can kick you from here, though. Okay, we made it, man, yeah. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. That's the most important thing I can say. Um, you know, I said it uh, two or three days ago, whenever it was, I'll say it again. Uh, it's the conversations and the, the discussions and the, what you discover somebody else is doing and how to do something better yourself and the, the hand you lend to somebody that makes this sort of event uh, really special and, and worth coming to and doing over again. Um, so, and that's, that's all your work, so thank you. Um, we have some raffle prizes. Uh, I believe they're being lugged in uh, momentarily. Oh, they've been lugged in. Where are they? Oh, they, oh we are, okay, got it, okay. Oh, we have boxes of stuff, great. Um, we'll get to those uh, in a bit. Um, Thank you to all of the presenters, the, the, the speakers, the panelists, the workshop leaders, the demoers, the installers, uh, everyone who, who made uh, Tear Down what it was. Uh, also the puzzlers, uh, for those of you that puzzled, that was uh, really fun, thanks. Um, there's a bit more puzzling to do, but uh, I must admit that I am losing stamina even. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, good. <laughs> uh, um, Tomorrow, if you're around, I know a bunch of you will be, uh, Hackaday is hosting a brunch 
Uh, so come grab some some food and, and drink at Cheryl's on 12th is the name of the, the restaurant. It's not too far from here. Um, you can talk to Sophie or, or Magenta, uh, and we'll put it in, in Gitter if they haven't already. Um, so And that's thanks to Hackaday, uh, who's also sponsoring via, via Supply Frame. Um, if there's stuff that, uh, you know, as great as our lunch boxes are, uh, there's stuff in it that you, 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 if you, you're like, I can't take this on the plane or whatever, just leave it on the, on the table and we'll, we'll take care of it. Um, the scrap swap, how many people are taking stuff from the scrap swap? Yeah, okay, right. How many people brought stuff to the scrap swap? Sweet. <laughs> that, that's perfect. Yeah, the redistribution of wealth. Great. Okay. Uh, excellent. So that's, that follows the power law stuff we were talking about. Um, uh, so I, I'm curious to see what you all do with it. If you if you did something with the scrap swap stuff, submit a field report, just, which really is just email us. Is that means, uh, and we'll we'll post it to the teardown project. Uh, I'd love to see what even what was there. I don't even know what was there. I know um, there was some confusion about this because there were some keys on it, right? Oh, okay. And somebody you know who uh, was searched through all those keys to find the three that were linked together, uh, which I thought was brilliant. I mean, that was, I, I wish I'd thought of it and I would have done that, uh, but I didn't. Um, yeah, uh, while we were here, a tremendous amount of work actually got done on, on in the interwebs, right? The, the crowdsupply.com that you know. Uh, we launched a bunch of projects. We launched Giant Board, which was here, um, demoing upstairs, yep. Uh, I think Chris is still here. Uh, we launched the Lime RFE project, which uh, Abraham talked about. Um, we pre-launched the CrowdCell uh, project, which he also talked about. Um, those are both new Lime projects. Uh, the programmable USB hub launched by Chris. Uh, where's Chris? Oh, yeah, there you are. Cool. Um, yep, and doing really well. Uh, and one thing that, that uh, you saw the the rocket and the a bunch of ORSAT uh, and Portland State Aerospace uh, uh, Society, yes, uh, demos up there. Um, I'm really, and you may have seen the talk last year by Andrew Greenberg about open source space, which was really fun. Uh, I'm really happy to, to officially announce that, that we're launching their ground base station as a crowd supply project. Um, sometime soon. They're, the launch is actually in 2020, in the fall of 2020, uh, but the, the ground base station will get ready before that, so you can, you'll can you be ready to talk to it as it uh, as soon as it launches up. Um, so that, that will be pretty great. Um, <clears throat> we'd love to hear uh, from you all future, uh, or ideas for future teardowns, right? And what, what we added, we changed some things this year. We, we added panels and we had the scrap swap and, and other things. Um, yeah, we had the puzzle hunt, yes, yes. Uh, so that, that seems like it will be coming back. Um, is there anything more radical that we, be, we could be doing? Yeah, I, I, I uh, was in a discussion with, with Alex Glow, and, sh and she was mentioning trains, training everywhere instead of flying everywhere, right? Um, you know, what, what could we, could we get our own train and, and just go around? Like, uh, you know, it, it's not North Korea, but it, it <laughs> We could pretend. Um, uh, you know, wh wh really, what, what, what can we do out there th uh, um, for, for next time or the time after? Um, you know, and, and of course, I want to thank uh, our sponsors, right? We had a great set of sponsors this year. Um, you saw them out there, a lot of them. Um, you know, our platinum sponsors, especially Microchip, uh, which, you know, Chris's programmable USB hub just launched as part of the Microchip Get Launched project, um, uh, Molex, uh, which we actually we recruited a few projects from Teardown to be a part of that, uh, their, their design challenge, um, and Corvo, uh, with, which is so heavily embedded in the RF space, uh, it has parts in a lot of projects already. Um, so they, they were great supporters and we're working with them again uh, throughout the year to bring more projects like those to life. Um, and all the other sponsors that, that we had. Uh, please, if you, if you see them, uh, give them a pat on the back, shake their hand, uh, tell me you'll be back next year, if you're gonna be back. Um, and, of course, our partners in putting this on, uh, PNCA and the Make Think, Pro uh, Make Think Code program, 
uh, have been tremendously supportive and uh, uh, helped us put this together. We couldn't have done that without them. Um, I think we got some new, recruited some new instructors, hopefully for some of their workshops. Um, we certainly, uh, at least Brewster's workshop, uh, will be replicating here and teaching fine artists uh, more about technology and technologists more about fine art, perhaps. Um, great, well the plan from here out, we're gonna do raffle, don't worry, you get your stuff. Uh, dinner is gonna be uh, uh, chaotic, you're just gonna do whatever you want. Um, we'll probably end up at ground control and uh, uh, the puzzle hunt, uh, what remains of it, will um, commence soon. If you have a golden ticket, a black golden ticket, that is, uh, you should redeem it uh, when we get out of here and you'll get a little something. Um, yeah. So, without further ado, let's, let's hit the prizes. Um, I have a hastily put together uh, Emacs document. <laughs> um, and a random number generator in Python. Okay. Uh, so, first things first, let's see. Can I get some help up here from, yeah, Kenny? Cool, yeah. You wanna grab something? Okay, this is a, those are, those are, those are together, yeah. Okay, this is, this is high quality swag here. Uh, let's see, 163 is Gavin Wellen. Yeah, okay. We're gonna do this in quick succession. Martin Atkins. Yes, come on up or down. Uh, we've got, ooh, Thomas. Uh, together, no, two, two, sorry. Yeah, Thomas, where are you? There you go, okay. Um, we've got, yes, oh, what what'd you get, Thomas? Digilent. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jesse Vincent. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and we have here. Uh, no, wait. You work here. Um, <laughs> Ryan Jarvis. <laughs> and Ethan Slattery. Ethan? He had to go. You, you're going to take it for him? Uh, uh, what? <laughs> oh God. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, how much stuff we have? Okay. All right. These are some uh, microchip dev kits. We've got Greg. Greg. Stuart. Where are you? Yeah. Okay. Oh, this is, this is funny. One of these was. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, Daniel Block. Right on. Okay. Ooh, okay. So uh, let's do th let's do this one. Uh, this is the an Osseum, I think it's uh, iOS oscilloscope. Okay, let's see here. Ooh, um, we've got. <laughs> uh, I don't know who you are, but let's see. Oh, Raphael, Raphael, R A F I L. No, anyone? No, no, okay. Next. Um, I don't know who that is, though. That's that's the problem. Uh, let's see. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, oh. Oh, okay. Uh, no. <laughs> it's Will. It's you. Okay. <laughs> hey, there you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Give it to him. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Yes, uh, both. Okay, so so this is a very limited edition. Uh, it's a Sci Five High Five One Founders Edition. So it's signed by all the founders of Sci Five. This is the 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 High Five One um, uh, board, um, and Jeremy Grosser. Yes, Jeremy. He's not here. Is he here? Yeah. Okay, we'll try someone else here. 
Uh, let's see. Pierre. Yeah, okay. And we have one more. John Hannes. Where's John? Oh, yeah, okay. This, this can go up in the hacker space. Sweet. And uh, this is... This is now out of print, I believe. Um, let me see here. This is the Hardware Hacker by Bunny Huang. It's signed, I believe, with an inscription, even. Let me check. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> 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 yes, uh, signed. Uh, and this goes to Ken Rother. Ken? Oh, okay, cool. Okay, uh, that is all for now, I believe. Is, is that all we have? Okay, great. Um, okay, that's it. Uh, Nandini, are you here? Yes, you are. Would you like to come up and say hello and goodbye? <laughs> Nandini is the executive director of the Make Think Code program here. Um, she's our, our counterpart here at PNCA. To stand down here. Okay. That doesn't <laughs> look as stable as what it could be. Yeah. Um, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for coming here. I, it's been um, really amazing to have all of you here, and this is part of what we do at Make Think Code. The goal is to bring sort of lots of different makers and technologists and artists together to do interesting things and have conversations and find new collaborators and um, and sort of plan and future things. So if you have ideas and you want to be involved in more things out here, um, come talk to me, talk to Josh. Um, and thank you so much. I hope you had an amazing weekend. This is fun. OK. Uh, yeah, that, that was perfect. Um, thanks, everyone. We'll see you soon, I hope. Uh, we're going to send out a survey. Please answer it. Give us feedback, what we did well, what we could do better, what was missing, too much of, whatever it was. Um, thank you very much. Have a great, safe travel back to wherever you're going to, and we'll see you very soon. <laughs>